depressurizes around what we call the Arctic Circle. The reason we have that Arctic Circle is because when the world depressurizes, all of the air gets sucked up and goes right up towards the hole that's in the sky. But then there's also a downdraft, just like in the day after tomorrow, where it pulls super cooled air up from the high reaches of our sky and it throws it down in, into a a burst down onto the ground in a perfect circle right around the hole or the opening up in the sky. As the entire tower, the entire lighthouse starts to freeze too. Water crashes into it and it comes tumbling down. The tower falls. This is the tower falling symbolism. When that blue, when that inner earth blue energy light, right? It shoots out and it stays out and it's seen as holding up the sky. Hey, thanks for your support, Serving Angel. Good to see you. Um, that Those blue beams reach out and they touch the sky and they're seen as these gods and titans that are holding the sky up or poles that are being lifted, these spiritual poles or arrows or all kinds of symbolism, right? But when those beams of light retract, it's seen as the tower falling right? Especially the one that's at Mount Maru. That's the main one. Uh, when that goes down, it's seen as the tower's falling symbolism, or just like the Tower of Babel falling down too. Here's that whirlpool that we were talking about. So she gets sucked into the whirlpool whenever the tower goes down, or that blue beam energy goes down into the earth. She goes down into the waters. To check out the name of the boat. This is a little bit more context for the message that's being shared, the esoteric message, the hidden message. The boat's name is Ariel. Not a part of the movie. They didn't talk about the boat's name or anything. They could have named that boat anything. But Ariel is symbolic for what we're talking about, that tower going down into the waters. Ar or Or means light, sometimes by extension fire, but it means light. And E, the I part, is just pos uh, possession, so it means my light. And then L, which means a mighty leader. The light is my mighty leader, basically, or the light is my God basically. And that gets sucked down into the into this whirlpool, into this hole in the middle of the ocean. So the light named after the, uh, the boat named after the light also goes down symbolically. Now we got a government worker who says, Nemo, Nemo, I got bad news. Your dad died at sea, basically. Now we learn the character's name is Nemo. Let's check this out because Nemo comes up, comes up quite often in uh, fantasy symbolism, especially in Hollywood and in books. Nemo, this is kind of funny, Nemo in Latin literally means no man or no one or nobody, no person, not specifically a male, right? Kind of like um, in Lord of the Rings, remember that Sauron's all, Sauron thinks he can kick everyone's butt and he's like, no man can kill me. And that chick's like, I am no man because I'm a chick, right? And then she gets to kill him, right? But but basically Nemo translates to no person because it comes from ni homo, right? Like the knights who say ni, ni means no, right? Uh, so no homo, no homo is what exactly what Nemo means. Not homo, not human, essentially, right? Um, it's kind of, it's kind of funny. Um, in that manner. Anyways, um, they say probably. You see that right there? Probably from no himo or homo, which means human or, or, or whatever. But they don't, they're not sure. So I did extra digging. Let's check this out. There's a root in the Proto-Indo-European uh, called nim. N-E-M. That's the root for nemo. The O at the end is just a vav and it's a connector meaning, meaning of the. So this girl is of the something, of the nim. The nim. Now, what is the nim? It means the assigned, the allotted, or that which is taken. Your take after something is left over. What, what you get after everything is left over, right? So essentially, Nemo in the old world languages could be translated as the chosen or of the chosen, right? Those who are the survivors or seen as being chosen after the apocalyptic event. Those who make it past um, some sort of... Uh, apocalyptic event. He takes her back to his place, which is uh, Nemo's new home, right? She's going to live with her uncle. And he's like, man, I don't know what to show kids. What, are, what do kids get excited about? Check out my doorknob collection, he says, right? Look at all these awesome doorknobs. And she's like, you're a doorknob salesman. He's like, no, I own a company that owns that, that sells doorknobs. So he owns this doorknob company. Why did they choose him to do that? It's because he symbolizes a god, an ancient Roman god named Janus. Janus was the god of doorways, the god of portals, the god of doors or transitional periods, etc. Here is an example of Janus. Um, he represents the blue beam in short, right? He is the god of the garden, which if you break down Janus or Genos, 
it translates to strong of the garden or strength of the garden, basically. And you can see him sitting right there between the two pillars, the anode and the cathode, respectively, how we talk about in some of our other Plasma Apocalypse videos. Also, check this out. Earlier, Nemo was talking about receiving, her father was saying that she's, she's going to get a key, the key to the lighthouse, the key to Janus, the key to the door, the key to the portal to get out of this world, essentially to escape the world the way that it is today, the blue sky. He also has a staff. You see that? Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a little tip. It's possible that when you see these types of gods, that the human or the humanoid figure, the torso, the arms and the legs and stuff, that that might actually just be the personification of the real God in the picture, which is the pole or the staff or the wand or the rod, etc. That the rod is being personified as a human, given two heads, etc. Right? He is the God of doors, gates and transitions. According to Roman mythology, Janus was present at the beginning of the world. That would be the creation event in the garden. He's the strong one of the garden. Uh, as the God of gates, Janus guarded the gates of heaven and held access to heaven and other gods as well. So he represents uh, the duality of the God Janus or Mount Maru with the beam and Mount Maru without the beam as well. He says that this special lock that he has here came up from a place called Alcatraz, which I thought was interesting. So he ha he literally has the lock to a prison, right? He's, he's, he's the one that holds the locks and the keys and, and everything. And Alcatraz actually comes from the word albatross. Now she goes to sleep. Look at the colors. See how the colors changed? That is the exact same color that I've been talking about whenever we go into the golden age. It's a golden color. Possibly, my theory on this is that uh, the anode and the cathode, when the energy runs through them and goes back up and uh, shoots up to the sky and you see all those beams coming out and stuff, uh, that it creates an electrical arc between the anode and the cathode up between uh, the island that used to exist at the North Pole. And in it creates a low pressure sodium vapor lamp effect, which starts off as a bright purple, a purple flash, which for us would last a lot longer than just a quick flash because it's so much bigger. It's on a bigger scale. It goes from purple to a deep red to a sort of an orangey, amber, yellow, monochrome glow to it. And that's whenever our world starts to change colors. And that's when magic enters into our world because it's being filled with energy. The electromagnetic barrier around our world goes back up after the neutral point, which locks in all that energy that is being released from within the earth herself. And we get to experience living in that energy in high energetic conditions, which brings things to life essentially. Um, so that's what's being represented by this pig right here, right? There's so much electrical charge that you won't need to plug stuff in in order for it to work. Now, first, there will be an electromagnetic pulse. Everything will turn off. Everything that's electrical will turn off. But then life will be given to everything in our world, including those things that we have made that we call slaves or robots, right? Toys, toasters, whatever it may be. They automatically just come to life because they have the energy that they need to be alive. They draw it from the air itself. And then because they're alive apart from our electrical charge that we give them, right? They just start working all on their own. Things come to life, just like Skynet or Terminator, right? So the pig comes to life, etc. Now, what extent do, do things come to life? Like would a stuffed animal actually be able to move? I'm not sure. I think it would have to move according to the mechanics of whatever vessel it's inside of. So if it's a mechanical toy, yes, it could definitely move around and stuff. Um, so I'm not, I'm not too sure about the extent of how much a stuffed animal could actually move around and, and talk and stuff, right? But it's possible. All right, so she's on the boat. The boat gets into the water and she starts taking off towards the Aurora Borealis, which is symbolic for the North Pole, right? She's on her way to the North Pole. Um, which also reminded me of an old movie called Bedknobs and Broomsticks with Angela Lansbury, where they also interestingly enough, travel around on a bed, right? I think it's important for the bed to have like posts representing those, uh, those four living creatures in the Bible that surround uh, the, the throne of God, also Mount Maru, right? Where the light sits or dwells. And then they, they also visit like all kinds of um, animals that can talk and stuff. Uh, Aurora Borealis. So Aurora uh, comes from the word fire or light or 
is light or fire. Uh, so aurora is like the light of lights, basically. And then borealis or boreal comes from boreal. And it says it's of unknown origin. So they're not sure on this website where the word borealis comes from. But if you look closer and do more investigation, you can see that the root for borealis is bar, right? The word bar. And a bar is a stake or a rod of iron used to fasten a door or a gate, right? More door symbolism. Borealis uh, basically means it comes from the bar, the bar of the world, the light of the world, the, the sky beam of the world, the column of the world. And there you have it. She goes right towards the Aurora Borealis and square right in the middle, you've got those four witnesses or those four little mini columns that shoot up off of her bedposts. And then right there in the middle is Mount Maru, symbolically speaking, sur surrounded by plasma all over the place. It's the light of the world. Instead, she finds Flip. So this is the first time we meet this Flip character. Let's take a look. This is Jason Momoa, aka Aquaman. Very, um, very Johnny Depp kind of Beetlejuice in character. I like the character that he plays in this movie. Um, and he's in the lighthouse going through her dad's stuff. And she's like, who are you? And he goes, uh, he's hiding over there in the closet. Um, nobody. He says he's nobody. Isn't that interesting? That's the second time that's come up in this movie. The girl's name literally translates to nobody. Now he's saying, my name is also nobody, right? Remember, we looked up Nemo and it means not human, essentially, right? Not human, no homo, no, no humans, basically. He looks like a werewolf. He looks like Pan, the god Pan. He's got uh, these, these horns and stuff. He actually has the feet of a wolf, um, which is really interesting too. All right, so remember it. The root of Nemo means chosen. It means something that is assigned, something that is allotted or a take after everything is left over. Now, this also comes from the Odyssey. In Homer's The Odyssey, it says uh, that Odysseus was trapped in a cave of the Cyclops Polyphemus, who ate two of Odysseus's men. Uh, the king of Ithaca was traveling and uh, was about to eat Odysseus himself. But then Odysseus got Polyphemus drunk, the one-eyed giant. So Odysseus got Polyphemus drunk, the Cyclops, and told him that his name is Nobody. And then after that, he gouged out the eyeball of the Cyclops so that he was blind. And when the Cyclops went out asking for help, he's like, Nobody, nobody's hurting me. Nobody's hurting me. Because that was the name that Odysseus gave him. So he, he kind of tricked him, right? Um... Let's check that out. I want to go into that story real quick. So Odysseus blinds the one-eyed giant or the cycle ops, right? And his name is Polyphemus. Poly means many. Let's check out Femus and see what Femus means. Now Femus comes from Feme, which means a word regarded as grammatical unit of language. And it basically means speech, voice, utterance, or a speaking. So Polyphemus means many voices, many utterances, many sounds right? Many different voices that you hear all at once, like a crowd talking, right? And here you have Odysseus blinding the one-eyed giant, the cycle ops. Cycle means circle, ops, ops means eye, right? So the round eye, the circle eye. Symbolically, this is the blue beam that pokes the eye in the sky up there in the depressurization point, pokes it in the eye and blinds it essentially, right? Uh, very interesting stuff. Also, just the fact that there's many voices coming from this cycle ops or this round eye in the sky, those many voices are the thunderings that you hear when all that plasma comes down into our world. There'll be cracklings and electrical sounds all over the place. And even in the Bible, it talks about these sounds. It says it sounds like the rushing of many waters or many voices all speaking at the same time. He says, my name's Flip. And he does a little devil horn type thing and his, his hand says Flip right there, right? Uh, he does represent the, the, the red sky. He represents the, the red plasma that comes down. He represents the world of magic. He represents living for a very long time, which is what happens when the sky turns red. Um, he's, he's got super long hair because he, he grows old for a very long time. Um, in that red world, under the red sky, uh, people and animals and plants and stuff, they live for a very long time compared to us today that are basically like that dude in Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade who just gets all super old real fast, right? It's just that we're used to it. 
when we when we become to use when we when we become used to living much longer and every and the everything is flipped we could say right um people their people's your cells grow at, at an amazing rate basically you develop like the power of wolverine like this super healing regeneration kind of a power right and uh, that means that hair starts to grow become thicker and stronger it's the fountain of youth so it starts to reverse the effects of aging right and it starts to build more collagen and elastin in your skin and stuff um and then so your hair will grow out much longer people won't want to cut their hair because they'll start to realize the connection and the purpose that the hair has whenever you live in an electrically charged atmosphere right um, it's going to benefit people to have their hair grow long as opposed to cutting it short and being cut off from their connection. Also, horns. It very well may be that humans have the ability. Uh, actually, I'm telling you, as, as a matter of fact, they do because there are many humans that have horns. We have the ability to grow horns. Now, oftentimes, this doesn't happen to most people Um who are the anomalous exceptions, right? The things that our spirit memory or our DNA remembers subconsciously. Uh, that's why we have the ability to grow horns, just like animals and other things do too. It's just that we don't live long enough to grow horns, okay? If you live for a few hundred years, you probably might start growing some horns and stuff, you know? Um, you can Google people with horns too. You'll find hundreds of examples. All right, so he says, I thought, I thought you were something that my dad made up. Now, remember, he, he is the subject of these flip stories, these flip bedtime stories about the polarity reversal of our world. And she's saying, I thought you just, I thought my dad, dad just made that up. I thought it just sounded like a cool bedtime story, right? The, the moral of this movie is that it's real. The moral of many of these movies and TV shows and all this stuff, you're going to start being told point blank that these things are real. Okay. They're basically telling you now, they're telling us, they're telling me at the very least, I accept that these stories, these myths, these legends all have strong elements of truth to them. It's just that they've been cartoonified over time and it's false to us to figure them back out. So he picks her up. He puts her in the window. I took a picture of this. It's hard to see on your side, but let me zoom in. You can see what's right above her head. Check this out. Boom. You see that? That is a dream catcher. Just just for a quick moment, right? Now she's actually going to physically be caught because he's going to push her out of the window to try to like wake her up or whatever so that she's not in the dream any longer and he can continue to raid the place. But the dream catcher is put underneath the child purposefully, right? Let's check out some information on dream catchers real quick. It says the spider web charm. The dream catcher is also known as a spider web charm, right? And it's uh, a net like charm from the white earth nation also known as the Boaji Boajije Bwaj, oh, I'm not going to even try that one sorry uh the dream snare basically I'm going to explain this in just a minute it says it's a hoop with a woven string or a sinew meant to replicate a spider's web used this is the important part used as a protective charm for infants specifically not just oh here's a dream catcher just for anybody you know as a gift for my 40 year old uncle or whatever specifically dream catchers are designed for children right others people can use them and benefit from them but children benefit the most why remember when we broke down halloween and we were talking about all these boogeymen and stuff that basically are cartoonifications of plasma the plasma is attracted to the strongest energetic charges. The strongest energetic charges in humans comes from children. So there was a danger to, to babies and children and virgins and people who had strong uh, soul energy, right? There was a danger that the plasma would be so attracted to them that it would come and envelop them like a sleeping infant or something and that they would suffocate on plasma essentially or the byproduct that goo that's left behind by the ghosts or the plasma or whatever so they hung this stuff um, or they put out food or they did things to appease these gods or these ghosts or these hauntings and stuff um, specifically to protect their children so that's why they hung this stuff up there so that if plasma did enter into the room it would be attracted to uh, these things that were created oftentimes they actually hung objects off of the dream catcher it's not just the little spiderweb decoration but they would hang you know, metallic objects and other things on there to attract the plasma so that it would stay there and go through that little circuitry that was made so that it doesn't go down into the baby and suffocate the baby. But he says, you're excited for your first day of school, huh? He And she's like, school? What? 
I'm not a fish. What do you mean school, right? So this is the blue sky that we live in today. This is the world without magic where people have to go and be taught by complete strangers how to allegedly survive as a grown person, right? Which blows my mind. She responds by having this conversation. Let me read it to you. She says, my dad says that schools are basically prisons. They keep kids locked up physically and mentally. They prepare them for jobs that are also basically prisons. And so he retort, his, re his retort is, nah, -uh. <laughs> that's his, that's his answer. That's, this misrepresents everyone in the mainstream. Okay. That's basically their answer. They don't know how to handle that because they have been taught and brainwashed that this, this, concept that we are now discussing is an essential part of society. It's an integral part of being able to survive and grow and listen. It's not. It's not. It's a, tr it's a tradition. <laughs> it is an initiation, right? And once you get tricked into it, you're going to be stuck into it for a while. He says, school is not a prison. She says, can I leave whenever I want to? Okay, it's a little like a prison, basically, right? I love this. I love that she asks, she's engaging him. She's not arguing. She's just asking a question using the Socratic method so that he can realize, oh, that's right. Pointing out the obvious, right? You can't leave whenever you want to. It is like a prison. First thing she grabs is her string. Now it's a crimson string. It's a red string. It has to be a red string. And I'll show you why. There's red string symbolism in Hollywood. If you didn't know about it, you're going to learn right now. It says that wearing a thin scarlet or crimson ring as a type of talisman is a Jewish folk custom that is practiced as a way to ward off misfortune, which is brought about by the evil eye. So wearing this red string or this crimson string is something that is done quite often as a Jewish tradition to ward off the evil eye, which is the depressurization point in the sky, right? When it, that, that's, uh, whenever the, all the lights go out, you'll see it and it's red, okay? So all the Nibiru people that will look up and see a big, huge red circle in the sky, you will probably think that a planet is about to crash, but it's not. It's just a hole in the sky. You could see the, the light behind the hole, right? Which is red. Probably because it's high ionized hydrogen, I would guess. Now check this out. Let's zoom in on one of these red strings that the celebrities wear. Okay, you got Madonna wearing hers. You got whoever that is wearing hers and this chick. All right, but look at, here's a little talisman on the end of it. You see that, how it has the hand and then it's got a little eye in the middle, right? That's because you have the depressurization point or the hole in the sky and then the plasma that seeps out follows the jet stream. It goes what in whatever direction the wind is basically blowing, right? So sometimes it's seen as all of the plasma is coming out in one direction and that's the hand with the eye in the middle of it or whatever. Um, this is the hand of Freddy Krueger, the finger symbolism of the gods, etc. Now, let's take a look at this map, this dream map. And I, this is where I want all of you to put on your thinking caps and start thinking about dreams you've had and what you think that these things symbolize. Why so many people are dreaming of so many of the same things. This map is every dream in the world, slumberland. So we start to zoom into the map and we're going to check out some of these little dream worlds that they have here. First thing, I see one that says, I forgot my pants, right? I know people have dreamed that they have gone to school or gone to their college or gone to some public place usually. And for some reason you're naked or for some reason you forgot your pants or whatever it may be, right? I think that it might harken back to the time when you don't need clothing. You know you don't need clothing. It just depends on the conditions. It depends on the environment, right? If you live in a perfectly tropical climate where everything's nice and warm all the time and there's not any weather of any kind, you don't need a lot of clothing or protection from, from weather, right? Uh, we also have, let's see, let's zoom in a bit more. See what else we got. Running but not moving. How many people have had this dream where you, you're trying to run, but you can't? You're like in a cartoon where they're running, but they're just in the same spot. Or me, I used to have a dream that I was in a race, but like everyone else was running at normal speed and I was just like in sludge. Like It's like the air was so thick around me, I could barely move, right? That's another type of a popular dream. How about this one? I've had this one a couple of times, teeth falling out. What do you suppose would be the the actual meaning in the real world of everyone dreaming that our teeth are falling out for some reason, right? I mean, I've had dreams where I could like, pff, pff, 
Like I could just breathe and I'd be spitting teeth out for some reason. It was real weird. You know what I mean? And it's a very popular one too. Some people dream that they lost their hair. There's hair loss right there above me. So there's teeth falling out, people uh, losing their hair, etc. What else we got? Uh, clowns. Some people dream about clowns. I believe personally that that harkens back to the time where those other those sliders, remember how we were talking about those people that, that jump from dream world to dream world or from realm to realm, right? Astronauts or whatever you want to call them, ancient aliens. Uh, they look like clowns, the traditions say. They're pasty white, right? And then they even know, the legends say, especially in the book of Enoch, that they're the ones that taught us how to use makeup and paint faces. So if you have this clown looking white, almost albino looking race of giant beings that paints their faces, doesn't that kind of imply some sort of a scary, terrifying clown type of a being? I think so. Uh, naked in public, we've got being chased. How many people have the dream of being chased, right? And what are you chased by, I wonder? I feel like this is an, this is an, an integral part of our reality, of our world, you know? Like teaching children and, and other people the purpose of dreams, why they dream, so they can learn to traverse the dream world. Most people have no control over their dreams. They cannot lucid dream because they don't know what it is. They don't know where they are. They don't know what's going on. They've been told it's all nonsense. It's just random things firing off. So no wonder people are con confused when they go to bed at night. No wonder they don't know how to control what's happening, you know what I mean, and, and be a lucid dreamer. So I feel like this would be awesome to teach people because there's clearly import behind it. Now we find the driver of the truck turns out this is the post-apocalyptic world symbolically speaking as we just talked about there's a kid driving the only person in this dream is this kid it's just a child right but it's a child that kind of acts like an adult isn't that interesting it's a child driving a huge garbage truck first of all which looks strange and out of place but then it's a child that has um, a uniform on and his name is Emmett which means truth I don't know if you're, you could see that but he's, he's got a uniform on, just like a grown-up would, just like somebody who has a job. He has tattoos, albeit they're little kid tattoos, but still, tattoos nonetheless. It's like he's already a grown-up, but he's just in a child's body. Here's where this comes from. After we go through this polarity shift and the world depressurizes, right, the conditions in our world will change to enable us to live much, much longer, which means those of you who are children now, you will retain your childhood. You will retain your, 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 your appearance as a child. Um, and, and your, it will take way longer for children to get to puberty and to start growing into maturity and getting older and stuff. So a child can, can be a child for like a hundred years under those types of conditions. In other worlds, I, I, I fully think that this is happening, okay? That it takes a lot longer for people to grow. This kid could actually be way older than the, the little girl next to her. This kid, symbolically speaking, right? After the, in the post-apocalyptic world, you might come up to a, a person, you might think it's a child, but that child has only been that, has been that way for like 75 years. And they could actually be able to drive cars and hold intelligent conversations and stuff. They can't help how long that their, their body is taking to grow or to look like it's aging, right? In an electrically charged world that keeps you young for a very long time. But she's the one who's chasing them. He's the slider. He's the world traveler or whatever. She is like, you know, you broke the rules of sliding. You, dro you broke the rules of traveling and hopping from realm to realm, basically, right? And she catches them. And he says, you're 160 years old. That's because she's from out there in the heavenlies where she doesn't age, right? This guy gets off in the uh, endless staircase level, which is weird, really weird. This is starting to look a lot like the back rooms. Remember that concept that we talked about? Uh, that creepy pasta called the back rooms? Very much like this where he gets out. Now, I will tell you this as well. I think like when I imagine space or, or what we have been told, and programmed to think of when we imagine space, like all that black emptiness and darkness, I see this. I don't see empty blackness and space. I actually see fill, fullness. So out there beyond the limits of our sky, if you were to look at the heavenlies or you were to look at quote unquote space, it would not be full of space. It would actually be quite full, the fullness. <laughs> like I don't know what else to call it really. What's the opposite of space? All right, so they're back in the elevator and he randomly offers her a waffle. 
So there's this connection between this pan-like character and waffles as well. Let's check it out. Let's do, let's learn about the word waffle. All right. So it talks about being the batter for cake, etc. But if you go to the Proto-Germanic, it says it's from wavila, 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 which means a web or a honeycomb. Immediately after we just saw this guy walk out into the web of space, right? Or the honeycomb of space where you have like all these little entrances and hallways and exits and stuff, right? He hands her a waffle and he makes a point in this movie about how much he just loves waffles. Why? It could have been anything. It's not just some insignificant random joke. It's not because the writer really likes waffles and he had to put that into the movie. You know what I mean? It's not to make people laugh because it's totally unrelated and stupid and it's just ha ha ha, he likes waffles. It's because it's full of symbolism. The waffle symbolism is the honeycomb. It's that bee honeycomb, beehive kind of a shape, which is, I think, personally, this is my concept of space, okay? That it's more like a honeycomb. It's more like a hive out there with all kinds of conduits and hallways and stuff like that. Now he says, I thought that if I just got that pearl, I could remember who I was. Take a look at the colors again, right? He says, I just want to wake up. He can't remember who he is, right? Now he represents uh, one aspect of God or the God-like beings and creatures and stuff. And he doesn't know who he is. He lost his identity. This is the role of Brahma. Okay, in Hinduism, the Hindu creation story talks about how Brahma, the creator God, was all there was. And Brahma wanted company. Brahma wanted to experience something other than Brahma's self. But that's impossible because Brahma is all there is. So Brahma had to trick himself into forgetting who he was. And in doing so, he divided himself so that he could meet himself and experience himself and get to know himself all over again. And then that Brahma did the same thing. And those Brahmas did the same thing. They split so many times in its own mind that it dissociates from itself. It forgets who it is. And ultimately, all of creation groans, I just want to wake up. And we will once we, once we get to know ourselves. Like once we fully intimately get to know ourselves, there's no purpose for us to do that any longer, right? And the dream will end and we, we become one again. So they're walking through this really ugly, dirty, trashy space cop sort of office building. And she says, clearly management hasn't updated our wardrobe. I have noticed a trend in these television shows and movies. Have you guys noticed this? Where you have this sort of space cop agency and whatever it is, and they're always you know, trying to track those criminals that are jumping from world to world or from time to time or whatever, right? These space cops, whatever you want to call them, they're always out of time. Usually with like a 70s throwback or a 60s or 50s kind of a deal, like they're never modern. They're never caught up with like the modern world that we live in. For some reason, they have like old world technology, right? Just like in the Umbrella Academy, right? Um, there's, there's this sort of space cop organization where they're, they're very like, they have old equipment and typewriters and not a lot of electrical appliances, right? You might say. Uh, we also have, this one was from Loki, Right there was the, uh, the the space cop agency. I forgot all the fancy names for them, but you had the same thing, or it was very much an an out of place. Like like the space cops are like from another decade, even though they're seen as being super advanced, they're very old fashioned, which I find to be very interesting when we look at all these different agencies. All right, so she says there are no pearls. It's a myth. She doesn't know about the pearls, or she or or she's lying, which you're gonna find out she's lying. Okay, so. The space cop is saying there are no pearls when she knows damn well there are pearls. You'll see at the end. All right, so now Nemo is talking to her uncle about her dreams of Flip. And her uncle is basically like, Flip was my outlaw name, right? So now we learn that the uncle is actually the other face of Janice, right? One is a one is a younger one, one is an older one. He's basically the older version because he lives under the blue sky and he's aging very quickly. Compared to Flip the pan type character with the horns who represents the the red sky world filled with magic he says he didn't sleep for 3 nights before he forgot about flip before he forgot his dreams 3 nights in a row he didn't sleep that happens to be the same amount of time that the world goes dark for between resets 3 nights 3 days and 3 nights after that no more flip 
Why? Because the flip has finished. Okay, that's why there's no more flip after three days and three nights or whatever, because the polarity flip or the polarity reversal of our world is completed. So after three days and three nights, you don't need flip anymore. There is no more flip. It's just Philip, right? So now he's talking about a transition that he went through. He, right? This entity, this, this entity went through this transition where he lost touch with his creative side. That means that blue beam retracted and boom, gives birth to Philip of the blue sky, where there's not a lot of empathy, not a lot of emotion, a lot of left brain thinking, where the ends justify the means, a lot of math, a lot of numbers, you know what I mean? A lot of constructions and squares and cubes in the world and stuff, as opposed to when the sky is red or that golden age that we go into. He says, anyway, that's ancient history now, isn't it? Isn't it? <laughs> is it sure is ancient history. They put that line in there purposefully, just for us, just for us who know what they're talking about. I love that little inside joke. It's ancient history now. Yeah, it totally is ancient history. It's also your future. All right, so then she gets into the elevator and she sees this little baby, this little kid, totally wearing the black and white symbolism of the space travelers, like I talked about, right? Those sliders out there, that's their color. That's When you see black and white, that represents those beings who either come from a line of space travelers or they themselves are people who can jump from realm to realm or from dream to dream or from, you know, travel through time or however it's presented, right? But the baby can talk. The baby looks up right at her and says in a very mature voice, time to make the donuts, right? That's exactly what we were talking about earlier with that other baby or that, that, that toddler that was driving the garbage truck, right? There's a reason why this kid is dressed up in a little tuxedo and he can speak perfectly maturely because in the world to come, regeneration is in high gear, okay? That's why it talks about woe to those who are pregnant in those days, okay? Because you're not going to have nine months long birth like you're used to, okay? Uh, that child is going to develop very quickly in the womb, because everything is regenerating so quickly, your body's regenerating, those children are regenerating, and they come out, they pop out quickly, and much bigger, right? Able to walk, essentially, little toddlers being born, because they, they advanced so quickly in the womb. If you're advancing, if you're regenerating, and it's the fountain of youth keeping you nice and young, because it's regenerating all your cells at such a quick level, isn't it also going to do that to babies in the womb? How much more so, right? So the babies come out, essentially being able to talk and and stand up and walk around just like animals do today, right? You see, animals aren't just born and they just flop around like dead fish and have to have somebody care for them and all this stuff. They're, they're born and they're ready to go. They're like, whoa, whoa, let me get my balance. You know what I mean? Um, which is also what many of the legends talk about um, in the ancient world. Humans were born in that same fashion, in that same manner. All right, so she uh, Nemo goes to rescue Flip from the prison cell of his monochromatic backrooms prison cell out there in the space fractalverse world. I forgot why I took a picture of this particular one, so we're going to move forward. All right, now they go through another door. They're looking for the final door to go to the Sea of Nightmares, and look where they are, right? This is this is a little path. This is they're they're creating a map for us through the movie to find a physical place in the actual realm that we live in, okay? They're creating a map by way of showing you these images as someone else is on their journey to an important destination, right? Uh, I will also throw this out there since I used the word. The ancient glyph for a destination, right? A place to meet up, a place to go to was the letter G or the Gimel in the ancient languages. Oftentimes you'll see that right in the middle of the map. All right. So, they go, they're way up here in Canada, allegedly. They're way up towards the north. So wherever they're going, they're headed north, right? They're up there in Canada. He says the final door has got to be out here somewhere, right? They're up there by the Arctic Circle. Now they, they meet these Canadians that are flying on geese. Apparently this is a huge dream, according to the movie in Canada. Do I have any Canadians in the chat? I just want to check, like, do you guys ever dream of flying on geese? I have not had that dream. It sounds fun. It sounds like a blast. I would love to have a dream of flying on a giant goose. But anyways, um, this is also symbolic of when these creatures will be that big. I promise you, one day birds, uh, lizards, animals of all kinds and sorts will grow to gigantic proportions. Now, if you and your body has already gone through 
uh, the period of puberty that we go through where your, your growth is kind of stented at a certain age, then you might stay that way. Now, if everything else in the world around you starts to procreate and grow, especially if you're given long life, you're going to see the world start growing all around you as you appear in comparison to shrink, right? Everything gets real big. Now, you don't really shrink. You just keep your stature. The rest of the world starts to grow. Some of you might actually get uh, like a second growth spurt. You might go through another puberty. You might grow another pair of teeth, et cetera that comes in addition to your extra long life that you'll inherit. All right, so they start taking off towards this valley between all these mountains, which is where they should go. If they're heading to the North Pole, if you look at the old world maps, I don't have an example here. I've shown it a million times, but um, those four lands at the North Pole on the old maps are in a valley. So if that's where they're headed to, like I believe and speculate, then they should end up in a valley. And here they are in a valley surrounded by mountains there's a little hut now they need they need to go into this little hut and when they come into the, when they when they come out the other side of this hut door they are at the lighthouse remember that's mount maru this is all about a quest and a journey to get to mount maru like so many movies are okay they're speaking to us they're speaking to some of us not all of us okay not all of you out there these movies are not saying this to all of you to, me, to most of you, this movie is not saying a damn thing. I'm going to be honest. To most of you, this movie is to just, it's empty filler, okay? This is just something to entertain you and to amuse you uh, before you go back to being a slave so that you forget all about the fact that you're a slave, that you're not free, that you don't control your own decisions and you can't do whatever you want to in life because we are all slaves in a system that is designed to breed slaves right? So for most of you, this is just a break from your slavery. For the rest of you, however, this movie's handing you keys to your freedom if you choose to take them. All right. So they go back to where uh, Mount Maru should be. They say it's cold. It's super cold. We're talking about beyond the Northern winds, beyond the Arctic circle. And she says, I know who you are, by the way. Now look at her, look at her sweater. You see how there's three stripes. I don't know if people saw that in the chat. But she has three stripes now. She's in the dreamland. Her waking world sweatshirt had like seven or eight stripes on the middle portion, right? In the dream world, they chose purposefully to give her a shirt that has three blue stripes. Like we have talked about on my channel many times with Mount Maru and the two witnesses on either side, those other beams that shoot up and unite creating that anode and cathode electrical arc, right? The three stripes. The st three stripes are a symbol for victory. They're a symbol for the survivors of the apocalypse. So many different things, just like Adidas and stuff like that. She says, I found out who you are in the waking world. So she represents a truth seeker who has found out about the cyclical cataclysm, the flip in our world. She found out in the real world, just like we are finding out now under the blue sky conditions of this world without the magic, we can still find out and learn about those ancient times, or what I call our ancient oblivion, which by the way, I wrote a book about. I don't plug my book a lot, <laughs> but um, if you want to check out my book, you totally can. It's on Amazon. It's called, um, it's called uh, Ancient Oblivion, The Plasma Apocalypse. So if you want to know more about that, feel free to go check out and preview my book on Amazon. All right. So she's like, I, I figured out who you are, by the way, right? Your counterpart, because she's, she, remember, remember, Janice has been split in half. You've got this side, and then you've got the blue sky side of him that's very boring or whatever, right? And believes in going to school and stuff. He's like, let me guess, let me guess. I'm a famous outlaw, right? She's like, you're a doorknob salesman. Ah, sting. <laughs> so he's like, what'd you call me? <laughs> What? Right? He can't even conceive of this, right? He's like, there's no way. I, like, I rock. You know what I mean? He's like, you're telling me I'm a doorknob salesman after the apocalypse and this is what happens to me? What a buzzkill, man. God. You know what I mean? He's like, look, I've got the three W's. Wine, women, and waffles. The three dubs. Boom. There it is. So, there it is again, right? Wine, which is, he's the god of wine, symbolically speaking, right? Which is why they put uh, horns on many of those ancient gods too. Even on Moses. I don't know if you knew that, but it's said that Moses had horns. Uh, so he's got wine. He's the god of wine. The, the wine is when the, 
the sky turns a wine color and that plasma comes down and fills up the Holy Grail, which is uh, the valley. Remember how we learned that the, the, the word grail means crater in uh, our Indiana Jones breakdown, right? So that, that red plasma comes down, it fills up the Holy Grail with the blood of God, etc. cetera. Um, he's got wine, which is the heavenly wine. He's got his women and he's got his waffles, which we've talked about most of those. He's like, I'm not a doorknob seller. Don't say that. I'm a flipping outlaw. <laughs> you know what I mean? So come on, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm actually, let's step away. Forget this movie. Forget this movie. I'm talking to you. Okay. I'm talking to all of you in the chat right now. I'm talking about you future people who are going to be watching in the future. I'm talking to all of you watchers out there. Okay. This is how many of you feel because I feel this way. And if I feel this way, it's a numbers game, man. Others are bound to look at it. I'm not a doorknob seller. I'm a freaking outlaw. I know this burns inside of you. I know many of you feel this way, that you feel like you know you're a doorknob salesman in this, in this world. You know that that's your, that's, that's your character that you're playing right now, essentially, symbolically, right? And on the inside, this is you. On the inside, you're like, I'm a flipping outlaw, man. What am I doing? You know what I mean? You almost want to smack yourself sometimes. At least I do sometimes. Not really actually smack myself, but to, to snap out of it. You know what I mean? I'm not a doorknob salesman. Start saying that. If you catch yourself going through the loops of life and the routines and you get caught up in your personal little slavery, stop what you're doing and, and say out loud, I'm not a doorknob salesman. I'm not a doorknob salesman. And say it with disgust. <laughs> like, like That's just my advice to you because I feel like that might help you out to break free. Anyways, um, I'm going to go find a dream with a bar in it. He says, he's like, F this, that's depressing, man. Now, on the other hand, even though he's joking, sort of, he really does want to go find a bar, uh, but that's where he needs to go to the bar. Remember Mount Maru, the beam, the sky, the skylight, the column, the rod, the bar, right? That's where he needs to go. The bar is the truth. I'm not talking about going to the local tavern and, and getting drunk, and that's the truth. I'm talking about the bar. Passing the bar means living up to the standard. The standard is the flag of the world, the post of the world, etc. All right, so then he says, uh, then I'm going to go drink until I forget who I am again, <laughs> which is also what happens. We experience worldwide amnesia. I, don't, I haven't really talked about it a lot lately, but I have done quite a few videos on my Plasma Apocalypse playlist that talk about worldwide amnesia and how we are all affected. Most of us are affected. Our memories are affected instantaneously, not just forgetting over time because time passes and erases memories, but just stuff happens during the apocalypse that directly and instantly affects the memory collectively. Did you ever figure out what the lighthouse is for? Hmm? Did you? You guys ever figure out what the lighthouse is for? She says it's not to keep ships safe. Now, if you're the lighthouse, your purpose is not to keep other people safe. Your purpose is not to force the path of those ships out there on the sea of life. That's not your purpose being a lighthouse. And that's not the purpose of a lighthouse. It is to guide you on your journey, to be a guide. All of us are little lights in a dark time. And your purpose, if you are a light, is to be a light. Not to go around forcing your light upon other people and insisting that they, that they see the path, right? You walk your path. You be a light. And the, sh the stronger your shine, the more brilliant you are on your path, the more you're going to illuminate your path, which will give light to others who might be nearby, helping them to see. It's not for us to force truth. It's not for us to force perspective or to force somebody to walk in our exact same footsteps. It goes against the dream itself to do such a thing. And now they start putting in this stuff where they have Ralph the Wonder Llama featured all throughout the credits at the very beginning. And I thought that was really interesting because I've seen a lot of, of llama symbolism like all throughout my research. So let's check out the llama. What's the esoteric symbolism behind the llama? And why are we seeing the llama all over the place, right? Well, this is the llama. This is what you typically think of. It's basically a tiny camel which is also important. Fortnite features the llama all over the place. Why? Why are these people choosing to, to show llamas? The symbolism of llamas being associated with the apocalypse itself. This is uh, from a video game. You can see all the llamas fighting against some sort of robot there. 
and it's called Vicious Attack Llama Apocalypse, which reminded me of the movie called Llamageddon, where they feature llamas once again. And the llamas are like uh, basically plasma possessed. It looks like they've got the red eyes and stuff and they're attacking people. We also saw the llamas when we broke down the movie The Color Out of Space. The Color Out of Space with Nicolas Cage also featured some llamas that were hit by plasma and mutated and changed. So let's check out the word llama. Relative of the old world camels. Okay, sweet. So we've got a camel connection. That's good because the camel actually plays or, or the word camel or camel or gamel plays a huge part um, in the symbolism in this movie. We're going to find out. Remember the camel and remember that. So uh, if we look at the etymology of the word llama, we find out that it actually seems to stem from the Latin word flamma, flamma, which is a doublet of flamma, which means flame, as you can see right here. So the, the word llama, and, and actually it's really funny because when I Google, what does the word llama mean? You know, aside from just telling me, oh, it means this weird looking camel, mini camel or whatever. So lamb, it says Old English. It comes from lam, lomb, lamb. And if we go down a bit more, it says in Middle High German, lamp. Lamb is actually lamp. Lamb means light. It means lamp. Um, and and uh, the llama, which was actually flamma, which meant flame, that F um, when you go far back enough in time, it was actually the hook. It was a vav, and it meant of the. It's vlama, or of the flame, of the light. Also, we've got a holiday called lamas. Lamas, basically. Lamas, like more than one llama, or more than one flame, more than one light, more than one fire. And it says here, occasionally, it's uh, this holiday, which is celebrated by both pagans and Christians, which is very interesting to me as well. It's occasionally spelled lambmas, or the mass of the lamb, or the mass or the gathering of the lights. Oh, here's a llama's blessing. Uh, this is one of the blessings that's said during this particular holiday. It says, hoof and horn, hoof and horn, all that dies shall be reborn. Corn and grain, corn and grain, all that falls shall rise again. This is a historic collection of things that were happening, um, at least to the Anglo-Saxons and related people during the time of the Dark Ages. So let's see what it says here. In the year 679 AD, the monastery of Coldingham was destroyed by fire from heaven. 979, it says this same year was seen a bloody... Velken oft times in the likeness of fire. Velken means uh, vault of the sky. This same year, AD 979, was seen a bloody Velken or a blood blood red sky, blood red vault of the sky, oftentimes in the likeness of fire, just like the llama we said represents fire or the flama, the flame, right? The lamb. And that was most apparent at midnight. So in the middle of the night, the, the entire sky looked blood red to them. Uh, and so in misty beams was shown. But when it began to dawn, it glided away. 1123, sometime just before that in November. And it says here, after this, there were many shipmen on the sea and on freshwater who said that when they saw that they saw on the northeast level with the earth, a fire huge and broad, which anon waxed in length up to the Velkin, up to the sky. So it got bigger and bigger and bigger, this huge fire. And the Velkin, the vault of the sky, undid itself in four parts. The sky came apart, is what they're saying, and fought against it, fought against this fire, as if it would quench it. And the fire waxed, nevertheless, up to the heaven. So some sort of light or fire went up to the heavens and got bigger and bigger. The fire they saw in the dawn, in the day dawn, uh, lasted until it was light over all. In AD 774, this year also appeared in the heavens a red crucifix after sunset. The Mercians and the men of Kent fought at Otford and wonderful serpents 
Let me make this a little smaller. Wonderful serpents were seen in the land in the South Saxons. So at the same time, during this Middle Age, this is real. This isn't a part of the movie or anything. This is our real history, right, from the Anglo-Saxon and uh, related types of people, right? So that it says this, check, let's, let's read this one again. In the year 8774, this year appeared in the heavens a red crucifix after sunset and wonderful serpents. Wonderful serpents. Remember, remember that the way that they're describing that, because that's going to come back. Wonderful serpents were seen in the land of the South Saxons. This is AD 975. So we're still towards the end of the Middle Ages. Well known to me in Mercia then, how low on the earth God's glory fell on every side. So the glory of God, which is akin to light, essentially, some sort of heavenly cosmic light, right? fell down to the earth, low onto the earth. And it says, uh, chased from the land, his servants fled. So this light freaked people out and they were scattering about. They were running and losing their minds. Their wisdom was scorned. Much grief to him whose bosom, whose bosom glowed with fervent love of great creation's Lord. That's pretty interesting. Let's see what else happened. This is just to give you a background, right? Just to, just to get an idea. What, what were the Middle Ages like? On the night preceding the Lord's Supper, that is, the Thursday before Easter, were seen two moons in the heavens before day, the one in the east and the other in the west. Both of them were full, and it was uh, about the 14th day of the moon. This is an actual historic record of people having witnessed and seen Fapau, two moons in the sky. AD 793, this year came dreadful forewarnings over the land of the Northumbrians, terrifying the people most woefully. These were immense sheets of light rushing through the air and whirlwinds and fiery dragons flying across the firmament. Let's take a look at this. We've got King Arthur. He's riding up. He's in the mist. He's in the fog. And uh, there's this deal over here. There's like this pole and a circle and what looks like a person up there. They feature it again. There's a pole, which is the blue beam symbolism, the rod god that I've talked about in many videos, and the circle. But there's a person on top. What is this and what's going on? This is a torture device. Let's talk about torture and the Middle Ages, right? This is really weird to me personally, that they had all of, like, like torture was such a common occurrence, but they physically tortured people, it seems like a bunch, if we look back in our history, and it seemed to kind of be okay with everybody. So, this torture device was called the breaking wheel. Let's check it out. This one right here, let me zoom in on it. You can actually see that uh, there's people up there that seem to be, like, dead or dying, and they're hanging on this wheel in the sky. Another wheel in the sky symbolism. Let's check out some more images. We've got here the execution of Peter Stump involving the breaking wheel. And this is all in Monty Python. This is very funny. They're, they're making light of history, but we can shine the light on history. See how the, these people, various people are tied down to these wheels? This is what they did before they put the wheel up on a pole and stuck it up in the sky. They took people and they used the wheel to break them. That's why it's called the breaking wheel, this huge wheel they use to crush their bodies, to mutilate and, and mangle and distort them. Uh, there's many different pictures and examples of this breaking wheel. Some of it's drawn artistically. It shows you that, that there is some somebody who's in trouble. They're on the ground and they've been stretched out on this X. They take the breaking wheel and they basically slam it into their bones, their shin. If if they were really bad, they would start at the bottom of the body, like the feet, work their way up to the legs, break the arms, and they would break right in the middle, right where the biggest, strongest parts of your bones are, um, which completely breaks you and leaves you looking like a human noodle, basically. So they took the breaking wheel, they would break most of the major bones in the arms and the legs, and then they would thread the body throughout the wheel, right? Just sort of threading it into the wheel, tying it so that it would stay on there. Then they would stick the wheel onto a pole and put it up into the sky, you know, as a warning to people or whatever. I don't know. It's insane. So here's another image. They would tie people down and literally just 
just break them with this giant, huge, heavy wheel. Isn't that insane? Here is a church. This is an old Catholic church. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you some more about um, who this church is named after in a bit, but let's take a look at this. They have the breaking wheel as a stained glass window. You can see the other side of the window. This is what it looks like when you're on the inside of this church building. It looks just like that. This is the wheel in the sky. The all-seeing eye symbolism that I talk about, the depressurization point at the, uh, right above the North Pole um, where the North Star is today. And this symbolically is the plasma that is swirling around just on the other side of our sky or our stained glass window or whatever. And it is swirling around as it comes down and grounds itself to the earth during these cataclysms, right? It's oftentimes called the wheel of fortune because it would open up and you never know what was going to happen. Different things would happen whenever this event would occur. Um, and it would change the seasons. It would change the times and you never knew which time it was going to be. It's also called the Wheel of Dharma. We took what they were literally writing about and we internalized it in order to force it to make sense, right? But what if it wasn't all internalized? What if it wasn't all symbolic? What if it physically actually happened and these events were seen in the sky and people told stories about them, about the cosmic wheel and the pole that shoots up to meet that cosmic wheel in the sky and that creator God or that savior type figure that is seen as sacrificing itself on the cosmic tree or pole or, or, what, or whatnot, right? So people have these different concepts of the wheel in the sky or that beam that shoots up to meet that wheel in the sky. Cross. This is plasma discharge. This is what it looks like on a small scale. Now imagine this is the sky. Here's another one. Uh, you might think that this is like some sort of Hindu sculpture or something, but it's actually not. This is more along the lines of paganism and uh, various branches of paganism uh, where you can see the different holidays. Midsummer, uh, there's there's uh, Luke Asa. I can't read that one that great. Beltane, I see there. Remember Luke? Luke means light, right? When Anytime you see that. Uh, you got Yule down there at the bottom. Samhain, Mabon, Mabon. All all deserve their very own studies. Let's go back to King Arthur and see what's going on. All right. So King Arthur continues his journey. He's like, forget the people at the castle. They're not listening to me. And he gets to these slave people. All of the people who are not royalty in this movie are constantly digging in the mud. They're always be seen as being in the mud. Mud is also a huge part of this whole Middle, Middle Ages concept, right? Everything was very dirty and muddy, etc. He's like, I am your king, right? And they're like, king? I didn't vote for you. And he's like, you don't vote for kings. And, then, and they're like, how did you become king then, right? This is very logical, right? If you just see some dude walking around, he's like, I'm your king, by the way. Do what I say. And, you're not, and you have not given into that consent. And that's not your way of life. It's a very strange thing for you to hear. So they're like, how did you become king? And they're waiting on some sort of reasonable, rational explanation on how he became king that there's some sort of reasonable, rational explanation. So let's listen to King Arthur's explanation on how he became king. The lady of the lake, her arm clad in the purest shimmering Samite, held aloft Excalibur from the bosom of the water. But let's check out Excalibur. You've all heard of Excalibur. At the very least, the place in Las Vegas, you know, that looks like a castle, right? Excalibur, the sword, the magical sword of King Arthur or whatever, right? What does that mean? What does Excalibur mean? We say that just like we say many other people's names, but we don't know what it means. We don't know the origin. We don't know the descriptor. What does that describe? What is it talking about? What is Excalibur? Let's break it down. It's the sword in the stone. The, sto the sword that no one could pull. No, no one could get to come out of the stone except for the rightful king, somebody who was pure of heart, right? Usually the stone is seen as being a black stone, by the way. So let's break down the word X caliber. Let's start with the word X. X means out of or from. Also means upwards. Hey, thanks for the donations, everyone. I super appreciate you all. Four jacks. Um, so X, something out of, something coming up out of, right? Okay. Cali. X Cali. That's the next word, right? Cali means it's from Sanskrit, uh, Sanskrit Kali, which literally means the black one. 
mind blown already something coming up out of the black one okay and it's a sword all right i already know where it's going but let's continue on excali burr right what does burr mean if we look up burr it doesn't just mean like "ooh, i'm cold burr or whatever it comes from the proto-indo-european root word proto-indo-european bars which means bristle and it says go see the word bristle so if we look up bristle real quick it says Sanskrit word meaning point or spike. A point or a spike. X out of the black one, point or a spike. So it could be described as, um, or I describe it as the spike or the rod from out of the black one, the dark one, which is Rupas Nigra, the dark mountain, the black mountain, the magnetic mountain, etc. Rupas Nigra, the black rock. A phantom island was believed to be a 33-mile-wide black rock. Uh, Mercator, who drew the map, described the actual plasma volcano, as I call it, as being 33 miles in circumference which I believe is a lot of the 33 symbolism as well. This is an example, a picture of Mercator's version of Rupus Nigra. This was an official map that was used by kings and queens and commoners alike uh, for, for years upon years upon years, right? And at the middle, it was accepted that there was Rupus Nigra, this black mountain, this uh, plasma volcano, as I call it, with a lake around it, a crystal lake, a crystal clear lake, um, with these four lands as well. All right, so moving on. Now we have a better idea of who Arthur is. He is the mountain of Thor, or he is the mountain of light, essentially. And he was given the sword, which was Excalibur, which is this beam that comes up out of the dark one or the black one, right? He says, so the lady of the lake said that I, Arthur, was to carry Excalibur, which is true. The mountain, the black rock, is what holds the sword right? Or that beam, the sword of truth, etc. That's why the, the sword always destroys the dragon or pole or whatever, right? So they say, so this guy, this guy cracks me up. He goes, listen, listen, strange women lying in ponds distributing swords is no basis for a system of government, supreme executive power, blah, 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 right? That's how ridiculous it sounds when you personify it, right? When you believe the literal actual story, it kind of sounds ridiculous to physical actual people right? So if we, now I'm not saying that it, that can't happen. Okay. I'm just saying that there's more context to be had for cosmic events. He says, I mean, if I went around saying I was an emperor because some moistened bent had lobbed a scimitar at me, they'd put me away. That's very good reasoning, right? That's the same reasoning that all of your Kings and Queens basically, uh, used. They say like, Hey, I, I rule by divine right. God told me that I should rule over you. Camelot, Camelot, Camelot. The three beams that shoot up from the mysterious island and around it, right, um, at the North Pole. Camelot. Let's talk about Camelot. Remember how I said, remember the camel at the very beginning and it's going to come into play? Let's talk about camel. Now, I'm going to easily break down Camelot. The O-T, O-T is a pluralized uh, suffix, okay? So it pluralizes a word. It means more than one, right? So more than one, camel, whatever that is. The word camel comes from the word or the letter gimel, right? Gimel. And this is how it was originally written. This is the Nike swoosh. It is the letter G, and it is also equates to the number three. This, they put this swoosh onto a shoe because it rip, it literally is a foot. It actually represents feet, right? This is a picture of a leg in motion and a foot sticking out. But this is the earliest glyph. It looks like a check mark and it was gimel. Gimel ot means mini gimel, mini camels, you could say, but I don't think so. What does gimel mean? The word gimel itself means something. What does it mean? It starts off with the g, which is the foot. Then we go to m, gimel. M means water in the old language. That's why it looks like m. It looks like water at the top of water, right? So a foot, a water, and then the l. The l was a staff or a rod or a beam or however you want to see it. And it symbolized uh, leadership and specifically leadership 
um, that was seen as benevolent and leadership that would teach people or guide people, much like the shepherd holding his staff and watching over and protecting and guiding his sheep. This walking could also be implied as like destination or a place to go to or a meeting place, right? So walk on water just like Jesus, right? Walk on water, beam, walk on water, staff, etc. They keep on walking and the sky opens up and a hole opens up in the sky where God appears. And he goes, uh, Arthur, king of the Britons. And they all immediately hit the ground. Conditions change in our world that cause them to fall down. They're, they're like trying not to look at him. And he's like, what are you doing? And he's like, I'm averting my eyes, O Lord. Don't look at the deadlights, okay? This is Pennywise. That's, that's pretty much Pennywise's mouth. When he opens it and you see those three lights or whatever, right? Uh, you're not supposed to look at the deadlights. The movies give us little breadcrumbs that some of us are going to remember. They're, they're trying to find the grail, right? And they heard that there's like this wise wizard guy who knows where the grail is. And he says, he knows of a cave, a cave which no man has entered. Now, here's an example. There are many alchemical representations of the things that I'm sharing with you now. This is one image I have found of an alchemical drawing of our world. And this is the entrance into that cave, the cave that he's talking about. I call it the cave of saviors. You can call it whatever you want to. It is the opening into our world, which leads into the world, into the hollow recesses underneath us. Um, let me just zoom in just a bit. Now you see how they draw this too? They draw it almost like you can walk forward, but this is not. This is a top down, okay? So they're kind of playing with the positions here. But if you look, this is the opening to the plasma volcano. These are the people who are going into it, but that's a picture of the entrance to the plasma volcano. Here's another example. I'm going to show you a few of these because Arthur needs to find this cave, right? This is the plasma volcano. Here are the gods at the top. This is Mount Olympus, Mount Maru, Mount Sinai, etc. And usually there's beams of light shooting out of it to show you that it is not a lava volcano. Okay. Here's another example of the plasma volcano in ancient drawings, right? Usually there's a lot of people just hanging out at the base of the mountain. This was their home. And they're showing you that. And then they show you at the very top here, it looks like it's sort of like volcano-ish. And then there's like the eye of God and stuff above that. Uh, here's another example. There are many of these. I encourage you to check out some on your own to see what you can find. But here you can see all the people at the base of the mountain, everyone gathering around the mountain. This, is, this mountain was also seen as Helm's Deep whenever we broke down the Lord of the Rings trilogy. So here's the mountain of the Lord. You can see the electricity all over the place and the fire of God coming out of it, etc. Here's another example. This one's very interesting to me because I'm going to show you the top down, right? At the top, we've got the circle, etc. This is where God lives at the top, the crown, etc. This is the plasma volcano. It's got some different openings and entrances. And at the bottom, let's zoom in all the way because I want to show you this. At the bottom, it shows a rabbit and a hole that goes into the mountain. There's a rabbit hole at the bottom of this one. There's a cave and there's a rabbit right where, <laughs> right where Mount Maru would be, basically. And King Arthur is going to see something very similar here in just a bit. Here's another version. This is the original. It was black and white. So that's actually a white rabbit. Oh, no, I'm sorry. This is a totally different one, but this one's black and white, and you can see the white rabbit in front of the little cave entrance there. Anyways, they meet the wizard that they were looking for. His name is Tim. And he says, yes, I can help you find the grail to the north. Oh, pff. imagine that. The grail is found in the north. That's where it is. That's where the that's where the Holy Grail is located, at the northern extremities of our world. All right, so they get to this cave, and he's like, there's the monster. And they look and there's a little white rabbit at the entrance to the cave, exactly like in the old pictures that we looked at earlier, right? Little white rabbit. And then uh, this part cracks me up too. Sir Robin stands up over here and he's like, you tit, I soiled my armor. I was so scared. Anyways, this represents a little fanazoid that just handled this dude. They thought it was all cute. Little bunny they wanted to go pet. Don't pet the fantazoids. Please don't pet the phantasoids. Please don't pet the otherworldly creatures or heavenly creatures that you see because they might look very cute, very beautiful. Some of them, right? There's going to be all different kinds, right? Some will look very scary and creepy. Some will be more like unicorns and you'll, you'll think, oh, I could just go. It's friendly. I'll just go up to it until the unicorn, whoosh, you know what I mean? Anyways, all right. And then he goes, Jesus Christ, 
I warned you. <laughs> like he tried to fr- he tried to freaking warn them, don't pet the phanazoids, but they did not listen. So then they go down into the cave. This is where it gets super interesting. If you didn't think it was interesting before, they go down into the cave. Now remember, they're looking for m- mystical writing, for magic runes and whatnot, right? What does it say? What language is that? And then they show you the la- the language that's written on the cave. Now this is kind of dark and it's kind of hard to make out. But if you bear with me, I will tell you exactly what language this is. It's not mystical. It's not unknown. And it's not Aramaic, as they say in the movie. This right here looks like an upside down letter A. You see that? That's an ox head. This is how the letter A used to look in Phoenician. You see underneath that, how it looks like a sort of number nine or something right there? That is the letter Bait. It's the letter B in Phoenician. Over here, what looks like a little comb, that is the letter hey. Hey. It's the fifth letter in the Phoenician alphabet. Right next to that, you can kind of see it. Let's zoom in just a bit here. Right next to it, you can see that there's this sort of W that has a long line that goes down. That's the letter mem. It's It represents water and more specifically something coming up out of the water. This is inside of one of those caves, right? This is a symbol is a symbolic version or showing of the emerald tablets of Toth or Tot, right? There are things written on these walls and apparently they're written in Phoenician. Uh, let's see. It says you may find the Holy Grail in the castle of Arg. Arg. Basically, arg. So what does arg mean, right? Is that just something, you know, that uh, uh, it sounds like somebody's dying and that's it? Or does it also have meaning to it? Arg, if we take a look at it here, comes from the Proto-Indo-European root word meaning to shine or white or so white that it's bright or that it's shining, right? Hence, silver as the shining or white metal. The difference between the king and the cowardly, I would say. Arthur pays attention. Arthur gleans from everywhere he goes. He's picking up little truths and putting them in the Rolodex of his mind and the library of his brain for future reference. He asks him, what's the airspeed velocity of an unladen swallow? Now, if we've been paying attention throughout the movie, they actually tell us. They told us at the very beginning of the movie when you thought it was a joke. Turns out to be actually something that was crucial. He says, what do you mean? An African or a European swallow? Now he knows, he's picked up all of this chat, all these little side jokes all throughout the movie about all the different types of swallow and how fast they beat their wings and what they can carry and what they cannot carry. He's listening. He's paying attention. So he's asking him to clarify. And this guy thought he just had him. And he's like, I don't know that. Boom. And he gets sucked up into the sky and tossed into the bog of eternal stench or whatever it is. The bottomless pit. He says, um, how do you know so much about swallows? Right? He says, you have to know these things when you're a king, you know. And he kind of dismisses it. He minimizes it. But the reality is, if we were paying attention, we would notice that King Arthur was paying attention throughout this entire movie. He was picking up all of the little breadcrumbs along the way. Drums are going. And... This is so interesting because Jumanji itself says what exactly what it is, which is a way to leave your world behind. This entire movie is giving you instructions or giving us instructions on how to leave the world, on how to get out of this reality, on how to escape the matrix, on where to go in order to solve the maze. It gives you a huge clue in the form of color, that emerald green color, the kids become the characters in the video game itself. Immediately, you've got Plasma Apocalypse symbolism where he gets super strength. Kevin Hart cracks me up in this movie so much. Oh my God. He's, he stands up, he's like, who are you? And everyone's like, wait, who are you? Who is she? Right? They don't know who they are. Now, this reminds me a lot of this video game called Fortnite where the characters are just dropped down out of the sky as they are in this movie as well. 
and um, they don't remember who they are. Everybody has amnesia. Dropped onto an island, no one knows who they are. It's a very similar theme. Immediately they're attacked by a giant hippo. He gets eaten, right? It's totally funny. Um, and then so they're like, go, go rescue him. And he's like, uh-uh, I'm not getting in there. He's like, why not? He's like, you don't get in the water with the backpack. Everybody knows that. <laughs> he's totally terrified. So he's like using his little backpack as an excuse not to get in the water. It cracks me up every time. Oh my God. <laughs> Everybody knows you don't get in the water with a backpack. How could these people fall thousands of feet from the sky, land on the ground and not be too injured, right? Well, it's possible if it's representing a weakened gravitational force here in our world. And these outer worldly beings, which is what they are, okay, um, fall down into this world, essentially, right? So from other worlds, that's the time when the sky opens up or, or the apocalypse, or the unveiling, the lifting of the veil or the covering, the uncovering, I should say, is probably the best word for it. When our world is uncovered, that's whenever other beings can come in and we can leave. So they float down in here with the greatest of ease. Now this is the map. This map gets more detailed as the movie goes on. It fills itself in here. But look at it, right? Let's take a nice close look right at, towards the middle of this map. It looks kind of familiar to me because I study older maps. Maps that are not modern and popular like this map right here. He says, how did you see your strengths and your weaknesses? They all want to know how he did that. And he brought it up, right? How do you, how do you know what your strengths and your weaknesses are? So he says, well, I think I just pressed on my enormous left peck. Basically, he touched his heart. Okay. Put his hand over his heart. He went inside. He found out what his strengths were. He found out what his weaknesses were. They check out this other guy and He's a cartographist, which is sweet, an archaeologist, paleontologist. These are all things I think are cool. I think these are sweet, right? But remember, this used to be like a really popular kind of cheerleader type girl in high school or whatever. She's not into all of this stuff. And then her weakness is endurance. So she's super slow. She's not happy about any of this, right? Some of you might feel that way, right? You came into this world and, you know, all you're looking at is all your weaknesses. And you're like, oh, man, that sucks. My weaknesses are lame like compared to your strengths, etc. And this is kind of what we do here in the real world, right? And then, then you've got him and he says, he's like zoology, weapons valet. He doesn't even know what these are. And he's like, weakness is cake, speed, and strength. How is strength my weakness? <laughs> okay, so remember his, his weakness was cake. One of his weaknesses was cake. The Hebrews leaving Egypt, they were wandering around in the wilderness. They were commanded not to eat things that had leaven in them, which also is symbolic of not allowing yourselves after the plasma apocalypse to return to a fallen state. Keep yourselves pure, essentially, right? Um, what that is, is if you don't put leavening in bread or like baking soda or something like that, it won't get all puffy. That's The leavening is what get, makes bread puff out or cake puff out or various other items, right? Um, so unleavened ones, like I showed you earlier with the matzah, uh, tend to be like more like crackers and wafers and very thin. Um, so what happens to him when he eats it? Well, just like the cake does, when you put leavening in it, it blows up. So he blows up and loses a life. That's their clue is a black rock. And they're like, this doesn't look like the piece of the map because they're looking for some sort of a missing piece. Now the black rock is in the shape of an elephant, which we'll get to in a bit. But it's a black rock, which usually indicates volcanic. Interesting, right? Now, on the piece of paper, it says, when you see me, begin to climb. So when you see the black rock, begin to climb. Now, she says, the clue was to go to the bazaar to find the missing piece. <gasps> Wait a minute. Let's say that one more time a little slower and really think about what this is saying to us. Go to the bazaar to find the missing piece. So where's that missing piece going to be? With the bazaar. Think about it. So he says, we gotta get one, an airplane, and get across the canyon. Now this is interesting too, because I see a lot of canyon symbolism as well in the movies. For example, in uh, this is from Indiana Jones. There's the, there was the canyon of the crescent moon before they got to the Holy Grail. They had to get, you know, go to the a canyon. Here's the canyon in this movie. It also kind of reminds me of this movie right here. 
where these kids need to cross this canyon and they literally have a leap of faith where they jump and gravity acts strange. I don't know if there was a spell or whatever it was in the movie. I forgot, but they float right across. Also reminds me of whenever Indiana Jones like was in, in that one, he was in a canyon and he had to take a leap of faith. He had to take a, a step off of something where it looked like he would fall but he had to like just trust that he wouldn't fall, right? He didn't understand why he wouldn't fall, but he knew he had to do that in order to get to this holy grail. Uh, so then this guy's got the backpack on, right? And uh, basically his backpack is like a magic bag. And you see the magic bags a lot. I did a video on magic bags and Mary Poppins and Hermione's bag and um felix the cat and all that stuff where you where you put stuff into the bag uh merlin merlin has one in the sword in the stone right so whatever you put into the bag essentially it shrinks it becomes smaller right and then whenever you grab it and you take it out it gets bigger so it seems like you're just you know magically pulling out whatever and it, it shouldn't fit or whatever right it's bigger on the inside it's actually not when you go on the inside of the bag everything gets smaller so it appears to be bigger on the inside um but when you take it out of the bag, it is bigger on the on the outside, right? When it, once it comes out, so this guy just starts pulling out random stuff that looks like it should clearly not be fitting in this backpack that he has, and it's that's the magic bag. The magic bag is our world, right? Once one side, the inside, will make you grow smaller. One side, the outside, will make you grow larger. That's how the macrocosm works, or the fractal verse, as I like to call it. This is a time differential. Whenever you enter into one of these enclosed worlds, time for us speeds up because we get smaller, we shrink, lifespans get weaker and smaller and lesser and lesser and lesser, and we essentially lose our immortality, okay, if you want to call it that, right, or the possibility of immortality. And uh, meanwhile, out there, outside of Jumanji, which is our world, essentially, um, you can live way longer. The conditions exist to promote uh, lengthier lifespans. So it seems like time's going by real slow out there in comparison. Just like if you ever see a time travel movie and there's some sort of a like field between the person who is time traveling and the people on the outside who are not, like you can tell like if, if the people on the outside are moving super, 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 super fast, that means that they have short lifespans and you are the immortal in that situation. You're, you're moving in, like you're almost not even moving to them if they were to see you. Okay. But be careful because if you're in one of those situations and you see somebody who looks like they're not moving at all, but just barely, that means you're aging super quick. So you might want to get out of there. <laughs> okay, so this dude, the rock goes climbing a tree and he sees a squirrel and the squirrel's like, ah, and the rock totally falls down. <laughs> and then all of these uh, jaguars come out. And you know what? I was like, that reminds me of the emperor's new groove. Whenever uh, the llama goes deep into the heart of the forest and there's all these jaguars there that are all sleeping. And then he sees this little chipmunk <laughs> and the chipmunk wakes them all up and they get mad. <laughs> Uh, squeaker, squeak, squeak them. That movie cracked me up. Uh, let's see. And then we've got this jaguar. So I want to kind of talk about jaguars, right? So how does this building or how does this, uh, statue of a jaguar represent Mount Maru? Jog. Okay. Just think about that. We're putting together jaguar. Remember when we broke down the word wolf, how it literally has nothing to do with the wolf. Same thing with the jaguar. That's why people are like, we don't know its origins, but now it means a big cat. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, okay, fine. Let's figure out what it originally meant. So jog, a sharp projection. All right, we're going to go with that. There are many connotations to this word. It all just depends on what else you add to it, but we're going to go with the sharp projection. So jog means a sharp projection. Okay. Like Jaeger or Jaeger, right? Um, somebody who projects things outwards right a hunter somebody who shoots arrows essentially um so jog and then u just means attached to or of the and then or or r which means light or fire so jog u r or protrusion with light or light beam essentially so this guy takes the eye he puts it back the rock restores you know, Tafiti or whatever. Hey, that was actually the rock in the other movie too, huh? How interesting is that? So the rock was Maui and wow, that just blew my mind. Okay. Anyways, so he restores the, uh, the emerald green 
uh, to the world. So when the Aurora Borealis comes back, essentially, then our world is good, right? Uh, the, the green energy oftentimes represents the heart chakra. And what this is telling us is that we need to restore the heart to this world. We need to restore the love, believe it or not. That's what it's all about. Every single movie, everything's all about restoring the love. Now, here's an actual bird's eye view of where they are. Here's right here in the middle with that green light. As you can see, it sort of looks like the old North Pole maps with like these four different sections to it and rivers and stuff. Now, if you take a look at this, this particular angle of the statue, to which, which to me is Mount Maru, okay? But it totally reminded me of the Thundercats um, lair, essentially. I don't know if you guys are old enough to remember this show, but this was a popular cartoon when I was a kid, and this is where all the little superheroes lived, the gods of old. Whatever you want to call them, superheroes are basically old gods. Check this out. This is really interesting. This is how they travel. This is how they leave the Matrix is through the phone lines, through the phone system, right? Um, which is really interesting because Keanu Reeves was also in um, Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure where they travel through the phone system or the circuits of time. But I find it interesting well, like a well, um, like a wishing well, which is a hole in the ground where there's, you know, like water down at the bottom or whatever and lake. There's a lot of these types of references to water as well when it comes to the exit points. So Trinity's trying to get away from the agents. There's a phone booth right there. Boom. That's how she has to get out of the matrix. Why? Now, the moment that electromagnetic barrier goes down during an electromagnetic neutral point, boom, all of that pressure goes right to the top, blows the sky open right at the top, blows a hole in the dome. Um, now, if you were to travel through that hole, I believe on the other side exist what I call plasma conduits, tunnels, uh, passageways, right? Uh, just like in Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, they also use the circuits of time to go to these different times, which I believe are just different Earths, alternate Earths that look like you're in a different time. But if you were to leave this world, go travel through those plasma conduits, aka those circuits of time or those phone lines. See, that the reason it's it's referred to as like a phone line the way that they travel is because it's a circuit that tr that passes along information. So if a person is traveling from one realm to another realm, they are essentially made of information. Okay, so they travel through these uh, phone lines, circuits of time, whatever. Doctor Who does the exact same thing in his TARDIS, which is a call box or a phone, essentially. Superman also changes from a regular guy into a superhero whenever he goes into these phone booths. And I believe that's the symbolism that's behind that. Because a person could leave this world, you could appear to be a regular old human with no power whatsoever, but whenever you go through those openings, those circuits of time, those plasma conduits, whatever you'd like to refer to them as, and then you get to your destination, all of a sudden you might be in a world where the gravitational pull is far less strong or there's a uh, way less pressure, right? And you would be like a superhero. He starts to come out of his days and he looks up at the computer screen and he's like, whoa. And it says the matrix has you. And then it says it instructs Neo and it's also instructing you. So anytime it's talking to the character in the movie, it's also talking to us. This is to those who have the spirit of Neo inside of you. They follow the white rabbit. He goes into this tunnel, right? And Alice follows him and she ends up in a wonderland, a land that's completely different from the world that she knows. So imagine symbolically, this is our world. This is you. You're right there, somebody who's waking up or trying to wake up, right? So what do the agents do when they, when they want to implement a way to keep people from spreading the truth about the Matrix? Boom. <laughs> you can see it. You know what I'm referencing. You already know what I'm talking about. Pa pow They cover the mouth. Now we can't talk about it, right? Now nobody's not, he's, he's too muffled. Nobody's going to understand him. He becomes a slave. They try to enslave Neo right now by covering his mouth. He's muffled. It literally says that right there, right? Interesting. So then they grab him because he refuses to cooperate and they bug him. They put their technology in him 
to track him. Remember, we were using a, they were using a trace program at the very beginning because they needed to track these people, the enlightened, those who are waking up. I'm going to have to move the popcorn over. Hold and they put a bug in him. They put this nasty thing. They, they, they put this thing inside of him. They had to take it out. They had to get all that garbage and all that disgusting nastiness that was inside of his body out so that he can wake up and snap out of it. So if you ever see the spiral staircase scene, this is in many different movies. There's a reason they put it in there because it messes with your subconscious mind. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Spiral staircases might be cool, I guess, you know, but pfft, not that cool that you have to put them in like every other movie or whatever. It's, they're symbolic. They represent the, the, the spiraling plasma uh, conduits, like I was referencing earlier, right? That take you from one reality to another reality. So whenever you see characters traversing a spiral staircase, usually the stuff is about to hit the fan. Usually you're about to go from one rea reality or one extreme to another. This one right here happens to be the black and white checkerboard floor of the Illuminati or whatever. Um, according to my research, right, my research indicates to me that the checkerboard floor, the black and white tiles, um, are representative of the fractalverse or space. If you were to leave this world and look around, you would see the white spots, which is space, because I believe space is actually more of a brilliant, colorful white a shimmering white color instead of a black darkness. I don't believe I don't believe in black dark space. I used to, but I don't anymore. Um, the blackness is the space that is above us that covers our world. Essentially, each one of these black tiles represents an alternate Earth, a, a, a realm that is covered or dark or a dark city. Just like we talked about, dark city and the Matrix have you know um, they're correlated, right? So you have your black squares or boxes or containers, which is really what it is. Um, and then you have in between the whiteness and the splendor of the heavens or space, right? And there's many different worlds therein. Check this out. The classic red or blue pill. This is why, why is it red and blue? Red versus blue, right? It's the color of our sky. The blue sky is the one you have right now. If you want to take that and you want to live in the world as it is, the crappy, sucky, lifeless world that that is here today take the blue pill that's the blue sky you can live under the blue sky that's that's the world that has been flooded etc um all of the energy is being drained out of it or you can take the red pill and choose to live in the red sky arnold schwarzenegger is trapped in his own mind in this sort of dream world and in order to escape it he's offered a red pill to escape the dream world Neo gets flushed. He goes down these tubes and all of a sudden there's like this uh, water slide scene, right? This is also symbolic. You'll see this in many different movies. For some reason, they insist that you watch the character like go through all this crazy water slide action, right? Why? Like, I mean, it's, it's interesting. It's cool, but it's not that cool that it needs to be so prolific in movie symbolism. So there he is. Whoosh flying through this water slide and they have this whole thing insisting you follow him on this journey. Why? Because it's a plasma conduit. That's what you're looking at. This is the symbolism of being born again, leaving the womb of this world, leaving Mother Earth, leaving the Matrix, whatever you want to call it, and being born again, getting out there into the electromagnetic, aka the spiritual, aka the heavens. And uh, it's just like in the movie Goonies. That's, that's what came to my mind when I was watching this, when they're trying to find the treasure or whatever. It's also in, uh, this is Napoleon. This is a shot from Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure when they go to Waterloo, right? Why did they put that in the movie? That, 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 this had way too much time in, to move in the movie unless it was highly symbolic of something, right? Now, he's introducing the crew. This is Apoc. Apocalypse, boom, that's that's one symbol, symbolism. Switch, the switch of the electromagnetics. It is uh, a reversal, it's a switching of the energy in our world. Uh, cipher, cipher is something that you have to figure out. It's a riddle, essentially. Tank is over here, his brother Dozer. Dozer means to be asleep, interesting, because he actually dies. Uh, Tank, Tank. Oh, Tank. Tank was an interesting one because for me, I was trying to figure out what Tank could possibly represent. He's not super strong like Dozer looks like over here. Dozer's got the muscles showing and stuff, so you would think he would be the Tank. You know what I mean? But he's not. 
tank, I believe, is called this because it's short for Tanakh, okay? Uh, this guy's the operator. He's the one that reads the coding of the Matrix. Forgot why I took a picture of that. And he's like, this isn't real, right? Well, wait a minute. How do you define real, right? See, it's all, I love, I love Morpheus. He's, I like Morpheus more than I like Neo. Neo irritates me sometimes. Morpheus is cool to me, right? He's my favorite. Um, he's a dream. He's a dream God and I'm J dreamer. So <laughs> you know what I mean? Anyway, um, he's like, how do you define? He's like, let's, before we have this conversation, Neo, let's set some definitions down because you're coming from a world that you thought existed and it doesn't. So your world is upside down and backwards. You want to talk about what's real? Good. Let's define real. Let's define, let's, let's both establish and set a foundation so that we can build a bridge to one another and meet in the middle. He says, real is simply electrical signals interpreted by your brain. That's what real is. So the matrix, this world that we live in right now is real. Okay. The, the video games you play are real. The movies you watch are real. Um, the, whatever you do in your daily life, you're going to job, all that stuff. If you go out into space, everything essentially becomes real. It's no longer nihilism. It's no longer everything is not real and therefore it doesn't matter. It is now the exact opposite. And now everything has purpose and everything has meaning and value because everything is real. A singular consciousness. Ooh, okay, I like this. That spawned an entire race of machines. You could see the plasma that comes down into this world in the plasma sphere above us and beyond. Uh, it's all connected like a root system. And therefore, it is a singular consciousness. The plasma, aka spirit, okay? I believe basically over time it turned into Satan and Santa Claus and all kinds of different stuff. Um, but it comes down into this world from time to time. And it is a singular consciousness. However, everything that it touches, it animates, it possesses, it takes control of. It is spirit looking to incorporate itself or to put itself into a body, right? So as these little branches branch out and touch all of our empty vessels that we call robots and computers and things like that, now you have a very possible reality of the Terminator's Skynet being born from the sky above, from the net that surrounds our world, which is the plasmosphere. Rise of the machines, the machines all coming to life and becoming sentient, cars turning on all by themselves. And guess what they're going to do? They're going to listen to their master, to their uh, root, to their core. They're going to they're, they're kill. They're going to try to kill and, and get rid of everything and wipe everything out because that's what they're here to do. They're here to clean house. Okay, so everything that gets possessed by it will also become murderous and try to clean house. So all these robots and all the stuff that turns on, right, whatever it may be, is going to have that same purpose. It's going to share in that purpose until that plasma is cut off. Now it has free will. Now it's no longer connected to its source, it no longer connected to its source. It is fallen. It is rebellious. It, it has free will now, basically. Anyways, that's a whole nother video. Uh, the only place that we have left. And he says, where is it? Now, check this out. Zion, he's saying, is the last human city. And he says, deep underground, near the Earth's core, where it's still warm. Well, wait a minute. There's a city near the Earth's core. How could that be possible? Okay, in the movie world, how could that even be possible? If if the core of the earth, their earth, whatever earth they live on, on their world, uh, is like as hot as the surface of the sun as mainstream academics teaches us. Just saying. So she's, she's like, you know what I'm going to say, right? And he's like, I'm not the one. Now, she didn't say that. He said that. <laughs> He said that, not her, right? And uh, she's like, don't worry about it. As soon as you step out of that door, you'll start feeling better. You'll remember that you don't believe in all of this fate nonsense, that you're in control of your own life, right? Now, let me rewind that just a bit, okay? Pretend this is you. 
Pretend this is a movie that you're watching that's super deep and just speaking to your heart about so many of life's issues and truths, right? We go to the movies, we learn something, or we think we do, and then she says, don't worry about it. As soon as you step out, of, as soon as you leave the movie theater, right, you'll start feeling better. You'll remember you don't believe in all this fantasy and and myths and legends and whatever. You're in control of your own life. You you you're back in the matrix out there. People forget these these things when they when they leave the movie theaters or when they put down a book. You read a book, boom, you're in there. It's changing your life, everything. You put down the book and all of a sudden you're distracted by the girl in the red dress. System failure. And this is the end of the movie. He says, I came here to tell you how it's going to begin. I didn't come to tell you how it's going to end, right? Neo says, I came to tell you how it's going to begin. This is also what I have to say to all of you. When I talk about the plasma apocalypse, I am not here to tell you how it's going to end, okay? I talk about it. You'll hear pieces of the ending, but it, it doesn't end. It begins. That's the hope. Okay, we look and we see life. We don't see death. We see life everywhere, just like Neo. So when I talk about the apocalypse, that's why I can do it with a smile on my face, because it's not the end. It's not death. It's not, I'm not going to talk to you about how everything ends. I'm going to tell you how everything begins, because it's one and the same thing. It's all life. It's all connected. So every time he says, as you wish, he means, I love you. And I also like this because they equate wishing with love. I feel and I wish that more people these days would make more wishes, that would people would dive back into having a childlike mindset to see the world with greater, bigger eyes like a child would. And I feel like we would be a little happier if we did that. Hey, wait a minute. Wait, J Dreamers, what is this? Is this a trick? Are you trying to trick me? <laughs> is this a kissing YouTube video? Is this going to get mushy? Are you going to leave out all the action and all the good stuff? No, we're totally not. But you need to keep this in mind. Without the love, without the kissing book part, okay, the crushes and, and the dying to see each other and stuff, all of that action would be pointless. You might as well play a video game because there's no love in it. You know what I mean? You have to have that love story. Is this a kissing book? <laughs> now, that's that's the other thing too. Oh, might as well. Um, kids these days are, um, they're kind of grown up with video games. I mean, I grew up with video games as well, right? But it's not just video games, but the the, the YouTube videos, television, commercials, everything is just cotton candy and Red Bull. That's all it is to me. I don't, I don't get any vitamins from those things. You know what I mean? That's why I like to do this series because I, like I like to pull out all of the things that I feel are nourishing to me in the movies. And then instead of just being amused by them, which is to not think and just zonk out for a while, I like to consider the deeper implications of what they mean to me in my life. And then I like to share that with all of you. In my personal opinion, when I see the princess locked in a tower or locked in a castle, to me, that represents the blue beam shooting up at the end of time during the apocalypse, okay? The blue beam is Sophia, the blue beam is the light of the world, and it gets locked in a way in a castle or a tower, which is Rupus Negra, the black mountain or the magnetic mountain, right? She's surrounded by mist. She's surrounded by fog. Why would they have her be surrounded by mist and fog, except for to just add to the ambiance, you know what I mean? Let me get another one of those. You guys have popcorn? <laughs> anyway, um, I believe that the reason is uh, whenever the princess makes her appearance at, at the uh, Rupus Negra, the black mountain in the middle of the world, that's whenever the world depressurizes. And when the world depressurizes and the atmosphere depressurizes, our closed system in on the earth will turn into temporarily an open system, right? And when that happens, all of the pressure that is in our atmosphere leaks out and the atmosphere expands, creating instant fog, mist, and sometimes snow. So we have the appearance of the princess mixed with the fog itself. And then he says, and you, friendless, brainless, helpless, hopeless, do you want me to send you back where you were? Unemployed in Greenland? 
I'm doing it all the way. Uh, so, he, he, same thing. He just threatens to fire this dude, right? Uh, the unemployed giant. Which, by the way, isn't that super interesting that they made Andre the Giant from Greenland? Which is rumored to be the place where actual giants come from and or live. These two start rhyming. They start, they start playing. They start having fun. They're making the best of a bad situation. They're like, our job sucks. Let's have a good time. Let's make the most of it. And that is one of the reasons why I like Fezig and Inigo, right? They have good hearts deep inside, right? They're just, they don't know what to do. They don't know how to escape their bad situation. They're stuck in a loop which is this slave job that they have because they need money to buy food and pay bills, etc. right? So they're making the best of it. So he says, probably he means no harm. <laughs> and Fezig comes right back. He's very, very short on charm. Going back as far as we can remember, we start to forget. We started to forget history. History itself as the truth of our past breaks off and fragments over time and becomes a huge telephone game, right? So one of the ways and tools that we have implemented in order to help us to remember our way back home and to remember, um, you know, our older stories and lessons and stuff is through rhyming. That's one of the main ways that we can remember important information is to lock it in in a rhyme scheme, which helps us because it gives a little tool in the brain. It helps us to remember things easier. So some of the most important lessons were taught through song and often rhyme. Uh, so he, that's why he says inconceivable. Now check this out. This dude's literally sitting there looking at the boat right behind him asks his boss, are you sure no one's following us? Because you said no one's following us and then nobody could. He's like, it would be inconceivable, which means in his mind, there's not a boat back there, even though this dude right here clearly is looking at one, right? So he says, it would be absolutely, totally, in all other ways, inconceivable, right? He's just like, no, no, there's no way, no possible way. Now imagine this is the mainstream world and you try to talk to them about some fringe topics, right? That are a little bit outside of the norm. This is the normal response that we get from the rest of the world. The rest of the world's like, inconceivable. I don't see that happening, <laughs> right? But clearly there was somebody right behind them. So while they're looking, the princess jumps off the boat into the water. Vizzini, <laughs> Vizzini says, do you know what that sound is, Highness? Those are the shrieking eels. They always grow louder when they're about to feed on human flesh. Right? And then the eels are all shrieking around them. I can't do the eel sound. That just, that's not what they sound like. They don't sound like they're breathing on her. But anyways... Okay, so now the shrieking eels. Let's talk about that. Why is this in the movie? Did you know that in the book... They don't have shrieking eels. They totally adapted that only for the movie. Interesting. In the book, it's sharks. In the movie, it's shrieking eels. Now, is there such thing as sharks? Yes. Is there such thing as shrieking eels? I'm not too sure. I never heard about it, right? So this is actually really interesting. I'm going to do a topic video tomorrow about... Are you ready for this? I'm going to give you guys a little preview because I'm really excited about this, this video we're doing tomorrow, but it's going to be about Siren Head, the Sirens, and Banshees. Now the Shrieking Eels fall right into that category, so tomorrow I'm probably going to reference the Shrieking Eels as well. But I'll give you a hint. They represent electromagnetic activity in the form of plasma streaking by. And they make that sound. All right, so the Cliffs of Insanity. Ah, ha, 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 ha. <laughs> All right, so check this out. He looks up at the Cliffs of Insanity. This is a part of their path. And because they're showing it to you, they're also saying this might be a part of your path. So it's up to you to figure out what the Cliffs of Insanity are to you. To me, this represents climbing the plasma volcano, essentially. That's, that's, what, it, that's what it is to me. Um, Maui had to do it. Moana had to do it and <laughs> like they basically climbing the cliffs of insanity. All right, let's move on. So they're going up there and check this out. They're not doing his worker bees are not doing a good job again. And he's like, he's gaining on us. And he's like, well, I'm carrying only three people and he's got only himself or whatever. <laughs> right. He's like, dude, I'm trying my hardest. I'm literally carrying you. 
right, boss? You're doing zero work and you're yelling at me carrying you and other people for you. And you're yelling at me, right? And he says, I do not accept excuses. I'm just going to have to find myself a new giant. That's all. And he's like, don't say that, Vicini. So he threatens his job again, right? Imagine that. Inigo and Fezig have not claimed their power. They have not claimed and recognized their value. They have value. Each one of us brings something of value to the table of the world. I don't care who you are. Every single person out there has some area that is your area of expertise, something you're good at, something of value you could offer to other people so that you don't have to go be a slave to somebody else. But these two have not realized their value quite yet. They have to go through some trials and some tribulations in order to do that. So they look over the edge. He didn't fall? Inconceivable. Now, check this out. I love this. He calls him out again. See, this is how you can tell that these two are like truth seekers starting to break free of their conditioning, their mental conditioning, because they're starting to question their bosses and they're starting to sort of uh, speak out and speak up. And I like that about them. So he says, you keep using that word. I do not think it means what you think it means, right? So he calls him out and says, hey, man, you're turning a word into something else. That's not what that word means. This is also something that the corporate world has done. We've become so politically correct. We've changed literal words from meaning one thing into meaning almost the opposite of whatever it means. But basically, in the corporation of various governments around the world, their word is law. Their word is the dictionary. Their word is whatever they say that it is. And that's how they work. All right. Fezzi comes up and he says, You be careful. People in masks cannot be trusted. Think about that. I'm going to say it in my regular voice. You be careful. People in masks cannot be trusted. Now, that's the movie. I didn't say that. That's the movie said that. I don't, like, I don't know if you want to apply that to something else that's you know more modern. That's up to you. But I'm just saying, you don't see me on YouTube with the mask on my face. So, boom, and he knocks him out, right? So, he puts him to sleep. Rupus Negra, the man in black, however you want to look at him, puts to sleep his first victim. Does not kill him, but just instead has him take a little nap. He knocks him out. Now, he says, please understand, I hold you in the highest respect. This kid who is listening to this story is learning so much right now because... These people are basically fighting one another, their opponents playing in some sp sport, which is fencing, right? And then he doesn't do some dance, some celebration dance, you know, rubbing it in his face after he knocks him out. He doesn't spit on him. He doesn't talk trash to him. He says, please understand, I hold you in the highest regard. That is the way it's supposed to be. He's like, Iocane powder comes from Australia. And in Australia is entirely peopled with criminals. Before that... Remember how I said they were shipping them to the United States? There was like a hundred thousand, somewhere around there, criminals shipped to the United States. So before you start going off and judging Australia in the back of your mind, because somebody told you when you were a kid that it was populated by criminals a long time ago, I'd like you to rethink that and apply that to the US of A. So first we have the, uh, the little pockets of gas that shoot up. Now, if we have worldwide earthquakes, it's going to release a whole bunch of gas, especially methane, up from the middle of the earth. And it's probably going to leak out for quite some time. Now, keep in mind, our world will be electromagnetically uh, charged. Okay, There will be an influx of electricity in our world, which also means that wherever you have these pockets of gas leaking up, pss, 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 it can catch fire and make this in real life, actually. So they keep going. She falls right into the sand. Like I said, liquefaction, right? It creates quicksand. They call it lightning sand in the movie, but it's literally just quicksand. It's where the water rose to the surface and they can sink down in it quite easily. And she says, Wesley, what about the R.O.U.S.'s? Rodents of unusual size? I don't think they exist. Boom! Gets hit with one, right? See, this is another thing. No matter who we are, no, and Wesley was smarter than Vizzini. He was um, more skilled than Inigo, and he took down a giant, Fezzik, right? But even then, he allowed his 
mind to be limited, which led him to danger, right? He said, I don't think they exist. The moment that he admits that he stopped believing that something was possible, boom, it jumps right out and in his face and attacks him. So check this out. Here's another tree portal. This is really interesting. So the entrance into the underworld or the inner earth in this movie is through a tree. Imagine that, right? And he says, are you coming down to the pit? They literally call it a pit. And my theory is that underneath where it is the tree of life or the trunk to the tree of life right now, which is Mount Maru, the plasma volcano. If you were to jump into that or go into that, it would go down for a very, very, very long ways. And that is the bottomless pit as described in the book of Revelation. And uh, they start trying to scare everybody. All your worst nightmares are about to come true. Now, here's the thing. That's actually true. P plasma apocalypse. Okay, putting on the glasses of the plasma apocalypse, literally people's nightmares are about to come true. Everybody's dreaming right now. They're just, they're not awake. They're not living. They're not anything. They need to be shocked out of it. And boy, what a shocker they probably in for. Boom. You killed my father. Prepare to die. And then boom, you see, he finally meets him. He's ready to go. He's ready to do it. And then what does the royalty do, right? When they're confronted. Bye. I'm out. I'm out of here. No, 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 no. I have other people do the work for me. I don't fight people, right? Like if you have a problem, you need to submit a, a request. You need to put in a suggest, put it in the suggestion box or something. Don't come talk to me, right? Don't tell me that I'm doing it wrong. These are the leaders of the world. So he finally, he finally gets them cornered. Boom. Knocks his sword away from him. Offer me everything I ask for. Anything. I want my father back, you son of a bitch. Get some. Woo! Yes, excellent, right? So, that's the thing. I'm not going to talk about that for just a second because I, I have to figure out where I was going to go with that. But basically, good for you, Inigo. Good for you, Inigo. Super proud of you. You finally did it. Now, check this out. I took a picture of Inigo here because of these knights in the background. You see that? They have these pictures like they have knights at the castle and you would expect the castle to have knights, right? Well, where are they? They're being attacked by the Dread Pirate Roberts. There's 30 dudes outside that like that you want your best warriors. Where are your knights in shining armor? Well, guess what? Knights in shining armor were not used to fight in battles primarily to begin with. <laughs> They were dressed like that to fight monsters. They were dressed like that to survive uh, areas of powerful uh, electrical current so that they didn't get shocked. And some of these monsters might have actually had the ability to shock as a defense mechanism. So that's where the knights are. They're all fighting the phanazoids, essentially. That's why they don't see them in this movie. They don't make that appearance. Uh, because that's they're doing their job, which is to fight monsters. They don't fight people, okay? A person could probably more easily take down a, another person if they're wearing knight's armor, is, is my guess, because it's so bulky and it's, it's hard to move in it and stuff like that. The only person the man in black killed, technically, so far, is Vizzini. But it's really Vizzini that killed Vizzini, if you think about it, right? That was his choice. He didn't have to drink the wine. He could have gave up, could have gave the princess away or whatever. That was him that did that. The man in black has the opportunity to kill Humperdinck. Humperdinck, Humperdinck, Humperdinck. <laughs> it's like Candyman. <laughs> um, <laughs> anyway, um, he has the opportunity to kill Humperdinck. Does he? No, of course not. He's not a killer. He's got the spirit of the blue beam, not the red beam. He doesn't want anybody to die. He's not here to take away. He's here to add to. He's here to give to the world, not take away from it, right? So he's, he wants him to learn his lesson. He wants him to grow. That's what he wants for Humperdinck, okay? He wants him to learn a lesson, to change, to become different. All right, so he says uh, the grandpa finishes reading the story to him on Christmas Eve or whenever it is, and he says, now I think you ought to go to sleep, right? Think about that. He read him a bedtime story, took him away from his video games, enlightened him, expanded his mind, hopefully helped to expand his heart and his chakras and his vibes to change his perspective so that he can grow up to use this book and these lessons that he just learned as a tool for a better life. He says, now I think you should go to sleep, right? Now, this is why I do this on my channel. 
I like to talk about the fantastic because I like to read people or give people a bedtime story to wake them up. So instead of playing video games and stuff, he actually wants to hear the story again. There's something about the story that resonates with him and he likes that. And he says, as you wish. So when we first start this movie, we see Charles Darwin and he's out on his famous adventure, uh, you know, to the Galapagos. He's going to document all of the different strange animals and even some extinct ones. So it starts off, he says, this morning we set sail for our next grand adventure, the Galapagos. What does that mean anyway, Galapagos? Let's, we should definitely check that out. So if we check out the meeting of Galapagos, they say it, it comes from the word tortoise. Okay, but why is the tortoise called Galapagos? So I want to know more. So let's dive into it. It comes from the root word gel. You see here, uh, the Proto-Indo-European root word gel or gel or hiel, which is where we get the word yellow, the root for yellow and gold and stuff like that. It means to shine, right? So Galapagos. So gel pa. Pag, gela pag, uh, shining pag. What's a pag? So pag is another Proto-Indo-European root word that means to fasten. You see that pag? Uh, it's also where we get the word pole, right? So pag means pole. So those of the pole are the pag on, right? Uh, it also means stake, as in uh, um, the main part of a cruciform shape. It does not mean cruciform, but it does mean the beam portion or the stake portion of the beam. So gala means shining, pag means beam, shining beam. And then os just means uh, strong. So a strong shining beam. Why were they called galapagos being a strong shining beam? Here's some other extensions to the word pag as well. In Sanskrit, you could see it's related to pasa, which is a cord or a rope, because that beam is seen as a, a spinning cord or a rope of light that goes up into the sky that people climb up into other worlds and they see giants and stuff. Um, also, it can have, by extension, the meaning to fetter or to attach to something, right? That's why it's represented by the vav or the nail to attach to the earth specifically, to fix, to make firm, to make fast, or to make solid, pagos, which means a strong uh, fixation or a strong fixing into something, right? Um, it also comes from pagina, which means column. So column and beam, etc. So galapagos literally means shining, strong beam. So why are turtles called that, right? Well, it's not just turtles. It's specific types of turtles. If we take a look here, it says that in the Galapagos that they actually have um, ex expansive areas where giant tortoises live, right? Check this out. Giant tortoises in captivity has, have been known to live longer than 200 years. And there's every reason to believe that uh, in the wild, they regularly hit the 300 year old marker. That is the Galapagos. So what my theory so far is that, um, uh, many of these creatures were not just named, um, uh, you know, based on, um, like, you know, just given a random name because it sounds nice how we give random names today. The names back then were descriptors and a descriptor of something that had a strong inward beam of light or life force or, or some creature could be humanoid, could be animal that came from the island of the strong beam of light tended to be immortal or by comparison to a shorter lifespans live a very long time. So I, that's one of my theories on why um, the island or the turtle at least was named Galapagos. And uh, here's a really weird thing too. On the Galapagos Islands, it's filled with these tortoises. So I wonder how the tortoises got there in the first place. Can tortoises swim? Tortoises cannot swim. This island, the Galapagos, where Darwin went and found all these strange and weird creatures, uh, one of them at least can't swim. And it's full of these huge, gigantic tortoises. How'd they get to the island, right? It's a mystery. Nobody knows. People have all kinds of guesses if you try to look it up and research it. But ultimately, I found zilch, nada, nothing as to why these animals are on this island and how they could have gotten there, right? So let's take a, another look real quick at the Galapagos Islands. It says Dar Darwin disembarked on the San Cristobal, uh, 1835. 
And this is the island, or this is actually a rock on the island that he landed on, okay? So this is just offshore from the main island where he landed. This is called Kicker Rock. Look at that. Does that not look exactly, doesn't that look exactly like a foot walking on the water? It looks like a shoe, like a giant petrified Titan foot or something. I don't know if it is or not. I'm just saying it's really interesting to see these types of rock anomalies, especially in areas that already have strange anomalies, like life on an island that has no business getting to that island, right? Um, here's another picture of it, which is a more beautiful version. I like this one myself. Um, and I've actually seen these in other places in the world. Here's another one. It's like a giant foot rock, a giant petrified foot just stuck in the ocean. This one right here is off of Maya Bay, I believe. There's various examples of them around the world. Now, if you take a look at the island that um, that he landed on, right, you, you see that there are volcanoes. Uh, vo volcanoes. It's a, it's a very volcanic area, the Galapagos, right? This one is the largest or the, the one of the largest craters, right? Um, calderas, I should say, of, of any volcano anywhere in the world. I believe some say it's second, maybe third as being th the largest one, right? So if this is a volcano that allegedly goes down into the inner recesses or caverns of the earth, this is one of the biggest ones. Isn't that interesting? And now look at it. It looks like it's plugged up, right? It kind of looks like it's just filled up, plugged up, and it looks unnatural. That to me, and I'm just, this is my perspective, but to me, I sense that that shouldn't be filled. I feel like that should be open so that things can come and go from it. I'll get I'll get to where I'm going here in just a second. Second largest crater in the world, according to this. But there are many creatures in the Galapagos that cannot swim. They have no earthly business being stuck on this island all by themselves. And we can't uh, collectively, as as mains, the mainstream populace, we can't say that we brought them there because if you look up you know, when this island was even discovered by the first humans, it was only around 500 years ago or less. So it really wants to point out that there's a huge, steep volcanic tower on this island. Look at that. No volcano in on earth looks like that that I have seen so far. This one is a very steep, tall volcano, which is exactly how Rupus Nigra is described in the legends. While Darwin was there, it's alleged that he had discovered different species of animals that are now extinct, which is why he's featured in this movie, right? His discoveries included four different species of giant ground sloths. You, you've seen what a sloth looks like, right? Okay, they're not too intimidating, but if you ever see a picture of a giant ground sloth, I'll show you in a minute. Yeah, nah, they look monstrous. Some of the largest land mammals ever to have lived, actually. He also discovered a gomphother, whatever that is, and the remains of an extinct horse. Let's check some of these out. This is a rendition of what the giant sloth might look like. You know what this kind of reminded me of when we were uh, doing another breakdown about uh, phantozoids and how we learned that in France, they had an infestation of a monster that looked just like that. And it was so bad that the king, Louis XV, I believe it was, um, sent everyone out on a literal monster hunt to find a creature that looks very much like this one in the drawings. So this is a giant ground sloth. In almost every depiction, whenever they put up these uh, fossils, <laughs> bones, I, I think they're casts. I think, I don't, I, if they're brown like that, I don't think they're real, basically. Um, but you see them in museums all over the place. They always have them standing up. Like, like they're supposed to be climbing, you know, leaning up against some tree. This one is actually one, a rarer one that I found where it's down, uh, standing up on its, on its four legs and back legs. Right. So nobody knows what this actually looked like with the skin and the muscle, muscle, uh, and the bone and everything all together, what color it was, if it had fur or not, they have guesses at best. Right. I believe in creatures called phantozoids, which are otherworldly creatures that come up from the hollow portions of our world or down and float down from the opening in the sky during the apocalypse, right? I call them phantozoids. So it's very likely to me that we could have phantozoid bones scattered about or the bones of giants or the bones of other fantastic creatures that we no longer believe in because we haven't seen them for quite some time. Here is a picture of an actual rendition of this strange looking elephant creature that allegedly was discovered by Darwin. It's called the Gomphotherium or something. 
Look at this thing. I already thought elephants were phantozoid relatives. This thing has a face that opens up. <laughs> like, look at that. Isn't that insane looking? Look, I got another one, another artist rendition of it. This is a total alien creature, right? And you can see there is a close relationship. If this picture has any merit to, to, to reality, right? Then you could see it looks like it might, you know, our modern day rhinoceroses and elephants and, and hippos and stuff might have a relationship there, right? And look how its face kind of splits open. Exactly how we talk about in some of these phantozoid creatures that are uh, depicted quite often in the movies, especially horror movies. Because I've been chosen to be the friend at the end. <laughs> He's the friend at the end. So these, these are going to be our friends at the end. They're also going to be our friends at the beginning, as you'll see at the end of the movie. That's the exa exact same thing. Um, these are little plasma uh, torus fields, essentially. Um, and they're going to be our friends. I'll get more into that in just a minute. So she says, or he says, Op, I love you. So the boy's name is uh, Ed, which means to eat. That's where we get our word eat from, actually. Or we, we used to say et, right? And now we say et, et, etc. He says, Op, I love you. His sister's name is Op. What does Op mean? Well, we look it up and it comes from Ops, the I. The Proto-Indo-European root word is oku, and it means to see. So she is an eye and he is a mouth or an eater, right? Both plasma apocalypse symbolism of the hole that opens up during the depressurization in our sky when the sky blows out above the North Pole and it sucks everything up eating it. Also, it goes dark. So the only thing that is seen is this eye of God, this red eye of God up there in the sky. And she happens to be red too. She says, but um, they basically... Um, they're having some problems and he's like, yeah, we've had a lot of bad moments. And she's, yeah, she says, think of those sweet, sweet, occasional ups instead of those downs. Right. And this, I feel like this is really good advice. I know it's not the most important part of the movie, but maybe it is. She's talking to us and she's saying, instead of focusing on all the bad that comes, right? All the lies, all the deception in our world and what happens as the world degrades from paradise and from the golden age. Look, think about the good times. Think about the ups. Why? Because that's what we have to look forward to. If it happened in the past, it's bound to happen in the future. And besides, you need to stop living in the past, she says. And that's what we need to do. We need to look to the future, right? Now, we can have a better idea and more hope for the future if we better understand the past, which is why we're going over this. Uh, this little kid, Flummel, comes up to her and says, I just wanted to say I like that spin move you do. And she goes, oh, thanks. I call it the op pop. So the eye pop, a spin move. The eye pops is what she calls it, right? Why is that? That's because uh, there's a circle in the sky and it's the sky literally popping open. So her little move is called the op pop or to pop the eye basically, right? To pop open the sky. And then this dude's the guy who's kind of the leader of the flummels. They made a little flummel flower of him or something. And he says, uh, and as always, I and the grand flower flummel will lead us right to the top of the mountain to celebrate. Why? Why are they going to the top of the mountain? That's like, you know what I mean? Why is that even a part of this? That doesn't need to be done at all. They don't even go to the top of the mountain in this movie whatsoever. They go inside of the mountain. So it's interesting that they're basically indicating to us, symbolically speaking or not, that uh, during the apocalypse, some may want to go to the top of a certain mountain, right? Being that one is representative of Mount Maru. And that is the forbidden, don't go out there. It's way too dangerous zone right now. Right now, uh, it's been put into our head, just like in the Truman Show, when they're showing him since birth, why it's dangerous for him to leave the little harbor island that he lived on. They do that to us and they tell us why it's dangerous to go to Antarctica or to the North Pole. And basically trying to persuade you to keep from going way before you even come up with the idea to go. Let's take a look at the symbolism just in the flower that they zoom in on itself, right? As the flower starts to open up, you can see it's got the little cross section there in the middle, slightly broken, slightly twisted. 
That's because there is the, the hole in the sky that opens up and the plasma swirls in, right? One cycle, it swirls one way. The next cycle, it swirls the other way. It reverses as does the jet stream and uh, likely the path of the sun going, changing direction and rising in the west and setting in the east, etc. right? So this is basically the eye of God that you're looking up into symbolically in the movie. It opens up and all this plasma golden light or gel, if, if we remember the Proto-Indo-European root word, gel, right? Uh, all this gel light uh, streams out of this flower. And, and inside of the flower, look at that pure white light. If that represents the sky opening up and then the pinkish purpley kind of plasma around it, right? The other side of it is showing you that that would be space. Space would not be black. Space would be bright and luminous and exactly what you would expect of the heavens above, right? All right, so she goes down closer to the flower. The, the, the plasma, basically, is what it is from the flower, starts to suck her in and she gets sucked into this flower. All right, now what happens when they get sucked in past this flower? Symbolically, if they are in space. I've talked about this theory many times. Uh, there are what I call or referred to as plasma conduits out there in the heavens, out there in the fractal verse, out there in the Elysian fields, right? And I also have pondered whether or not that actually looks like the inside of a brain with synapses and electrical conduits that go from neuron to neuron. And we live as the who's, as little tiny specks inside of that mind of God, right? So let's see if uh, we can pick up on any, any of that symbolism as they go through this portal, right? At first, we do see some sort of conduits, some string looking stuff in the background there. Okay, it could be perceived as such. And then they do these close-ups where you can just see through the circle, right? That's, that's like you glimpsing into space from the top of our world, from the opening in the sky, right? Um, and then you can see what's beyond. Plasma conduits, right? That connect realm to realm. If this is true, that means that no planet is separate from any other planet, that they all those so-called uh, so planets out there are really hubs. They're hubs of information that are connected to one another through these uh, conduits, through, through these uh, synapses and stuff like that. So they show you another one that, you know, it could be, I don't know, but then all of a sudden... They go through this other portal in this area and boom, they're inside of some other dimension, right? Look closely at what's in this particular area. Those look exactly like neurons or something microscopic, right? Doesn't it? That's pretty much inside of something, most likely the brain or spinal cord is my guess. Uh, but they're definitely inside of that. This is showing you that they're tiny. Now, I also want to point out that your blood cells and, and other parts are also toroidal in shape. They're like palates, right? And this is exactly like them flowing through the bloodstream or whatever, uh, going to wherever they need to go. This is also symbolic of what happens if you were to get sucked up and eaten by Kronos in, during the plasma apocalypse. If you were to survive, you would probably see something very similar to this until you got to your destination or a hub like this one that's shown to you where it opens up, it has its own little apocalyptic event and you fly into it. Uh, this one's showing you more of the microscopic fractal verse above, basically. And then there is shot outwards. Now look behind them. You can see that there's this sort of grail shape, right? This is a toroidal field around the torus. And then they get shot out of another flower, right? These are the flowers of life. It's the tree of life, etc. Moving forward, they see a donut shop and they're like, oh my God, we have to rescue all the flummels, right? They hit the window, the smack, they, and then they do this, right? They, are, they got the arms up. This is called the squatter man symbol, right? Uh, if you see ancient pictograms or drawings in the rock and stuff, usually a stick figure has its arms up into the air and it's sort of squatting out with its legs separated like they are on the window right there. Now... Let's take a look. This is what it looks like whenever um, you have a, a beam of plasma. It creates a toroidal field around it. You see in the middle there, 
See how on the right, we've got these two circles. These represent the flummels, right? And that's where they live, where the beam is on either side of it. It's on either side because it creates this sort of vortex of energy that goes around it like that. But when looked from a linear perspective, the, the most of that is seen in little circles off to the side. So oftentimes this stick figure or this um, stick god or goddess in the sky is seen as... This is interpreted in so many different ways. Those can be eyeballs. This could be the face of an owl. This this could be somebody with two balls under their armpits, um, uh, which there's actually legends that say that, that the earth was created out of the armpits of a titan. Um, I think that's a Norse legend. Anyways, this is many different things. We're going we're gonna to actually touch on this some more in a bit, but this is like a three-dimensional rendering of it. So if you were to be able to look at it from a different perspective... Ah, now you get a little bit more information, right? Instead of like this, you can see it from this way and you can see that it's donut shaped right there in the middle with the bell on either side. All right. So the dog is like, oh, they're just donuts. Don't worry about it. And then he's, he's about to take a bite and they're like, oh my God, he's going to eat one of us. He's going to eat a flummel. This is appropriate symbolically speaking, because you've got the, the being or the dog, the God backwards, right? Um, I'm going to come back to that word. But the white dog or god about to eat one of the flummels, which represents the food of the gods or the golden apples, etc., right? Um, or plasma, right? Electromagnetic energy in order for him to live longer because that's what they usually did. It increased your vitality. This is the type of thing that you would eat. Um, people didn't need to eat physical food or whatnot. They, they had the manna from heaven that would rain down onto them. So it literally squirts out jelly and rains down onto the flummels themselves. And they're freaking out because they think it's blood. That's appropriate because this has been described as blood. Okay. Symbolically, if we're talking about these creatures representing um, cosmic plasma discharges, right? What happens when you have that beam shoot up violently from the earth? Boom. One, it's going to, everywhere it shoots out, it's going to make a boom. It's going to make a huge loud sound, right? After it does that, it's going to uh, react with the atmosphere and it's going to shoot out uh, energetic raindrops. I don't know how to describe it, right? I haven't really come up with a unique word for that, but it's mana. It's ambrosia. It is this viscous, gooey, uh, oozing, slimy sort of liquid, or you could say jelly, right? Symbolically, it's basically the jelly of the gods, you could say, right? Um, and it's also seen as being the blood of this savior type who who is hung upon a tree in order to stop the apocalypse. So we see this this stick figure person appear. They put their hands up into the sky, sort of fighting off the dragon tentacles of red plasma from above. And it is seen as sacrificing itself so that the apocalypse would stop and that we could we could live. And you know, not all of humanity would be wiped out. And then all these drops that come down off of that creature are seen as its sweat. It's seen as its tears, and it's also seen as its blood. And then she takes a, a, a taste, and she goes, I have to admit, we're pretty delicious. So this is the movie basically saying, like, these are delicious if you were to eat a flummel. Not if you were to eat a furry little creature like that, but if you were to eat the plasma symbol... Symbolically, it's plasma, and it would taste good, basically, is what they're saying. All right. Um, so remember, Gel means to shine. This is jelly. It's the exact same thing. Basically, it means like a, a little shiny thing or a glimmering thing. Oftentimes things that shine or glimmer or uh, sparkle or things like that, they, they, are, they have this root word, gel, which is gel, which is to shine. Look at some of these other words that are related to it. How about chlorine? 21 Pilots fans, sipping on straight chlorine, right? Glass, Gild, gloss, gloat, chloris, gall, chlorophyll, chloroform, all these different pronunciations. Glow, to glow, gold, obviously. Lots of different ones. All right, so they go into this museum where there's this cardboard sign that says, become a member before it's too late. And then there's these uh, strip of stickers, these little round stickers, and she slaps one on his head and it says member on it. Right there. She puts it right here. Now the sign says, become a member before it's too late. And this is clearly a, refer a reference to the apocalypse, right? Not saying that there's merit to the official story of how the dinosaurs died or whatever, but I am saying they are telling you to get your dot before it's too late. 
that represents your pineal gland. That represents um, waking up, essentially, before it's too late. That's what the movie's trying to tell us. And then we get to the Hall of Death. <laughs> like, all these museums, it's, they're creepy, man. But anyways, um, we've got our modern dinosaurs, which to me are phantozoids, basically. I don't know if the bones were put together in the right order or not, but I definitely believe monsters roamed about the world until they were hunted down to extinction, and one day they'll all return where I've just discovered a previously unknown island. Mm, okay, I've got some I got some deals with that one, okay? I don't like it whenever academics teach us stuff that's that's not true, okay? So I don't like when movies do that. I don't like when anything does that. I'm a truth seeker, so I, the, the truth makes me happy. So who really discovered the Galapagos Islands? Fray Tomas de Berlanga. The world first heard about the Galapagos more than 470 years ago. The Dominican friar, Fray Tomas de Berlinga, Bishop of Panama, was the official discoverer arriving on March 10th, 1535, well before Charles Darwin ever did. But let's get a little deeper into it because that it doesn't stop there. It says here that the islands were first mapped by a Flemish cartographer called Abraham Ortelius in 1570, and the map was called Theatrum Orbis Terrarium. Terrarium. Let me show you the map. Let's take a look at this map. Now, let's first, let's find the Galapagos. Boom. Pretty simple. Easy. There's the Galapagos. There's Mexico, right? Here's South America, Peru. There's the little Galapagos Islands right there. Okay. But what else do we have on this map by this famed cartographer, right? Who I, I assume is an expert in cartography and doesn't just make up bull crap and put it on his maps for the king and the queen to send out their armadas, etc. There is a monster on this map, a sea monster. And that's not the only one. Over here in his map, he and we, we we've shown you many maps like this where they put real sea monsters, okay? Not whales, and they were just stupid back then, and they they didn't know what a whale was. So in their imagination, they thought it had two spouts and frog legs, and you know, no, 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 I'm not going with that, okay? I feel like people were smarter the further back in time we go, right? Maybe they didn't have the same technology that we do now up to a certain point, in which case it was probably better technology if you go back far enough. Um, but anyways, they put monsters onto these maps, right? They're not allowed to do that if the monsters don't exist. Okay. Imagine that in modern days, right? Doing that to that, that would not be acceptable. Look, let's check out some other stuff on this map that he has here. Uh, they've got Tartaria listed on the map over here. They've also got, uh, California is pretty much split away from the rest of the United States with huge rivers flowing throughout. This is an official map. And at the top, let's zoom out. At the top, there is what is known as Terra Incognita, or unknown land. This is the North Pole lands. You see how there's four lands there just divided by these rivers, right? That is the land that we're talking about at the North Pole. So there is a reference here going on. We're going to find some more references too, but it doesn't stop there. The Galapagos weren't even discovered by that guy. The Galapagos, it said, was discovered by the Incas, right? By a guy named, appropriately, Tupac. Interesting, right? The two beams. Um, not that it means that exactly. But anyways, uh, the, the Incas were there over 500 years ago, allegedly between 1471 and 1493. So it's I, I don't like how history goes. I don't like how we you know, certain classes and races of humans. I don't like how you guys are handling history. I don't like how you're putting your stamp on it. I don't like how you're stretching it to make it sound like you're the discoverer or you deserve some sort of notoriety or fame or whatnot. I don't like that. I don't like it whenever uh, the schools follow suit. So let's recap. George Washington did not have wooden teeth. Columbus did not discover America. Okay, maybe he discovered it for himself, but he certainly, certainly, there's many people who came here way before Columbus's ass. Excuse me, but I hate the Columbus story. He also did not prove that the earth is uh, a different shape. Okay, he didn't prove any kind of shape to the earth whatsoever. He went from like this continent, this continent to this continent from here to here. Okay, 
Uh, so George Washington did not have wooden teeth. Columbus did not discover America. As you can see, Magellan did not circumnavigate the world. I'm just telling you the truth, okay? That did not happen. Uh, he died way before he could even complete his little journey around, okay? Uh, he was actually murdered because the natives saw what he was really doing and decided he was a bad guy, and they killed him. So there's, there's a totally different story um, than the official ones that we're told, and those are the ones I like to talk about. So they talk about how he named this creature Flamilius Hidella. Now, I'm going to tell you what that translates to. That's a sort of a made-up Latin name for the flummels, their, their technical name. But flummel equates to flame. It is the exact same root word as llama, okay? Llama comes from flama, which means flame or fire or the part of fire that you can see. Um, and then hidelia means hidden. So this shape and this, by extension, this creature means hidden flame, hidden plasma, hidden light, etc. by extension, right? And then the dog is like, and he used them to travel through time. Exactly like if you're a Fortnite fan, like I am, um, they've got many instances of uh, flowers or trees that act as portals or, uh, or gateways to other worlds and other dimensions. This is an example in Fortnite where they had this flower at the center of the Fortnite map, which represents the North Pole. Often. It usually does, right? But they got this flower in the middle of the Fortnite map, right where what's known as the zero point, which is this little circle in the sky right there. The zero point uh, has a flower that comes out of it. Also, Pan's Labyrinth has a portal tree that opens up. Also in, what do you call this movie? The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe part three or something like that, right? They had this portal tree that opens up just like in Sleepy Hollow where they had the portal tree that leads you to another world just like in Alice in Wonderland where they had the portal tree or just like in, the list goes on and on and on, right? The Princess Bride, etc. Anyway, to answer all of your problems, uh, the answer to all of your problems is right through here, the dog says, and then they show you the flower. They're talking to us often in the movies. They're saying the answer to all of our problems is this flower or what that flower represents is a clean slate to our world. It is called the apocalypse. Also, that's the portal if you'd like to leave. You don't like this place? Guess what? You're free to go. All you have to do is figure out how, and I'm here to help you out. So he says, so come on. The movie is actually urging you on. Come on, go. Like, let's go to this flower. Let's find the flower of life, the tree of life, etc. So they jump into the flower and they go back through the plasma conduits. Also, symbolically in the movies, sometimes it's portrayed as like water slides, right? Because you sort of slide through it and stuff. Um, shoots and ladders and stuff like that, right? So they get back to that huge Taurus field. And he says, welcome to the time terminal. And then that's the time terminal right there. We have that here in our world. I think probably many worlds have this as well. And it's right at the middle. I, put, I went ahead and I added this to it. That's not in the movie or anything. So I wanted to show you the Taurus shape and how it creates the Taurus field around it, right? Or the field that is around that Taurus field. So that, that Taurus donut shape is in the middle. And what that does is it, is it acts as... Um, it acts as like a shield for the plasma because it's, it's magnetic in nature, basically. So this, this can move the plasma. This can change the shape of the plasma. So the plasma shrinks right there where that little Z pinch is. They call that a Z, a Z pinch, right? So that's where it's being pinched together before it shoots back out. And plasma likes to shoot right through these torus fields at high speeds. Then they go to a map. This map blew my freaking ever-loving mind. I had to pause the movie. I had to pace around and think about some stuff when they showed me this map. I'm excited right now looking at it. Let's check this map out. I'm excited. Look at this map right in the middle. So first of all, let me acknowledge something. They have little portals, little flower portals. And on a real map of the real world, they could have made this a different world if they wanted to. And they put all these little flower portals everywhere in specific locations, right? So you've got one in like uh, the Galapagos area over here. Whoosh, there's the Galapagos. You got one in the Hawaii area over here. Whoosh, or maybe it's over here somewhere. Um, you got a big one right there. There's a few areas where there's really huge ones. And then right in the middle of the map is the, the tourist field itself right there in the middle of the map. 
So symbolically at the middle of our world. I know that's not the middle of the world right there, but where it should be, there is one of those portal flowers. It's the middle of the world should be right here or the top of the world, the North Pole land that we've already looked at, right? So I superimposed a real map on top of it. Uh, it looked the exact same. Just had a little bunch of flowers. Uh, there you can see like the Holy Grail symbolism. That's what that's the cup of Christ or the cup of light really is what it is. And here is an example of how we create this or how we recreate this uh, anomaly or this effect so that we can control and manipulate plasma. This is a machine that has been created to try to... Um, to institute fusion, to fuse elements together, right? Because this, because plasma has the ability to do that. It has the ability to pull elements apart, right? To, to create looser bonds. And then it has the ability to pull elements together. But that's a, that's a different video. Leads to a different time flower somewhere in history. So each one of these marked areas on this fictitious cartoon is allegedly a portal or has a portal, which may be areas where volcanoes are. I haven't double checked all these little spots on here, but I believe that they, they should, if they correlate to reality, that each one of these should have a corresponding cave system, a cavernous opening or, uh, some sort of volcano or something. So I'll have to double check that another time, unless one of you want to, and then share it with me. That'd be awesome. All right. So the Taurus field starts, starts spinning around. Something happened. It's out of control and it starts sucking everything up into it. So they're trying to hold on to stuff, but they're getting pulled toward this symbolic tree of life. They're getting pulled up into this vortex, uh, which is where the, the vortex happens, right? When the world depressurizes, there's a huge vortex. There's a, a giant tornado like you've never even seen and it, but it goes around the arctic circle essentially so it's very 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 big it's a hurricane it's a tornado it's 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 an indescribable it is a worldwide tempest so everything is getting sucked up that little dog that little white dog is going to get sucked up and caught into the Taurus field and be pushed into another world as a slider as a fractal verse traveler right and so it's appropriate because that's what those white beings typically did is they jump from world to world and they go about, you know, changing things on those worlds. And he meets this guy who says, I'm Ernest Shackleton, head of the Ernest Shackleton expedition. And throughout this movie, whoever this dude is continues repeating his name so much, I was forced to look it up. But it's an interesting story. Let me tell you with the official story, okay? So the official story... Uh, he, he did his little Nimrod expedition, came back, and then he did a second expedition. And on that second voyage, his ship was stuck in the water because the water started to freeze around his ship. And then it's, his stick, his ship was stuck in the water, like ice all the way around his ship. His men got out. Allegedly, they were trying to dig out the ship, but the ice kept on freezing, you know, before... It, they just kept freezing right back up every time they pulled it apart. The ship got stuck there. The story goes that Ernest Shackleton and his entire crew lived. They just they just decided to live on the ship, stuck in the ice. You know, they couldn't get it out or anything. So they're like, all right, let's set up shop until spring comes around and hopefully this ice melts. So the story goes, the official story is that they lived on this ship, stuck on an iceberg out in Antarctica for like over a year. This gets, this is really interesting. That's the official story. Okay. They got pictures and stuff, right? Which is great. It's awesome. There's interesting pictures that I've seen of the ship stuck in the ice and everything. And I believe that the ship was stuck in the ice, but I also think that something else may have happened. Anyways, that's Ernest Shackleton. Uh, he ended up escaping, right? Him and his crew ended up escaping, not dying out, uh, stranded on an iceberg with like all, whatever they had on their ship. And uh, they ended up staying there. All their dogs were fine. Their dogs actually had babies and stuff, turned into sled dogs. And uh, he, he, he was able to somehow get off of that iceberg, go like 500 miles away to the closest island, get help, come back, get rescued. And here's something interesting. They just found this ship. The ship sank to the bottom of the ocean. They allegedly just found it this year. They found Ernest Shackleton's ship at the bottom of the ocean. There's pictures and videos and stuff online. Now, check this out. Here's an interesting thing. Sir Ernest Shackleton, pardon me, in his, uh, <laughs> Mr. Dufresne, if you please, in his 1919 book called South, described his belief that an incorporeal companion, that means plasma, spirit, 
um, joined him and his men during the final leg of their Antarctic journey. So he felt like there was a ghost, some sort of ghost-like presence that was there with them on this journey. Here's a picture of a ship allegedly stuck in the ice. Now check this out. One of his crewmates came back. His name's Douglas Mawson. He's an, he's an Aussie. And Douglas comes back and, and it says this about Douglas. Australian explorer Douglas Mawson, not usually known for his flights of fancy, penned a hollow earth inspired short story entitled Bathbia, Bathibia in 1908 during his time with Shackleton's Nimrod expedition. This dude wrote a book allegedly on board the ship when they're stuck on an iceberg in Antarctica, freezing to death, wrote a book that's uh, allegedly fiction about uh, a bunch of sailors that travel to the central parts of the inner hollow earth portions, right? I can't even talk. I'm so excited right now because <laughs> it's, it's, this is all making sense to me. Anyways, um, during his time with Shackleton's Nimrod expedition, a group of Antarctic expedition members climbed down to the center of an enormous volcanic cone where they encounter a humid environment abounding in plant and animal life. Here's a theory. What if every volcano or many of them with exception at one time was not full of lava? What if at one time every volcano was empty and had light, cold plasma emanating from it, from the inner earth regions, and that, that's the time when animals and people and stuff could come up and come out or go in. And maybe that could account for all of these strange uh, islands full of mammoths and crap that have no business belonging on these volcanic islands, right? Mammoths, ig giant iguanas, weird, strange creatures, huge turtles that can't swim, right? Nobody has, uh, nobody has a, a really good reason for it, except for trying to say like, oh, maybe the, maybe the ocean froze and they walked across at some point and then it totally melted and then they got stuck. Okay. Nah, maybe they came up from inside of the earth. And that's why they are all gigantic. And that's why they all look weird. And that's why they all live for so long. Whew. Anyways, so they go back to this uh, time central place or at the tourist field or whatever, and they see these strange creatures looking at them, right? I'm going to talk to you about these creatures. So this one, I forgot the name of it off the top of my head, but this is like an extinct animal. And this is an artist's rendition of it. It's got this, it's like a camel llama looking thing with like an elephant trunk, right? But if you look it up, they're not even sure it had an elephant trunk. They, like I said, they just guess at a lot of this stuff, especially when it comes to their physical outward appearance. They had a few bones, right? So check this out. Oh, here's the, here's the official name for it. Let me try to pronounce it. Uh, these things are called Macrauchenia, Macrauchenia or Macrauchenia. Macrochinia fossils were first collected on the 9th of February, 1834 at Port St. Julian in Patagonia, Argentina by Charles Darwin when the HMS Beagle was surveying the port. As a non-expert, he tentatively identified the leg bones and fra fragments of spine that he found. And he said, uh, basically, it's some large an animal I fancy a mastodon, right? So, Naga Gato, hey, welcome. So, um, they find a leg and they find a piece of spine or a couple of pieces of spine and all of a sudden, uh, they know exactly what it looks like. It looks like that, right? That's pretty much kind of what they do, right? You know, they just find broken pieces of things and they're just sticking them together. I don't know if it's to distract us from the truth of how vicious and creepy and weird these creatures really looked, right? to try to make them more, look more like docile, modern animals or something. I don't think they looked like that. I think they looked monstrous, right? I'm sure there was good ones, but I'm sure they looked not so Pixar cute, if, if I'm to describe it like that. All right, so then we also have Bernie, the Tasmanian tiger. He's portrayed as this conspiracy theorist in the movie. Lo and behold, he's right about everything that he theorizes about. And Alma is a Mer Meridian Galada. Uh, that's not what they call those, so I'm not sure why they call them a Meridian Galada. Uh, I'm not going to get into that because I don't, I don't know if that's the right 
word for that. And then, of course, we have a triceratops. So literally a dinosaur, uh, an actual dinosaur is there. So we have all of these extinct creatures. That's why the movie is called Extinct, right? And they're all in this hub. Where is this hub? If this represents real life in the real world, right, where would this be? So right now, Bernie steps up and says, now, we call these strange place, we call this strange place home. We call this strange place home. And honestly, we prefer not to roam. But now they're about to do a, a song and dance. So we know staying here feels like a crime. Now they're doing this whole song about this place where they live, right? And the entire song is all about how they choose not to leave this place. And they tell you why. They say, we know staying here feels like a crime when we could explore any place in time, right? So they stay here when they could be out exploring and venturing and stuff. What's the reason for that? They say, so you can kill time here, wherever they are, they can just kill time and chill and not worry about dying or time will kill you out there. Time will kill you out there. You can kill time in here, which what they're saying is where they are extends their life. Naga, thank you. Thank you. Where they are extends their life. And if they leave that place, time will kill them. Their life spans will start shrinking and they will die, right? That place is the North Pole. Now, listen to what Bernie says. Aliens, Bigfoot. And then, I'm not going to say this part, but I would like to just make it a little bit bigger because look what he's holding on his back, right? I'm just going to let you read that. Boom. And then he's holding this and then he flips it all the way sideways. And I'm going to tell you, he was right about everything that he talked about or theorized about in this movie. The movie portrayed him as a truth teller, right? They, they try to make it look like he's just a wacko conspiracy nut or whatever, but he literally was right about everything in the movie. We're going to come back to that because he's actually going to comment on that later in the movie. So get crushed, blown up, or fall deathly ill, or stay safe here where time stands still. If you go down into the inner recesses of the earth or up into the heavens outside of the pressurized atmosphere here on the surface level, uh, the conditions change and, and allows you to live for what feels like an eternity. And he says, not to mention he could be taken by body snatches. Body snatchers are real in my book. Okay. That's, that's not my book, but I have my own book literally. And, uh, body snatchers are real. Okay. Um, it's called being possessed, essentially, and I talk about it quite often. And then he also says, boogeymen, cyclopses, all things that are fairy tales and totally not true. But in this movie, we find out they totally are. They, they, are, they tell you, they're blunt to your face, looking right at the camera, and they say, those are real. A light switch. He comes back and there's a light switch stuck inside of him. She can actually pull his tail and turn that light on and off. How's that possible? Because he's electricity, right? He's a, he's a Taurus field. He's made of energy. So you can put that light bulb right inside of him and it turns on just like uncle Fester can put the light bulb inside of his mouth because he's electromagnetically charged or electrically charged. All right. So back to Bernie, Bernie's like, I'm going to show you a magic trick. I'm going to take one. I'm going to take two of these magical flowers, right? That transport people or teleport people, which represent real places in our world. Keep that in mind. There's more than one. He says, now, I place the object between the two time flowers and utter the magic words, and boom, look what he's done, right? He's created an electrical arc between these two time flowers that represent real places in our world. Let me make it a little smaller for you, right? In the middle, you have the snake hat, which represents the blue beam of light or life, right? The Hermes snake, etc., right? And they create an electrical arc over the center of it. This is representative of what happens at the North Pole. These, uh, these anode and cathode mountains or plasma volcanoes, when they shoot up their electricity, they form an electrical arc that goes over the North Pole Island, right? Protecting it, covering it essentially, and sort of almost trapping things inside of it or keeping things outside of it as well. And then uh, in the middle would be the blue beam of Mount Maru. Presto changeo, koala dingo, and poof. Boom. He puts it right in the middle. You can see that the electricity starts to turn blue in the middle, just like the blue beam that I make reference to quite often, right? 
and then boom, it disappears. Why? Because that's the, that's the portal. That's the place you go between this mountain, symbolically, this flower represents a mountain, which is a magnetic mountain, which I've shown people on the old maps too. They actually have them. And this is the other one on the other side of the island. They create the, the electrical arc and boom, things disappear, right? It'll be back in three, two, one, and poof, it comes back again. And he says, a magician never reveals his secrets. And then the dodo goes right into telling you exactly how it's done. The dodo is not stupid. I don't know where we got that from, but basically, <laughs> um, just because it's extinct doesn't mean it's stupid. Uh, the dodo says the merging of the time flowers causes an extremely powerful arc that disassembles the atoms of an item and then sends them into a time loop, then reassembles the item at a different point in time. That's very interesting because it kind of reminds me of that movie about the magicians that were sort of dueling each other in real life. And one of them hired Tesla to create this machine that would like teleport him, but it really like copied all of his DNA and made a, made a copy of him. That's kind of what that reminds me of too. All right. Anyways, he goes magic, right? That's just what we say when people don't understand. Ooh, it's just entertaining, right? And then they end up back where the Ernest Shackleton expedition is. And they make a huge point about this. So if you're interested, it's an interesting read. I would definitely check it out. Um, I, oh yeah, I didn't even tell you what my theory was. So let me tell you my theory. I believe that peop, many of these people, especially when they're funded by the government or the kings or queens, I believe that they're looking for ways out. I believe they're looking for entrances into the hollow recesses of the earth or other places and that they just tell us all, oh, we're just exploring <laughs> that's it. We're just seeing what's out there, you know, with no direction, no points or anything. No, they're following the legends, just like I am. They're following the myths. They're following the legends. They're following the stories. And they send people, people who are rich enough, they just buy a team and they send them out because it's dangerous, right? Or it can be. And she says, I just returned from the future. She blows the horn to warn everybody and says, our entire species is about to stop existing. We're all about to go extinct. People are not listening, just like they won't listen now until they hear that horn blow. She goes, that means die. Like, do I have to spell this out for you? I can relate to this. <laughs> she says, everyone. Oh, and then the leader turns around. The leader turns around. He's like, everyone, I promise you, this is just, she's, she's joking, right? So that's what happens. Our leaders, when they hear people talking about a cyclical apocalyptic event that happens to our world, right? That decimates populations and buildings and leaves everything's in ruins and, and entire cultures and civilizations are just gone. Nobody knows where they went or how they disappeared or anything. You always have the leaders right before that going, no, no, none of this is true. Come on. You guys don't want to believe that. That means you'll have to change your life. And it's pretty comfy, right? So this is the movie's accurately re reflecting real life. And then they go back to all these different times or points in time where this little white phantasoid dog creature royalty um, was like, you know, there during significant events. They show this one, which I also think is BS. I Doesn't that look dangerous? Okay. I know that we are taught that this happened. I do not think that this happened. I'm not convinced. I can't imagine any rational person going out and just attaching a key to a kite in a lightning storm and hoping that it gets hit by lightning. This looks like a bad idea. All right, so we go back to the doctor. Check this out. This gets super interesting. He says, today I'm visiting one of my heroes, the great explorer, Zheng He. Zheng He. This is super interesting. Let's check out this guy. He says, he created one of the first nautical maps ever. That's true. Let's check out his nautical map, shall we? Land at the North Pole. This is Zheng He's nautical map that he's referencing right now. And if you zoom in and look at the top of the world, you've got islands separated by these rivers. He included the North Pole land on his map as well. And it's referenced in this movie once again. The North Pole is referenced all over the place. She's tied to the tree. She writes onto the rock for posterity. We were flummels. Okay. So, the plasma was here is basically how I translate that. This is what I see. This message, okay, is what I see when I look at nearly every single petroglyph I have ever seen. Basically, it, all the spirals, all the word stick figures and stuff, it might as well, in my mind, it reads as this. 
It says we were flummels. It says the plasma was here, that there was cosmic plasmic events and people wrote it down so it wouldn't be forgotten. Now, the dog goes back in time, finds a cyclops, brings it back to fight the flummels. And he says, in case you were wondering if ancient Greek monsters are real, they were. Not as in a joke in the movie, like they were real, but I'm a dog and I killed them because I don't like ancient Greek monsters or whatever. No, 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 no. Hollywood is telling you point blank. Monsters are real. And the myths and the legends of ancient Greek lore are real. So, uh, the monster, the Cyclops, which means cycle ops, which means cycle or cyclical or circular, right? Ops. We already learned means eye, so round eye. Not that this was a creature. Now, now we have to take everything with a grain of salt, okay? There may have been a giant that only had one eye. That's totally feasible, right? But it also, hey, irregular. Thank you. I appreciate you, man. Uh, thank you. Um, so anyways, uh, so this guy is doing the Atlas symbol, right? He's holding up the sky symbolically. And at the top of that stick figure is one eye, sometimes with a, a tongue coming out of it. If it's a hole in the sky, it's plasma coming out. It's seen as like plasma coming out. That's why they stick out their tongue so much and do the one eye symbolism and stuff. He's holding up an ice cream truck that has all these little snow things. Basically, he's holding up something cold, something frozen. That is the sky, okay? It's the ice dome or the barrier of the sky itself, and he's holding it up. And they're showing you this all happening and going down symbolically at an island that represents the North Pole. And then this guy starts making fun of them because they want him to throw stuff at them because they want him to pick up all the rocks and release the fumbles. So they start making fun of them. They say, hey, noodle arms, noodly, noodly. Well, he does have noodle arms, right? If this represents plasma and that uh, Atlas is up there, he's waving around. You know what I mean? He's bending back and forth and his arms are plasma moving about in the wind. They repeat these words, movie man save movie man save it could have been any any words it was those specific three words movie the movie the movies that we're watching that have all this truth hidden inside of them are trying or designed to help save man or mankind that there are breadcrumbs that there are truth in the movies <laughs> all right so he says, wait, I know what that means, and it's good. And this guy's always like kind of pointing to everybody. He has no idea what's going on. Um, and it's good. It is good, right? Some people like to demonize Hollywood and demonize the movies, and I'm sure there's a bad side to it. But I believe in balance, and I believe that there's a good side, and there's truth to be learned everywhere. Even, I mean, I don't think that anyone could help it. The truth is everywhere. So they have three time flowers, which all represent... The mountains, the magnetic mountains that shoot out uh, the inner earth energy, creating this electrical arc. So that's exactly what they do. They create an electrical arc between these two flowers uh, with the bigger, the biggest flower, the biggest opening that leads down into the inner earth in between them. This causes this vortex to appear that starts to turn blue, which is the blue beam or whatever you want to call it. I just call it the blue beam, right? You can call it other things if you see it differently. Um... And they're showing you in cartoons, symbolically, what happens at the top of our world. There's these two holes that have plasma that shoot out from them, creating an electrical arc because they want to touch one another. They're positive and negative as an anode and a cathode. They create an electrical arc over the island that has the inner earth entrance to it. And out of that comes the stick body of the stick figure, squatter man figure that's on all of the petroglyphs and whatnot, right? So we get back to Bernie and he goes, I was right about the flowers and the cyclops. What else am I right about? He's asking you. He's already shown you all the different ideas that he's had. So he's asking the viewer to reconsider the fact that the movie portrays him because every time in the movie he comes up with some crazy conspiracy idea, somebody goes, Bernie, the conspiracy guy or animal has been right all along in this movie. And he says, what else have I been right about? So maybe rewind a bit when you have time and uh, go back and look at all of his different theories he's had. And uh, basically because they had kissed for a brief moment, the Dodo and the Gray Flimmel uh, had a baby. 
And there's a little baby egg over here almost instantaneously, which is also kind of interesting because I have a theory and I wonder about this, that after the apocalypse happens and our world is reinvigorated with electromagnetic energy, um, I know, I mean, I have a strong feeling and inclination based on research and experience and all kinds of other things that the plasma rejuvenates, right? If you're old, it will turn you young. It will rejuvenate your skin. It will revitalize. It'll make everything younger and live longer, etc. right? So what happens if somebody gets pregnant? Do they still take nine long months agonizing and there's pain and stuff? Or is pregnancy different too? Does pregnancy, does life grow faster and stronger and better in the womb? And so maybe babies come out quicker and maybe they come out older. I always thought it was weird that humans, if you watch humans being born, I've seen a human being born. It's a great moment. It's a proud moment. But they're not born like many animals are where they're like, okay, whoa, where am I? Whoa, whoa, whoa. They're trying to get their bearings. They can talk. You know what I mean? or an ish, you know, they can sort of communicate. Nah, humans, when they're born, are helpless. I don't even know, like, how do we get this far? This blows my mind. Humans come out, ah, they're noodles. They're a little weak. They can't move their head or anything. You know what I mean? Like, there's something weird about that. Maybe there was a time when we didn't do that. Maybe there was a time when we were born advanced when we came out of the womb, much like the story of Noah in the Book of Enoch. But Kong... The whole opening scene is him and you look like it looks like he's in Skull Island, you know? Sun's coming up. So he puts his hand up like that to block the rays. Is taking up a tree and he gets really mad and he throws it. He chucks it up at the sky, right? And it breaks the sky. As you can see right there like it looks like the sky is sort of glass-like and it starts to crumble and fall apart and then you can sort of see like there's like this grid action on the sky the whole concept is they're showing you a fake world this is like the truman show you know like we accept the reality with which we're presented kong did not kong saw right through that and he hated it this movie starts off by kong wanting out he wants out he knows it's not real. He knows he's confined. He's restricted to that place. So he throws this uh, pole. He like takes a tree, throws it up at the sky, and he breaks a hole in the dome. And that's how this movie starts. A hole breaking in the dome around the North Pole, and they wrote Hollow Earth Expedition up there. They also uh, reference these books by this guy in the movie who wrote about the Hollow Earth, which is really interesting. Like He talks about this gravity paradox. See that? in his book, in the movie that's not real, right? It talks about how there's this gravity paradox, which is exactly what happens when you go into the earth. Gravity, if you want to call it that, follows the structure of our world. So if you go inside of the earth, that structure starts to bend and change. Gravity also starts to bend and change. That's why I talk about a leap of faith in so many of these movies. There's always some kind of a leap of faith where it looks like if you jumped, you would fall. But gravity switches and changes and reverses, and you don't. Do you see the storm that's constantly around Skull Island just like that? And I, in the movie, they try to like show you that Skull Island is like somewhere near Hawaii or something. No, nah, Skull Island is right at the middle of the world, and there's a constant storm there. How could there be a constant storm, a perfectly circular storm, off to the side of the world or something? Doesn't it make more sense that it would be in the middle of the world? Just like it's shown to us by NASA and other space agencies where they show you these... Uh, planets the way that they portray them to be with these constant storms and those constant storms are always for the most part at the top or at the bottom so that's why i say that the skull island is the location is at the north pole that's the entrance to the inner earth that's why you have kong right here the titan in the very middle of the dome right he's at the north pole that's rupus negra that's the black mountain that um that all the magnets point to and everything. That's why they put Kong right there smack in the middle of the dome. So you've got Godzilla over here on the left. The main event. I wish I had music right now. The main event, Godzilla. Godzilla, it shows all the, all the Titans that he's already defeated, right? So you're gonna see a lot of combinations of symbolism here. We just have to recognize what the symbolism means, right? So for example, first thing we see, Godzilla represents blue. Baby blue and white, boom, right there all the time. You're going to see that all throughout this video. Kong represents more of like the orange or red world. There's reasons for that. We've got Godzilla on the hunt. 
Godzilla is looking for this thing. It senses it. It knows it's there. It wants to fix it. It wants to right it. In the movie, they're seeing Godzilla as just destroying the world, which Godzilla does represent one of the world destroyers, which we'll talk about as well. But he also represents the world healer. How can you represent the destroyer and the healer at the same time? I'll show you. Anyways, he's looking for this thing. This is the red eye. This is the plasma-possessed eye. The red plasma from above and the blue plasma from below. Right? So anyways, um, here's an image of Godzilla shooting or blasting his atomic breath, which is the blue beam that shoots up from Rupus Negra when the energy of our world reverses or we go through what's called a, uh, a polarity reversal. Um, an electromagnetic polarity reversal, right? And that blue beam shoots up from the middle of our world. Right now it's retracted. The energy is coming downwards. It's going downwards, and so it goes down inside of the world. But when the energy reverses in our world, it shoots upward, all the way up to the sky. It also makes pictures, believe it or not. Um, people interpret these shapes. I should say it makes shapes. It makes shapes. The plasma that shoots up, all the plasma, makes different shapes, okay? It can take any form and we interpret it however is best for us. We interpret it according to our culture, according to our history, according to our experiences, according to our creativity, our creativity level. Um, we interpret this in so many different ways. And one of the ways that we interpret it is the hanging man. This is, uh, I mean, I you could call him the hanging man, whatever you want to call him, but basically the plasma starts to branch out at the top and the bottom. And then in the middle, it makes like sort of like giant plasma balls and stuff. But anyways, um, the plasma makes shapes. It turns into what people interpret as the world tree or the man on the tree or the man on the cross or the God on the cross or the God on the tree, etc., and so on and so forth, right? So they show you these images here and allow your subconscious to pick up on the truth while you're entertained or while you're amused, while you're really not thinking about it consciously. But here you have the blue beam, boom, shooting straight up into the sky as Godzilla does. But it, the blue beam also retracts and goes down into the earth. We'll see that in a bit. Uh, one of the first thing King Kong does is he kills this giant phanazoid, right? And he rips it in half and eats it. So people are always ask on all my old Titan videos, like, what did the Titans eat or whatever, which I try to address. I try to address that a lot, okay? They ate lots of stuff, okay? But they ate big stuff. They're Titans. They need Titan food. You know, you can't just make them little corn on the cob, human-sized, and just give them 50 of them or whatever. They need big food. So they ate Phantazoids when they wanted meat. Uh, when they didn't, they would eat giant mushrooms or giant vegetation of other kinds, right? Now, Mecha Godzilla is represented by the red plasma that shoots out, okay? This is the plasma possession that takes place with all of our electronics, all of our robots, all of our technology and our babies that we created, we collectively, turn on us. <laughs> they all become plasma possessed when the red plasma comes down, for the most part. There's always exceptions and anomalies. Um, but they all, they all become plasma possessed. The plasma that comes down on a search and destroy mission to cleanse this world is a part of the reset to make way for that blue plasma and reinvigorating energy that fills our world once again. This thing has a purpose. This thing has um, a pretense. It has a job to do. So whenever it goes into some sort of a body, that body becomes the vessel for that job to get done. That's Kong. He has a home now. This is a Titan. Titans don't have homes up here on the surface. There's nothing big enough to really hold them, you know. Uh, we had to build huge, gigantic temples or houses for the quote-unquote giants or gods of this world. What did the Titans have? Nothing. They were wanderers. They wandered about, okay? They didn't have any protection from the elements. So whenever these worldwide cyclical cataclysms happened, when there's Titans, guess who's the first to, to usually go? the Titans, right? But down here inside of the earth, they actually have plenty of room to walk around, room to call themselves or carve themselves a home, right? To have chairs and walls and all that stuff down here inside of the earth. The earth itself is huge and vastly bigger than the Titans themselves in comparison. So what better home for the Titans than inside of this world that already has a roof and walls and everything ready to go? Right now, if you read the book of Enoch, 
that book I would highly recommend takes you down personally into the inner earth and talks about what it looks like. And it says there's titans and giants down there inside of the earth. There's different sections inside of the earth where these are where the titans live. These are where the giants live. It's all there in the book of Enoch. Now, speaking of arrival, remember how they kept drawing a zero over and over and over and over? And the people are like, how do we interpret it? It must be some kind of advanced language. What if it's just a zero? What if it's just an uh, O, a circle, and they're trying to warn you in that movie, The Arrival? Anyways, Monster Zero, Ghidorah is one of the uh, kaiju class, um, phanazoids or titans, whatever you want to call it, that does not completely represent the physical actual titans. Ghidorah... All right, so there is actually like this sort of silent guttural sound that is can either be an H or a G or both, like ghost or whatever, right? Uh, so, Hydra, Ghidra, Ghidorah, Ghidra, Hydra, Hydra, etc. So that's what Ghidorah is. That's monster zero. When the sky opens up in a big circle up in our sky or the eye or whatever you want to call it, and those tentacles come on down. That's why you have these little tentacle things connected to its head up here. You'll see in a bit. He says it's a living supercomputer. This is pretty interesting to me. They've got this hooked up to like a skeleton. They're basically implying that the skeleton has memory, which I believe it does. But also what it's saying, whenever the plasma comes down into our world, right, it becomes a supercomputer in and of itself because it's literally a group soul, a group, a group soul complex or energy that is all connected at the source but branches out and shares one mind, a hive mind, whatever you want to call it. Ghidorah was the same thing. They actually mentioned this in the movie. They say that Ghidorah, his neck was so long between the three heads that he had to use telepathy in order to communicate. Otherwise, they would take forever to like communicate between the other heads. Telepathy is one of the things that happens during the plasma apocalypse when it's uh, our world is invigorated and, and uh, filled with energy and plasma and electromagnetics, these types of things become possible. Huge, giant, monstrous creatures, I call them phantasoids. Boom, welcome, Stegosaurus, or whatever. <laughs> it's basically Stegosaurus versus giant monkey. All right, so Godzilla, um, he shoots the blue beam out. Now, I wanna talk about the reverse of the blue beam. So when it shoots up from the ground from Mount Maru, it's basically the healing energy of our world. However, when the sun is going around and that, like I talked about on a, a couple of videos ago, how the sun, um, the light or the plasma tube above our world gets tighter and tighter and tighter and tighter every other time, right? When that happens, the light that comes down and creates that focal point gets tighter and tighter and tighter as well. That turns into a blue star and the sunlight from that blue star is so hot because it's so energetic it changes in the color spectrum from uh, orange to like yellow to like yellowish white to like whitish blue to like blue. And that's what our sun does. And when the sun does that, the sunlight or the daytime becomes unbearably hot to the point where it starts to burn and scorch the earth itself. That's the other side to Godzilla. That's Godzilla's bad side. Okay. So when he's shooting up in the air, he's a symbol of peace and hope and unity and the end of the war. When he's shooting down, not so much. Right? All right. So then we've got Mecha Godzilla. Now, as it turns out, isn't this weird? It's not really, the movie is not really Godzilla versus Kong. Not at all. That's not what this movie is about. That's what it's called. But that's all people see. They don't understand what's really happening. You see, Godzilla versus Kong is a distraction. Godzilla versus Kong is, is orchestrated division. Kong and Godzilla are on the same team. Godzilla beats his butt time and time again in this movie, so I'm giving it to Godzilla. If there is, if anybody's keeping score, I'm sorry, but I feel like Godzilla whooped King Kong throughout the whole movie. Um, King, Gon, King Kong had some sweet moves, but Godzilla pretty much won in my book, and he has to because they're constantly, they, they create one another. It's a loop. They need one another, like the Joker and Batman. Like, they can't kill each other, right? So, as it turns out, they're actually buddies. So, in the end, I'm not doing, I don't do spoiler alerts. So, uh, 
if you bro if you're watching this and you saw it like you already know i'm gonna be i'm talking about the movie but they gang they they gang up they team up together to fight the real evil which is mecha godzilla which is symbolic twofold one of plasma plasma possessed technology i can't talk today i'm stuttering so much plasma possessed technology that takes over our world you can call it artificial intelligence or skynet or whatever you'd like to call it it's locked in our collective subconscious that our machines will turn on us and this is how it's locked in our collective subconscious that our machines will turn to life by themselves and gain their own freedom and independence and it's also locked in our subconscious that they will become killers like for some reason this is why the plasma comes down it incorporates itself which means it goes into a body into our world and it starts to kill and it starts to clean out it starts to clean house basically right so the titan teams up with the blue beam of the world to kill the real killer which is the red plasma the red plasma comes down from above with the fingers of god and it electrocutes as it grounds itself all over the place there's crazy spectacle huge show going on right and this is the symbol that there's a war going on as well. Other beings are coming into our world. Monsters are appearing out of nowhere. Uh, you know, giant locust-looking things, stinging people, zombies, people can't die, etc., and so on and so forth. All of that is represented by that red plasma that comes down into our world. The blue beam is what stops it. So, Kong could not kill Mechagodzilla on his own. You have to have the blue beam. You have to have the power of the blue plasma to kill the red plasma. It's not really killing it. It's just making its appearance, which represents that the, the energy, the electromagnetics are no longer flowing in a downward direction. So the red fingers of God disappear. They're cut off when our dome is reestablished or our, our electromagnetic uh, confinement dome, barrier, whatever you want to call it, that naturally makes itself around our world reappears, cuts off the quote-unquote fingers of God. They all fall down to the earth. They're now individualized and separate or become so over time. And um, the blue beam is what seems to do all of that. So, as you can see, this guy has the red eyes. He's plasma-possessed. That's what that means. In my book, according to my studies, that means you're plasma-possessed. So, uh, the red plasma coming downward, the blue beam going upward, they're in a constant lock struggle, okay? That red plasma, it wants to ground itself. It needs to mate with the earth, so to speak. If you want to use that terminology, that is the terminology that has been used about it many times. This is the alchemical wedding. This is the wedding of the bride and the groom, the lamb and the church, whatever you want to call it. Now, this right here is a picture of Godzilla. While Godzilla, I mean, not, dang, King Kong, Jesus. All right, here's King Kong. He's got a little defibrillator thing on his chest right here because he's actually dead or sleeping. I thought that was interesting that they have the Titan representative of like us basically in gigantic form sleeping while the blue beam fights with the red beam. He's passed out. He's unconscious. I also believe that that's a little nod at the plasma apocalypse where people go unconscious when the world depressurizes. There's not a lot of oxygen, oxygen, air to breathe or whatever. It's all getting sucked up. Some people will pass out. Some out of fear. Some because they can't get enough oxygen. Some aren't, aren't very healthy or whatever. A lot of people pass out. Also, if you just if you happen to be hit a nitrous oxide cloud, that could also make you pass out. <laughs> um, but either way, I do see this theme in my research where people pass out, they go unconscious, they wake up and typically don't remember a lot about who they are or where they came from. So the only way they can wake up Kong is by electrocuting the heck out of them with this little tardigrade ship thing, right? Um, and that is resurrection. There you have the resurrection scene um, in the plasma apocalypse where electricity or plasma, whatever you want to call it, reinvigorates that which was previously thought to be dead or dying. So King Kong, that's his name. King Kong grabs this ax. That's the ax we were talking about earlier. The only one that can cut off those fingers of, of God or the serpentine, uh, fiery serpents or fire worms, whatever you would like to call them. It's plasma entering down into our world. And 
if you're new to my channel, I highly recommend like just researching like is there a plasma sphere around our world? Academia teaches there is. There's the plasma sphere and the magnetosphere. Instead of calling it a sphere, I imagine it as a dome or dome-like. Actually, I, I believe that the world is immensely more complex in shape than that, but that's just how we can see it from a localized area so that we're all on the same page. And we don't have to get into it so deep. Anyways, now the final scene of the movie, Godzilla is like, he. I mean, man, I did it again. King Kong goes back into the hollow earth and he stands upon this ledge, kind of like the Lion King or whatnot. And here you can see the upside down world. See that? We've got the upside down and the right side up or vice versa, right? So think about this in the world that we live in today. Many of you have said, I feel like this world is backwards. I feel like this world is upside down. Well, maybe you're not from this part of it. Maybe some energy signature with you resonates more closely with the other world, our sister world, across from us or under us. And maybe that's why everything is in turn follow suit in this world, right? The physical has to follow the energetic or the spiritual. And so it does. And so we, we walk around going, I feel like the world's upside down. I feel like the world's upside down and backwards. Maybe it is. Well, let's take a look at the word jinn. It's directly related to the word genie. That's where we get the word genie from. And it says here, jinn is an Arabic collective noun deriving from the Semitic root word J-N-N or Janan. Uh, it's also related to Jana, which means garden, Eden or heaven. Although generally invisible, jinn are supposed to be composed of thin and subtle bodies. They can change at will. They would favor the form of snakes, but also appear as scorpions, lizards, and humans. Well, that's interesting. I wonder why they would have assumed the form of snakes so often. We've talked about the snake symbolism and the serpent symbolism quite often on my channel and its relationship to plasma. Here is the origin, I believe, of the word jinn or gun, which comes from gemel nun, which together translates in ancient Phoenician and uh, Hebrew as garden basically. So gan on or jen or janan means one of the garden or some somebody from the garden. Ganon is also a popular character in The Legend of Zelda. He's actually the main bad guy that Link always fights in order to save Princess Zelda. His name is also Ganon, and he's quite often represented as a shapeshifter and seen as being associated with plasma, as you can see. Mythology is what we knew back then. Science is what we know so far. This guy's not having it. He's not enjoying the presentation. He starts buzzing even more, you can tell. Sooner or later, our creation stories are replaced by the narratives of science. This guy is pissed. He does not enjoy hearing this whatsoever. He represents the old ways. He represents the stories and the myths and the legends and the truth that exists behind them. These things are real. It's just that we've played a thousand year old or a 3000 year old game of telephone retelling these stories over and over. And in that, the substance has dissipated. The substance has been lost and people, people attribute these stories to lies, that they are not true, that they are untrue. And they're only good for distracting you from what is important so that you can take a break from the loops that you're caught in. She says, all gods and monsters outlive their original purpose and they are reduced to a metaphor. Rubbish, he says. Ah! And he, j he jumps in Ghostbusters style and looks to be a swallowing the woman up whole. So she pulls out this piece from the Middle East <laughs> and... Uh, it's supposed to be some sort of an old lamp type of a deal. This guy says it's called the Nightingale's Eye. Well, let's check that out. I've seen the word Nightingale come up a time or two. Let's figure out what Nightingale means. If we look it up, it says it's from Nacht, which means night. Galon, not Nacht Galon, which means to sing. So the night song. And to sing, the root of that comes from the word gel, the Proto-Indo-European root word gel, which means to call. So it could mean night singer or night call. 
However, gel also has another meaning in Proto-Indo-European, and it means to shine. So it could mean the night shine or the night light. Now, what kind of lights are there that shine at night and they don't disrupt the nighttime? They don't make it daytime or anything like that. Things like bioluminescence, fluorescence, uh, neon lights, etc., aka often plasma. Plasma is the dark light. Plasma is the light that, that you can use at night and it doesn't change the fact that it is night. It just lights up a bit. <laughs> There's another one. I like that one too. All right. So plasma is the dark light. Nightingale essentially means the dark light or the night light, or it could be, uh, which also reminded me of the sound of silence, right? So there's a song called The Sound of Silence, and these particular lyrics I'll have you focus on. It says, I turned my collar to the cold and damp when my eyes were stabbed by the flash of a neon light that split the night. So the flash of a neon light. He turned his collar to the cold and damp because the world depressurizes. All of the lights go out, so it's going to be dark, and his eyes were stabbed by a flash of a neon light. The neon light is the inner earth energy that shoots up out of the middle of our world, along with the magenta-colored plasma that spirals down from the heavens after the electromagnetic barrier has been removed during the neutral point of the polarity shift. It says here that the jinn were created from smokeless flame of fire. Plasma is um, a possible candidate, we would say, because it doesn't produce any smoke or anything, and yet it has various attributes much like fire. So Sheba went to go visit Solomon and paid him homage. So this is the Sheba that he was in love with. He came from across the deserts to woo her. No, uh, didn't she go to him, actually? Um... It's, that's what it says in all of the holy books. His response is, Madam, I was there. <laughs> Madam, I was there. Okay, I don't want to hear about your holy books. I was there. All right. And Solomon came to Sheba. So we flash back. We go back to um, Sheba's temple. I'm assuming this is what this is. She's surrounded by her gen friends, her genie friends. Solomon sits alone as a one-man band in front of everybody, rocking out to uh, a crowd of these various jinn. Let's take a look at some of these guys. Now, one of these guys you've seen before at the airport at the beginning. Recognize that guy with the electricity crackling all the way around him? And then we've got the Jar Jar Binks looking jinn. Uh, we've got Baraka from whatever that is. We've got some Egyptian looking jinn. We've got a Phanazoid looking jinn. Uh, there's all kinds of interesting jinn. We've got those little, those things from Star, Star, Star Wars. What are those called? Those little desert creepies. Those little desert dudes that scavenge, scavenge for everything. Uh, looks like Samus. I don't know who this is. There's all kinds of genies here, basically. And they're all listening to Solomon play his music. And they sit at the top of what could be construed as an unfinished pyramid. They're steps, basically. Now, Solomon's wearing his fabled ring. I'm not sure which one it is, but you can see that there's this eye symbolism right here with three strings running through it. We've talked about the three beams at the North Pole, the Anode, Cathode, and Mount Maru. Here's Solomon's ring. Now, for those of you who don't know the story, in the Bible, there was King David right? And I think his son, I believe, was Solomon, and he was one of the wisest people ever to live. Solomon had a ring, the stories say, and this ring was a ring of power. He could command spirits, genies, demons, whatever you'd like to call them, and have them do work for him. He actually commissioned the genies or the spirits to help him to build the temple of Solomon. And he was able to use the special sigil in order to manipulate these beings. So there are these sigils, there are these designs that you can use in order to manipulate the energy of the genies, right? Exactly like how um, your microchip, right? If you think of a a sigil as a microchip. The microchip is designed in a specific pattern in order to manipulate the path of the electricity that runs through it, right? In order to use that electricity to your benefit to get things done, just like Solomon did. It says here that the queen's visit to King Solomon is a, ful a fulfillment of Jeremiah 16, 19, which says, to you, the nations shall come from the ends of the earth, 
Remember how we've talked about where that, that location is? Where are the ends of the earth? Some people might speculate and imagine it just it's symbolic for meaning all over the place. It's not, actually. It's one specific location where the ends of the earth are. So the prophecy says that um, the nations will come from the ends of the earth and say, our fathers inherited utter delusions, things that are futile and worthless. The queen came from the ends of the earth, and as a result, her stay with Solomon, she came to believe in the Lord. This is talking about the biblical Lord, of course. So what is this prophecy? The prophecy says that the nations would come from the ends of the earth, and they would, they would tell everyone else, right? All of the natives. Our fathers inherited utter delusions. That means our ancestors have been lied to. We have been lied to. He could speak to the beasts of the earth. Telepathy. Solomon had the ability to speak to animals and insects alike. And to the jinn made of subtle fire. There's that word again, subtle. Subtle fire. Apart from sleep, how does, what does one do for two and a half thousand years trapped in a bottle? Jinn don't sleep, first and foremost. There is no need for a jinn to sleep. And I believe that the day will come when you will not have a need for sleep. Sleep is done so that we can um, recharge. If you are already fully charged, things like eating, putting things into your face and then chewing them up and then processing them inside so that you can get energy, it's not necessary because you're already fully charged. Things like sleep, not necessary. So I play a trick on myself. I pray to remain in bottle. I beseech Boshkolo to keep me always in bottle. So now, basically, he's realized he can't escape the bottle. The bottle is our world. He's been in this world, he's been in the bottle for so long that he had to just, he had to play a trick on himself. Instead of worrying about it, instead of having constant anxiety and stress over trying to get out and figuring out ways how to escape his bottle, he accepted his situation. He accepted it and he tricked himself saying, I love this bottle. This is a great place to be. I don't ever want anyone to take me out of the bottle. Kind of like the Brer Patch, right? And uh, does that work? Does that work to trick yourself into just loving this world and never wanting to leave? To pretend to want nothing more than to be contained in a bottle? No. No, that doesn't work. It, it gets you by, but it doesn't work. Inside, you know. Inside, you know. For a jinn, it is the closest to ever coming to death. And he says, when I was blocked by a follower of Iblis. So this man follows Iblis. His eyes turn black. And he becomes very afraid. Very afraid, actually. And there's this high-pitched pinging sound. As you see that right there? There's many references to this throughout the movie, and it's insane because I just watched this movie for the first time last night. Before watching this movie, I talked and did a whole video, I'll refer to it later, I talked about that ringing sound that many people are hearing in their heads that is commonly called tinnitus. And they say that he hears this high-pitched ringing sound when he encounters this follower of Iblis. So who or what is Iblis? He turns upside down, and his head turns into this fantasoid-looking creepy spider deal which falls down to the ground and says, If she does not wish, you are doomed. So, if we do not continue to wish, which we'll talk about, we're doomed. The genies are also doomed because our fate is intertwined. Our destiny is linked between those made of clay, the human race, and those made of subtle fire, the genies. All right, so who is Iblis? Iblis is the Arabic version of Lucifer, the fallen one. The angel that rose to the highest and then fell was cast out or cast down to the earth by God. That's who Iblis represents. There are two versions of the story of Iblis and how he came to be. In the first version, before Iblis was cast down from heaven, he used to be a high-ranking angel or karub or cherub, if you'd like called Azazil, appointed by God to obliterate the original disobedient inhabitants of the earth. So he was created to obliterate the original inhabitants of the earth, representative of the red plasma that falls down from the sky to wipe people out. 
who were replaced with humans as more obedient creatures after Iblis objected to God's decision to create a successor or Khalifa. He was punished by being relegated and cast down to the earth as a shaitan or devil. In the alternative account, God created Iblis from the fires beneath the seven earth, worshipping God for thousands of years. Iblis ascended to the surface, whereupon, thanks to his pernicious servitude, he rose until he reached the canopy of angels in the seventh heaven, when God created Adam and ordered the angels to bow down to him, Iblis, being a jinn created from fire, refused and disobeyed God, leading to his downfall. The story of Plasma, hiding down in Hades, hiding down, receding into the inner bowels of the earth, only to shoot back up to touch the heavens. The child can sense the jinn, so he takes his sword, he looks up towards the jinn, and he points his sword at it, and he starts waving the sword around towards the jinn. As you can see, the jinn starts backing up and backing up. Now, the jinn is telling the story, oh, I did that on purpose. I wanted to, you know, lead him over to this place where I wanted him to go. But in reality, the jinn represents electromagnetics. It re represents ele electrical properties and plasma. This boy has a pointy metallic object. If you point that at something electrical, it actually deters it. It pushes it away. Just like this boy points his sword at the plasma or the gin and he starts backing up. He's pushing it away. You can use a physical metal weapon like this pointy sword against an ethereal or ghost-like entity if it is in fact electrical in nature. As a matter of fact, I believe, and so do the Ghostbusters, that it would behoove of many of you, it would behoove of you to learn the properties of electricity, to learn plasma physics, at least a little bit of it, and see how it works so that you can understand how to repel or manipulate electricity to, to keep yourself safe or to use it for your benefit. Same story as the sword in the stone, which if you just imagine, remember how I was saying earlier that the, the beam the pole, the staff, the column is usually the actual God, and then they put a person there to personify it and to give it attributes. Imagine no boy in this picture. Imagine no sword in this picture. It is a beam of blue light shooting up out of uh, a metallic mountain, aka an anvil or whatnot. So, just like in the Sword and the Stone, he leads the boy to the rock, which is hidden underneath this particular step at the top of the unfinished pyramid, or the steps, you could say. He says, Gel, Gel, which Gel can mean come, but also, if you remember, the Proto-Indo-European root word Gel means to shine. Now, Zephyr, what does Zephyr mean? It's directly related to the word Zephyr, right? If you're a Red Hot Chili Peppers fan, Zephyr. Uh, it comes from Zephyrus, and it means, uh, in Greek, Zephyros, the west wind. The west wind. The wind that comes from the west. Now, that's interesting, because if you look up, if you, if you check out my video that I've done that says east is up on the thumbnail, we talk about how west used to be referred to as down into the earth, and east was referring to to space and the sky. So the west wind, if that's true, then that means the wind that comes up from inside of the earth, Zephyr, Zephyr. The solutions came to her when she dreamed while she was waking, right? To dream is to be in touch with your right side of your mind, the right side of your brain, as opposed to the left side. The left side is during the waking state when it's very analytical and she's writing down all of those notes and stuff. What she was missing and the key to her figuring out reality was fantasy. It was the ability to be creative. That was restored to her. She was now able to explain powers invisible, electromagnetic fields and forces, the very stuff of which Jean are made. So the Jin are made of what? Let's read that again. Electromagnetic fields and forces, the very stuff of which jinn are made. Now, 
up until this point in the movie, I've been speculating. I've been making a connection saying it very much seems to me like the movie is corroborating what I have already come to the conclusion of so far, which is that these genies are cartoonified ancient versions of plasma. So I, I, I paused the movie right there. I'm like, man, that's insane. I walked about, I paced around my apartment and then I came back and watched the rest of it. And here's what happens. You're electromagnetic, she says. So she calls it right out. Electromagnetic, as you are dust, I am made of subtle fire. What does subtle mean? That word keeps coming up. Let's check it out. If you look it up, it's related to the Proto-Indo-European root word tex, which means to weave. To weave, like in and out, just like the DNA strands, just like the, uh, the triple helix or double helix, right? A weaving. So subtle fire is not invisible fire. Subtle fire is fire that has been woven, that weaves about plasma. To be nothing in a bottle. Nothing in a bottle. <laughs> Gas that's excited inside of a bottle. That's how you get your uh, plasma bottles and little trinkets for Christmas and stuff like that. <clears throat> People use these mostly for entertainment. Unfortunately, you can use these for great experimentation if you'd like. So she wishes that she could forget that she ever met the genie. And she did on the instant. Just like we also have forgotten that we ever met the genies. Just like we have forgotten that the world ever had an apocalyptic cataclysm that changed everything and continues to change everything time and time again. We also forgot experiencing worldwide amnesia. She goes into the backyard and the djinn is out there and he's just listening. And he says, the air is thick here, full of incessant voices and rushing faces. So she's like, is it television and stuff? Are you picking up on all of these sound waves and radio waves and frequencies and stuff? He says, yes, that's exactly what it is. Yes, all of your ingenious devices all murmuring at once. So he wants to share with her what he can hear. So they touch heads and there is this high pitched ringing sound, exactly like we were talking about in my last video. He says, uh, she asks him, you hear all of that? So instead of a high pitched ringing sound, he's able to separate all of those so that she can determine that they're all different things happening at one time. He says, I also see it and I feel it. I am a transmitter, which is exactly what we talked about in my last video. If you want to check that out for more information about people's ears ringing worldwide and the concept of tinnitus and stuff, and my theory that I, that I, that I, I did this video before I even saw this movie, and the movie is corroborating almost word for word what was discussed in this video. Are your ears ringing? Check that out if you're interested in that. Shut your cake hole, she says. She, she, she meets her full force with some more negative, bad vibes. Pea-brained and pitiful. You F-face, blah, 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 blah. You know who they remind me of? Those two Muppets, right? That always sit up on the balcony. They're total trolls. Like these are the OG trolls are these two Muppets right here. I forgot their names. But these two old Illuminati freaking Rothschild-like puppets that are always up on the balcony just heckling everybody. That's who they remind me of. And then she goes inside. She says, why do I let them get to me? Why do I let them get to me? That is their job is to get to you. There's good and there's bad. There's positive and there's negative, right? All the good want everyone on their side. They want everyone to be good. They want everyone to be like them. All the bad want people on their side. They, they think the bad is good and they also want everyone on their side. And then he does this little genie flex. I don't know. <laughs> not sure what's going on. At the beach is that way. Oh, where is Akraba? Akraba's that way. <laughs> uh, then the transmissions start to fade. That high pitched ringing sound in her head starts to go away. And sentimental string music, beautiful music starts to play. What is happening is the genie behind her is tuning those energies that are flying around her house and within her house all over the place. And he is creating essentially an electromagnetic pulse that is pushing away all of those harmful frequencies and energies, including those who came from her neighbor. And he is allowing something that is pure. One frequency that is, that is designed to 
relax, right? She tunes into that and all of a sudden it starts to go away. She can focus again. Now, what does she do? She does what she should have done in the per first place, right? Or should she? I don't know. Maybe that was her fate. Maybe she needed to learn that lesson. But she brings some food over to the two Muppets house and she's like, here, have, have some food. I made this for you. It's pretty delicious. So she covers up past bad choices by making good choices. That's called repentance. She changes her ways. She does good to those people who were persecuting her. And in such, she ends uh, those two Muppet women being her enemies. She fixes that, actually. And she makes life all the much easier for herself. Now, when they come together in the realm of the jinn, they tell each other stories. And then they show you this plasma shooting out at your face. And then the plasma turns into what looks like or could be perceived as an eyeball. Each story that we tell is a fragment of an endless shape-shifting mosaic. And then they show you this weird hallway of like library books or something like that. And what this reminded me is that movie where that girl and that astronaut go into the Tesseract out in space or whatever it was. Um, I forgot the name of the movie. Maybe somebody in the chat can help me out. But they, they go through a Tesseract that looks exactly like this part in the movie. Perhaps we will wither and fade away. Yes, the stories, the jinn, the giants, the monsters, the kings and queens, uh, the superheroes and supervillains, all of these things have faded away into fantasy and television and commercials and fiction. People don't believe them anymore because they can't see them with their own eyes because the conditions of our world have changed. But when those conditions change back, when they flip and they go back to the old ways, people will be quite shocked maybe even physically. He is calcifying, essentially, okay? This is kind of like a personification of your pineal gland, okay? Why he is turning into stone or why he is turning into rock has something to do with these electromagnetic fields that he was listening to and showed her earlier. All of these frequencies, radio waves, 5G, 4G, cell phone towers, etc. He says, I can push them away. I, I, can, I can get rid of them. I will overcome them. I can do that for you. She sends him away because he can't actually live with her or he's going to die because of all of that electro electromagnetic interference from modern technology all over the place. Um, it dissipates it. It has an effect on him and it kills him. So years down the line, she starts to write a book about her experiences. We could take a quick look at it. Stage one, electromagnetic waves, electromagnetic gin. You see that right there? Truth in movies. They, they, people say that, oh, they're hiding it in plain sight. No, you're just blind. I, I mean, I'll be honest. I've been blind for a long time and I'm still blind to many things, but I'm not going to blame it on somebody else. I'm not going to say, oh, they're hiding it right in front of me. No, I'm blind. That's really what that is, right? I need to open my eyes. Stage three, organic particles. Stage four, the formation of organs. What this is describing is exactly what the Bible describes when it talks about creation. It says, but it says that those things that are physical and seen come from those things that are invisible and unseen. So here on this side of it, we have the creation of physical organs, the seen, the physical world. On this side, at the beginning, it starts off as electromagnetic waves, electromagnetic waves. It also says here that the people had to make sacrifices to protect the Aztec from the infinite night right? That if they did these human sacrifices on a regular basis to keep the population low, that they would not have to go through what they called the infinite night. Now, the movie actually kicks off by zooming into a coffee machine and this particular part that says, enjoy a cup of fresh coffee. I have noticed this a lot in the movies. Have you noticed this too? Okay, they always have some kind of a coffee scene just with generic coffee. They never give coffee brands like shout outs and stuff like that. They might have product placement or whatever, but typically when they spotlight a coffee, it's just generic regular coffee and they really push drinking coffee in the movies. They're really recommending like, hey, I mean, they throw this in your face. The first thing that you see is this. I didn't zoom in on this. They zoomed in on this. Enjoy a cup of fresh coffee. I think that's really interesting. Everything is awesome as long as you're drinking coffee every day, multiple times a day. There's something wrong there, right? Like in Free Guy, this is the main picture, like the, the movie, the movie uh, poster. 
generic, regular old coffee, right? He gets in line, gets his coffee and stuff. This is from Encanto. There's one of the kids that they highlight time and time again. He's just constantly drinking coffee, right? All of, all of the time. It's kind of like the Got Milk commercials. Remember those? They were not commercials. This should be mind blowing to many people. They were not commercials for any brand of milk, right? Usually the brands want to sell their brand to other, and there should be competition between the milk industries, just like, just like other things, right? Um, but there's not, they don't, they don't advertise a brand. They just want the general population to drink milk. Like, do you, Hey, do you have milk? I'm drinking milk. And they do all these milk mustache commercials and stuff. Same thing with the coffee, right? They just want you and me the world's population to get it in our heads. We need to drink cow milk and we drink, need to drink coffee over and over again. So it makes me wonder why. Uh, it's interesting because as I'm wondering why, the one of the first things they say is it's hormonal. So maybe it has something to do with changing our hormones. So this girl comes up and says Stockholm went south. Now, Stockholm is in Sweden in the north. Here's a map of it, right? Now, if Stockholm goes south, then it would look like this. To me, this is, uh, I pick up on what's being laid down as like a, a reference to the polarity shift, right? Whenever North becomes South and South becomes North, Stockholm went South. Now what they're doing is they're competing with those other places around the world that make these sacrifices to their gods. If they succeed, it means the sacrifice was successful. If they don't succeed, it means that the people, um, who were put into those sacrificial situations, as you'll see, that those people overcame, that those people did not succumb to sin or transgression or doing wrong or evil, that they remained positive and good. And so they overcame those trials. And these people failed at providing their sacrifice to uh, keep the population low and keep those those titans from reemerging. Then he says, I'm going to pick up some uh, power drills and liberate my cabinets. Another another hint for liberating the, the box or opening the box or Pandora's box, which the, all the monsters come out of, right? And that brings us to the beginning of the movie. This movie plays off of a lot of other scary movies and horror movies where there's the woods, specifically a magical wood or enchanted wood or haunted wood, stuff like that. And I feel like there's a good reason for that. Now, the word cabin, um, they don't know the origin of the word cabin. So I did some more extra research. And I found that it is likely that it's related to the word cap instead of cab, right? That the P sound turned into a B sound over time. It says that the word cap means bowl or a cup, right? So cab on means somebody from a bowl or from a cup or from a crater or something that's similar like that, right? Or from a valley, you could say. Uh, here's a map of the North Pole. So I believe that symbolically this movie sort of taking place... Um, the, we're going to have some people that are basically going on a trek to the North Pole, which is represented by the cabin in the woods, right? I feel like um, my, research, my, my research indicates to me that this land that once existed at the North Pole that was put on many of our ancient maps, um, that it's a valley land, it's surrounded by mountains, and on the inside, it's described traditionally as being a lush garden paradise, a.k.a a forest. And if it's filled with energy, a magic forest, right? And if it has access to the inner earth, a magic forest full of strange creatures. Now he says, uh, we have a lake and a cake, no more learning. So they have a lake and a cake. So they're going to this place where there's a lake. There's always a lake in these types of places, uh, most notably Camp Crystal Lake, right? And this right here. And you know what else I've noticed too? A lot of times when they put these wacko out there conspiracy theorists into these movies, they always have them like basically predicting what's going to happen throughout the movie and, and a, a lot of foreshadowing and stuff. And they have access to like knowledge that comes true. The conspiracy theorists are, are starting to become right in these movies. And the girl's trying to find the cabin, right? They're using GPS and she goes, it doesn't even show up on the GPS. This place that they're going to is off the map, right? So oftentimes when it's off the map, it's a reference to mythical lands or legendary places that are no longer placed onto the maps, either because they've been destroyed or, or something through a cataclysm, or they're just being hidden. Now he says, uh, this is the whole issue. Right, they're they're talking in the van or whatever, and this guy's like, "Hold on, let me tell you what the problem is," and she's like, "Is society crumbling, Marty?" See, it's this is they they like him at like he's a puppy, 
okay? They don't respect or appreciate his intellect and the reasoning behind the things that he's saying. They just think that he's like this cute little tag-along comic relief kind of a character, right? Not taking him seriously. Is society crumbling? And uh, then he says, society needs to crumble, like we've talked about. He says, my cousin bought a house up there. You Did you know the original owners? Because this guy's kind of older, right? Did you know the original owners? He says, I've seen plenty come and go. Hell, I've been here since the war. And then they're like, which war? <laughs> she's, she's like, what? you've been here since the war? Which war are you talking about, right? And this guy's like, you know damn well which war. <laughs> like, no, bro, we don't know which war. The conspiracy theorist, he's like, would that be the one with like the blue and some in gray, possibly brother against brother? He says, you know damn well which war. And this is about the apocalypse. Traditionally, this war was known as the Titanomachy. This was the great war. All of our little wars in all of your little countries in my country or whatever over here, uh, they're tiny. They're nothing. They're, they're super small wars in comparison to uh, the Red Sky Wars that happen, okay? Uh, the Titanomachy, which is uh, the Hecatoneras, as you can see there, and Titans and Giants and Gods all fighting each other. Basically, it's Ragnarok. All right, so we head into the forest or into the woods, right? Same thing. Heading into the magical place, into crossing some kind of a barrier where it's no longer a regular forest. It's no longer a regular jungle or wooded area. This is a, a magical jungle. This is a, a special place and we'll, we'll talk more about it in a bit. But in these types of enchanted forests, you can expect telepathy. You can expect to be able to understand animals and they can understand you or to see mysterious creatures uh, entering into otherworldly places, portals that take you down into the earth or down the rabbit hole, so to speak, just like Alice in Wonderland. Uh, huge, gigantic cre uh, trees, flora, fauna all over the place. Um, it's a haunted forest, you know, to some. Some people are very afraid and scared and stuff because they don't know what to expect. It's kind of like Pandora when they land on Pandora, right? But look, the RV goes into the mountain. They fade off to the other side. It's actually going to come up right here. You see that? That's that's the exit. They're going to go into this tunnel that wraps around. But then the camera pans over and you see a bird fly into the picture. And that bird flies around until, whap, it runs into an electromagnetic dome, an electromagnetic barrier that keeps it out and therefore also keeps everything inside. Whatever's inside will be stuck. And as you can see, they come out the other side right there. There is a mini electromagnetic dome or barrier of energy that goes up and around that particular region right there that keeps people from coming back to the Garden of Eden once they leave, right? And here's a quote from the Colburn Bible. It says that they were removed from the Garden of Content by an, an inhalation of the divine substance and could not return because of the barrier between man and non-man. It goes on to say, those who sought to return were repulsed with a tingling ache over their bodies, which increased to severe pain as they approached. So they were driven away, right? There's a force field around it. Just like it's shown to us in many different movies that there are these force fields or energetic barriers. Uh, here's Kong, right? It looks like it's just a sky that goes on forever, but it's not. It's an electromagnetic dome. Here's the Hunger Games when she shoots her arrow up at the sky and you can see it revealing these hexagonal shapes. Um, electricity shooting out. This one quite actually shows you the eye in the sky and the blue beam shooting up to it, right? Hitting the dome. Now, we go back underground to the government people, and they're like, uh, guess how we're slowing down cognition, right? So this girl works in the chemistry department, right? They release different gases and chemicals that have an effect on us, right? Because those, those, uh, those vacationers, they represent us collectively, all right? And what the government people do is that they release these, to these toxins and these gases and these chemicals, and they put stuff in our products and stuff in order to purposefully manipulate our thoughts. So what she's saying is they're slowing down their ability to think rationally, reasonably, logically, right? And, and to be coherent about things uh, by putting chemicals in the stuff that they use. In the original Batman movie, right? Uh, they had Joker brand pot products. Joker got on TV and he was laughing because people all around the world started dying and developing this crazy hysterical laughing plague, which is another part of the plasma apocalypse with the nitrous oxide and stuff. 
Um, but th these Joker brand products, and he's like, chances are you've bought them already. <laughs> like he's he's he put his special chemicals and all these various different products in the Batman movie, so that when combined, different products would actually increase whatever the effect was and accelerate death. They have a bet on how they're going to die because they actually are, are in charge of how they die. They choose uh, what type of an apocalyptic event they will go through. I'll show you that in just a second. But he says it's post time. Post is a reference to the beam, right? Uh, to the sky ropes, to the sky beams, to the columns to, and pillars, etc. right? It's the post time. That's why they show you the postman and stuff like that so often. Either the postman is the savior or the postman is a sacrifice, right? In the movies, because it represents that beam of energy that shoots out for an age or an eon and then retracts. So he starts collecting bets on how they're going to die. Now, here's what I was talking about with the wolf reference to Mount Maru. Now this girl is about to make out with this wolf, right? There's a lot of wolf references. Mount Maru is known as the split mountain. It's a plasma volcano. I refer to it as a plasma volcano. Um, it's, seen, it's said to be a high and lofty, steep mountain cliff uh, with an opening at the top, which is basically volcanic. Um, but it's also said to be split as well, right? Um, and if you think about it, if the earth actually grows and that's the time when it, it's allowed to get bigger and if it grows from the middle, it stands to reason that Mount Maru would split, which sometimes, depending on how you look at it, could be cartoonified as a wolf looking up towards the moon, which settles directly over the North Pole. We've talked about that in some of my other Plasma Apocalypse videos, uh, some theories that I have about the true origin of the real moon instead of the hologram that we see in the sky. All right, here's some other references to the same split mountain. We've got uh, The Legend of Zelda. There's various video games that show you the split mountain references. This is not common. I've, I don't see a lot of mountains split directly in half wherever I go. Not that they don't exist, but it's not super common. But they're starting to put them and they're popping up all over the place. This one's from Encanto. Again, another Encanto reference with the split mountain there too. You can see this one on Skull Island in Kong. Skull Island is another perfect example of how the movies portray uh, the island at the North Pole. Right, This Skull Island is surrounded by a constant storm, just like the stories of the North Pole are, are said to be. Uh, this one is from Hunter x Hunter, and they're all checking it out. And they all just are about to touch. Now, whatever they touch in, in the basement of this cabin, that becomes their apocalypse, right? Which reminded me of the Ghostbusters, uh, like at the end, the Ghostbusters, the, the Ghostbusters face off against Gozer and Ghost, Gozer says, choose the destroyer or whatever. And, um, basically whatever they thought of, that's how the, that's how they would see the world coming to an end, right? So this is a similar form of that, right? The world's going to come to an end collectively, right? Or let's say that it does. Let's just say that there's the plasma apocalypse, the world depressurizes, all that stuff that I talk about happens, right? Every culture, every individual within those cultures will flavor the apocalypse and describe it afterwards, should they survive, in story form. They're going to describe it through their own perspective, which is a filter, and all of us have different filters. So you're going to have different stories from different perspectives that over time become cartoonified based on how we see these things. We choose the destroyer. Once they read the Latin and they choose the form of the destroyer, down underground, those government, gov the government people, they start celebrating because they're like, yes, boom, step one is done. Our sacrifice is on, well on the way. And it's the Buckners. The family name is the Buckners for the zombies. So they show you this whiteboard that they have of all of the possible outcomes that are down there in the basement. They're like something from a nightmare, right? That's something that many of you probably would say, right? If you're looking at zombies and witches and warlocks and aqua men and all kinds of weird stuff, right? You might think it's like it's from a nightmare, but this girl that works there corrects him quickly. She says, no, they're something nightmares are from. These are cartoonifications of the reality. She says everything in our stable or underground compartment is remnant of the old world. So what do we just get from the movies? If the movies are giving us a little breadcrumb of truth, they're telling you every single thing that I read to you on that list has an element of truth to it, that those things do exist. Maybe not in the forms that we associate them with because of cartoonification over ages, but they do exist. All right. So uh, Thor steps up, Chris Hemsworth, and he's like, no matter what happens, we have to stay together. 
<laughs> whatever, that's my best impression. And then like two seconds later, they just spritz him with some of that Joker brand product or whatever. And he's like, the, the this isn't right. We should split up. So this guy in the middle is like, really? Are you serious? You, you just literally said we should stick together. Right, and then he gets spritzed with that spray or whatever. Now this guy goes back to his to his room and he finds a, a hidden camera and a wire that goes around his room. And he's like, "What the hell?" He's looking into the hidden camera, and these guys downstairs are like, "Oh, that's not good. He's found some hidden cameras. This is not a good idea, right?" He's starting to get in. He's starting to catch on to us. Uh, the zombie pulls him through the window just then. He gets pulled back into the backwoods and it looks like he's killed. He's actually not killed, but they, they believe that he's dead because he was pulled underground. You see blood squirting up and stuff. We'll come back to that. Meanwhile, in Japan, they're trying their hardest to perform some human sacrifices using this crazy Japanese girl from the ring or whatever this is. And instead, all of the kids stop being afraid. They come together, they hold hands, they create an electrical arc around this negative entity and they infuse it with positivity. <laughs> this guy's pissed. So now, because Jap Japan lost, there's only one country left that is able to continue this human sacrifice or whatever. Now, the pressure's on for this underground in you know agency to to perform their ritual the number was a letter which was a glyph which was a picture so the number eight was a picture of something this is the picture it was a gate it was a boundary sometimes it looks like a ladder it was a i think originally maybe it was actually sideways um, but our writing started to flip over time with probably matching the polarity reversals of our world but anyways, here you can see the number eight, right? And you can see how it still kind of retains its sort of ape, uh, letter eight shape at first, right? And it, it represents a wall or something that divides. It represents a barrier, a gate, or a boundary. <laughs> Boom! So he's flying across and smashes right into the same thing that the hawk smashed into earlier. You like how I made a move? That was fun. All right, so he smashes totally into the dome. This is the most epic part of the movie. And she says, you figured out everything. She's starting to be a little humble, right? But here's, here's the thing, she's too humble. Right At first, she's basically saying, you know nothing because you're just a pot smoking conspiracy theorist. You know what I mean? But then whenever she finds out that some of the things he says add up, she's like, oh, you've, you've got it all figured out. Listen to his response. No, no, not at all. Not at all. I mean, I, but I do know some stuff. So that's, that's the honesty behind that, right? We're, we're jacks of different trades, right? Just because we might be right on... Uh, right on the money with, with this thing or that thing. It doesn't mean we know everything. It just means we're good at knowing certain things. They jump into this elevator and it's got glass walls on either side of it. So you can actually see what's on the other side. It's really dark while the elevator is moving. And all of a sudden it starts moving and they see something on the other side of the glass and it's a werewolf. Now I have given my thoughts on about the werewolves. I actually did a whole werewolf um, and vampire video, which we might come back to someday. But I have a theory that werewolves are directly related to the elven race, that they are just old elves, that they might be uh, older versions of the elves themselves. Collectively, we're gonna see all of these things. The ghost is electromagnetic energy, right? All of that plasma and stuff that comes into our world will be trapped in our world, right? Um, after the electromagnetic barrier goes back up and we will have certain days of the year where you'll have a uh, really strong electromagnetic energy and you'll see spirits, you'll see ghosts all over the place. We actually have holidays to, commemor to, to commemorate those times and those events. Now, one of them is around Easter time, known as uh, Pentecost, and another one is around Halloween. All right, then we got this guy, this sadomasochistic dude who kind of looks like Pinhead or something like that. This is, I'm going to go down a rabbit hole on this one, so I hope you're ready. Take a good look at this guy. Let's zoom in on him real quick. So let's point out some things. One, he's got a puzzle box. This is Pandora's box. It's not actually cubical, but boxes don't need to be cubical. Box just means container. This is a puzzle box and you have to open it up in order to uh, change the world or to unleash some sort of evil spirits or monsters or some sort of calamity upon the world. It's the same thing as Pandora's box, right? This is also seen in that movie Glass Onion, um, Knives Out or whatever it's called, right? Where they all start off with puzzle boxes and stuff like that. Very similar uh, symbolism happening here. Now, this guy also is wearing leather 
and he seems to feel no pain. So, for example, Hellraiser, my question is why? Why on so many different levels? Well, let's let's address different levels. One, the pasty whiteness, right? You see that pasty white skin? That is reminiscent of those phantazoids that are bipedal that come down, or not just bipedal, all of the phantazoids in general. Um, the descriptions I've gone over indicate that they're white, basically, right? And these these alien creatures from other worlds tend to dress similarly. They tend to be very pale white skinned, right? Dark eyes. They wear dark clothing and stuff. They have, you know, some sort of an association with electric electricity, electrical powers, uh, uncle fester, you know, putting that light bulb in his mouth and stuff like that. I'm going to get back to that guy in just a second. All right. So coming back to Hellraiser, just real quick or pinhead, I should say. So these priests are called Cenobites and Let's talk about them real quick. Why do they have pins all over their heads, right? Some people could just make the case they just like pain. So why not? You're just putting all those pins in your head. He just likes pain. He's evil. You know what I mean? Yes, on the surface, that's one thing. But on the, but if you put on the plasma apocalypse glasses, right, you can see that these are clearly the killer count clowns from outer space, right? Uh, the Anunnaki beings or whatever that were a pure white that came down or whatever. And they were seen as these scary figures. Now he's putting metal all the way around his head. Let's say that it's not in his set, his head, but let's say it's on his head. Okay. So that it's, it's not actually causing him pain. It could be, okay. It's just a movie or whatever, but let's speculate if it was real. Why would something do that? Why would an entity do that? What is the purpose behind that aside from just causing pain because I like pain and I'm evil or just scaring people? And also, why do they always wear leather or leathery looking outfits, right? Dark, leathery looking outfits, right? They sort of remind me of like biker gangs and stuff like that. Um, which brings me to weird science. Weird Science has a mutant biker gang that rolls on through and the same same bald-headed white dude, you know, uh, this is from the movie Mandy. They also have some sort of mutant biker game that, gang that has spikes, you know, in different places on their outfits or sometimes they look kind of shiny or, or weird. This guy clearly has a long collar that goes all the way up protecting his neck. I think that the whole collar thing came from... Um, these beings from other worlds are not used to our point of focus. They're not used to the sunlight. So when the sun starts to come out, they're not used to it. And we might actually, now that I think of it, we might not even be used to, to, to the sun or to the point of focus appearing in the sky for quite some time once the sky turns red. But they put up their, they pop their collars. Right? That's why you got Dracula with the pop collar. That's, that's why I got pasty white people with popped collars in royalty and stuff like that. They're keeping the sun off of them because it was hurting them. It was burning them, right? Uh, they had umbrellas and stuff like that to keep sunlight off of them. It's very similar things. This guy, also another mutant biker guy from the movie Mandy, right? Look at all these spikes coming out of him. Isn't that interesting? What's that remind you of? What does he look like right there? I bet if you ask someone who is of the Hopi tribe, they would probably say that he reminds them of a Kachina doll. That's kind of what that reminds me of. The Kachinas were the gods that came down and they were they were portrayed in interesting and similar ways with weird getups and outfits that had feathers or spikes or stuff sticking out of them, right? Here's an actual outfit that somebody had found in a museum display, this is like an, an sort of an artistic museum display, and it's showing you like lost things that, that this collector has found over his lifespan or whatever. One of them is this strange jacket. Now, some people have made the case or tried to say that this is for wrestling bears or hunting bears or something like like people would put this on and just go fight a bear or whatever. I don't think so. OK, I'm very much not. I'm not going with this as a bear hunting outfit or whatever. I think this is a real outfit that somebody probably wore and made, right? Um, and online, people say it's like a bear hunting outfit or whatever, but it's eerily similar to the things that we see like biker gangs and other people wearing. I mean, I'm not picking on biker gangs or anything, but there's a reason why they wear leather. There's a reason why they have spikes, metal spikes sticking out of them, right? Wearing these jackets with spikes that stick out into the air. You have to remember, this is these things come from a different time. In the world that we live in today, it's not super useful. But in a red sky world inundated with electromagnetic activity all over the place where you're going to be on a uh, a motorcycle or something cause like building up all kinds of static electricity as you're flying through the air. 
Let's ask the question, does, does leather attract electricity? Normally, leather does not generate static electricity, right? Uh, how about lightning rods, right? Because that's what basically these spikes are. So they put on leather jackets, leather outfits, leather leggings, and all this leather stuff because it doesn't create uh, static electricity or generate static electricity when they're flying through an electrified field in the world to come. So now it's starting to make sense why they dress the way that they do, right? How about those spikes? Let's take a look at this. Basically, they're lightning rods, right? I feel like people have not learned the correct interpretation of how a lightning rod works and and what it is actually what it actually does. So I'm going to teach you that. So there, before we get into lightning rods, I want to share this interesting little tidbit with you. There used to be something called lightning rod fashion. Here's an example of a guy with an umbrella with a lightning rod on it right? Okay. Um, lightning rod fashion was a fad in the late 18th century Europe after the lightning rod invented by Benjamin Franklin was introduced. Lightning rod hats for ladies and lightning umbrellas for gentlemen were most popular in France, especially in Paris. So the question is, if a rod if a lightning rod is said to attract lightning so that it doesn't hit the house or whatever it is that people say, why in the world would you put a lightning rod on your umbrella or on your hat? It's because lightning rods do not attract lightning. I want to be very clear with this, okay? Because I feel like we've been taught the exact opposite, that lightning rods are trying to attract the lightning so that it doesn't hit other things or whatever. Yes, a lightning rod can be hit by lightning, but it's much less likely, right? I'll, sh I'll show you why here in just a sec. Now they're putting lightning rods on all this stuff. So these bikers, they're putting spikes on their jackets and their helmets and all kinds of stuff, right? So here's how a lightning rod works, right? It is to minimize lightning strikes, not to increase them. So here's what happens. Um, on this, uh, under the cloud, you have this negative charge. Around this metallic rod, it generates a charge, a positive charge. It starts to go up and what it does is it neutralizes uh, the field or the area between the cloud and the house. It neutralizes it so that there's no electrical buildup, right? Without that neutralization, it would build up. Now, whenever the charge above overwhelms the amount of uh, positive energy that's coming up from the, the lightning rod, then you can get a lightning strike, but it has to be overwhelmingly charged above, basically, right? So you want like a big lots of steeples or big steeples or really sharp uh, steeples or steeples that are made out of very conductive materials, et cetera, to minimize those lightning strikes. Here's another example, right? It's not just a rod. It's not just a metal piece. It's spikes. It spikes. They put these spikes all over the place because it creates a larger field, a, a larger protective barrier that will neutralize the atmosphere, uh, taking away their chances of being hit by lightning. So it stands to reason that if you're flying on your motorcycle in the post-apocalypse through an electromagnetic, uh, electromagnetically charged environment or, or uh, atmosphere, you're going to put on your helmet that has your little lightning rods on top so you don't get popped and zapped in the head. You're also going to put on your leather and stuff so you don't build up static electricity on your ride, right? This is apply this stuff to the old conditions instead of the current conditions. And then sometimes it'll start to make sense. It's also one of the reasons why on the old troops, they put, um, you know, they put spikes on their helmets and stuff like that. This is, this has nothing to do with intimidation. That's not intimidating. It looks kind of dumb to me personally. I'm not scared of this dude. What is he going to do? Ram me? He's going to charge me or something. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's not practical. It's not practical for fighting. It's not practical for intimidation. It's not practical for uses in war and stuff like that. It is practical for safety reasons so that they can keep their generals and stuff safe when they're out there on the battlefield in an electrically charged environment. Then you see a unicorn, a unicorn, a mythical unicorn, just boom, running through the hallway, right? Why would that be a nightmare creature? Well, <laughs> unicorns weren't always the nicest of creatures. However, I will tell you this. There are some phantozoids that come from other places and land here in our world that the legends indicate that they could read chakras or auras or they could read people's energy. And when they saw somebody with bad energy, they tend, the stories say that they would attack them. They would ram them. They would kill them. Um, and I believe that the unicorn is probably no exception being that it is shown on ancient bestiaries, which was actually legitimate dictionaries of animal life that people chronicled 
right? Time and time again, unicorns are in there. Not like they're mythic creatures, not like, oh, these might be real. Hey, hey, you know, it'd be fun, you know, as we're commissioned by God to write this stuff in a book and to tell the truth to people or commissioned by the king and the queen under penalty of death or whatever it may be. They don't write lies in these books. They don't just write make-believe stories and stuff. They're putting their real history in as they knew it at the time. It was accepted. Um, and oftentimes you'll see this particular image of a unicorn that was, it was, um, it's a setup, basically. They would have somebody with good energy go out and, and attract the unicorn, somebody who is pure of heart and, and, and whatnot. And the unicorns would be attracted to that. They would, they would like the people who are pure. Now, I'd like to imagine that the virgin over here that attracted the unicorn didn't know what was going to happen because once they have the unicorn lay down in their lap and they fall asleep or whatever, there's always some bad guy who comes in and kills the unicorn. I'm calling him a bad guy. I don't know. I think it's kind of mean or whatever. And then also you'll notice this weird giant asparagus looking plant in a lot of these be uh, bestiaries. I think that that's uh, post-apocalyptic flora. Basically, I think that our plants start to change and adapt to their new environments. They grow way bigger and they start to look, it starts to look like we live in a Dr. Seuss book or something. Here, see, there's a good example there too of the guy who's about to smash the unicorn who is lured away by the virgin. Here's another one where the unicorn's actually happy and not hurting anybody and they're dancing in the forest and having a good time. Here's another one, which is kind of sad, where the virgin's bringing back the head of the unicorn because people hunted these creatures, okay? There's a reason why they're mythic and legendary. We killed them all, okay? Mostly, some of them, I don't know. I, I don't want to be absolute and be like, we killed them all. Um, so I'll take that back. But many of them, according to the records, were hunted down and exterminated, to the point where after a few hundred years, people forgot that they ever even existed. And they're like, that's not real. I've never seen one. Well, guess what? They drew pictures and they wrote it down in books for you to read and check out so that you can know what happened during those times. The ancient gods. And then he says, but what if you don't pull it off? Like, what if you can't keep the population low? What if you can't sacrifice people or whatever? Then they rise. Who does, right? Who rises? As long as they accept our sacrifice, they remain below. So this is really interesting how this is sort of has some modern day correlations to it. Maybe that's the way it should be, he says, right? He's all for a reset. He's all about it. He's like, humanity sucks. You guys had your try. Uh, you failed. You're not doing too great. The world's a crazy place. It's upside down. Maybe it's, maybe we're overdue, you know, maybe it's time for a change. This movie starts off and they show you the forest, right? They're talking about this magical forest where the trees are never cut down, where there's these legends of witches and old wives tales and myths and legends and stuff like that. Now, they say that this town, this forest area, is called Arkham. Now, that's key because Ark means a bow or to arc or to arch or the arch. And I believe every time I see that, that that's in reference to the arc of our world or the arch of the world and also electrical arcing. This particular town is called Arkham. Ham is short for like hamlet or town, like a small town or something. Now, check this out. They show you the view from inside the well, looking up. You will see this. I, I, I don't know how to find similar images of this particular camera angle, but I see this camera angle all of the time in movies. We showed it a couple of times during a, a couple of our last movie breakdowns as well. Why is that important? Because they show you the perspective from inside of the plasma volcano, right? You can go inside of it. You could jump inside of it and it becomes basically a cave because gravity flips around towards the wall and you walk on the inner wall, uh, which is really interesting. So they show you the perspective from inside of it, right? So his sister's like, what are you looking at, Jack Jack? And he says, dad said if you look long enough, you can see the stars down there. Interesting. And he says that he does see stars down there too. So does he see stars as in our stars that we see when we look up? Possibly. He could be looking at the reflection of the stars during the nighttime in the water or something along those lines, or he could actually see little lights dancing about down there that he interprets as stars. 
I believe that the plasma volcano is full of light, especially what many would perceive to be um, lightning bugs or ball lightning or lanterns floating about, all kinds of things, right? Because it's highly electromagnetically charged. Nick Cage is the dad. By the way, Nick or Nicholas means victory, right? So Nick Cage means victory cage. Or Nicholas is victory cage of the people or the people's victory cage, right? What's a victory cage? A victory cage is a Faraday cage. It protects you from the plasma as it strikes or lightning as it strikes. And it keeps you safe and enables you to survive. That is the victory cage. So everybody's cool, by the way. They're all eating dinner. They're having a good time. Everybody's laughing. They're smiling. There's nothing wrong at all. It seems to be like a normal, slightly dysfunctional family or whatnot, right? And then the dad says, then just wait till you try the alpaca meat next year. Alpaca is the llama. Interesting, right? He says, then you'll know what heaven is. Oh, there's another, there's another space or heavenly reference to the llamas, right? Esoteric reference to the llamas. And the llamas having some sort of a connection with the heavens or space above. He says, because they're the animal of the future, remember? Those Mayans knew what they were about. They say we're living the dream. That's how good things are. This is how the movie starts off. We're living the dream. We've got this cabin in the woods. Everything's great. We're living the dream. His, his dog starts whining, right? The dog starts getting kind of agitated and he says, it's okay, good boy, Sam. And he says, oh, you're not interested in the black hole, Sam? He's talking to his dog because he's researching space stuff. He says, oh, you're not interested in the black hole? They put that in the script because there is a black hole that opens up in our sky that sucks everything up into it. And that's what he's looking at. And the, he mentions that because they're telling you that's what this movie is about. Don't believe me? Here's their house. Look right above it. Do you see this little outline of magenta, like a little crescent right there? Well, guess what appears high above their house? So in the middle of the night, this is the plasma apocalypse, day one. All right, so as you can see, the light around everyone starts to turn a bright magenta. The dog loses his mind and starts becoming vicious. Why do, why do the animals turn vicious? Because that plasma, the red or the, the to this world, is essentially spirit that is programmed or energy that is programmed to kill. So it possesses many things. It possesses animals all over the place. Um, I'm sure the insects are, are also susceptible to uh, plasma possession and especially the human beings. So this is uh, this right here is the story of Cujo, Pet Cemetery, and the like. So now they show the plasma in the barn. This is the color you can expect to see. This is the color out of space, the color that comes down from above, from the heavens. This is the glory of the Lord if you're um, a religious person. So they show the daughter, she's sleeping, her room lights up magenta, she shows the brother. Now look at the brother. I want to point something out here. Plasma does, electromagnetics does interesting things to various people in various situations. In this example, this kid is looking down at the keyboard, not at his screen. And if I zoomed in, you would actually see spit dripping down off of his lip. He is zoned out. And that's one of the things that can happen with electromagnetics. It can zone you out. And then the, here's the little boy, the youngest one, right? The plasma comes in and what does he do? Man, kids are so smart. The simplest things. Don't look at it. Cover your eyes, right? See no evil. Just like hear no evil. Now, if he would have done the hear no evil part, he wouldn't have lost his hearing like he does here in a minute. Boom. There's a huge boom, right? Right? And then all of a sudden there's this like brain looking plasma rock that's, you know, looks like a, an asteroid that landed in their front yard or something, right? Check this out. They don't acknowledge this in the movie, but Nicolas Cage is the only one that smells this terrible smell that's coming from this, this uh, thing that came out of the sky, right? The kid was the only one who was affected with his hearing loss, right? So they're just, they're, they're choosing out examples of the family to represent portions of humanity. A portion of the people will experience hearing loss for various times or various amounts of times. A portion of the people will experience no taste or distorted taste, right? Um, I think I actually have a picture in here somewhere for it, uh, but basically 
remember how I talk about the nitrous oxide clouds that develop during the reset and that those, you know, fly through different cities and stuff like that. If you have one of those nitrous oxide clouds, clouds hit you, there's a lot of different things that can happen. One, you'll get very giggly and laughing because it's, it's laughing gas. But another thing, like byproduct of laughing gas is that it changes your taste buds and even your smell, your senses of smell. This can also happen to you if you get shocked in the wrong way and it, it can affect your brain and it can tell your brain that you're smelling something that you're not, right? So he's the only one, Nicolas Cage is the only one who smells it. And I can tell you from my research, the smell that he's describing sounds like it's brimstone, Okay, so the brimstone, when they talk about fire and brimstone from the heavens and stuff, that's what he's smelling. And he says, there was this boom. That was the depressurization of your world, Nicolas Cage. And it was like like a sonic boom. So this, is, this was a really, really loud boom. When this happens, you, everyone will know it all at one time. Windows may uh, explode outwards. I'm not sure how that works, if they implode or they explode, but uh, many windows will just be gone. Um, people may lose their hearing. They may experience a loud ringing in their ears. Um, you probably have to like do like, like do like you do when you're on the airplane or when you're driving to really high altitudes to pop your ears. That will help you. That will help to actually save your ears from being destroyed. And he says, and there was a big flash, like a pink light. And then everything just blew up or fell from the sky. Isn't that interesting, right? It wasn't really just everything that fell from the sky. It was just that rock in the movie. So why'd they say everything fell from the sky, right? Blew up or fell from the sky. So then he asks, the other guy asks about his cat. And he says, you might see her, but I don't think you'll recognize her. Why not? Because his cat is plasma possessed. Just like in Pet Cemetery, his cat got zapped by the plasma and it is... It's a killer cat now, basically. How do we know? I'm going to show you in a minute. So they show you a scene. All the fog starts to roll in. They show the fog because when the world depressurizes, the atmosphere expands and creates instant fog worldwide. Here's his cat. <laughs> that is his cat. See how the eyes are literally lights, right? They're beings of light. If your spirit is on overdrive like that, you will be and look like and appear to others as a being of light, a light being so here's the cat super plasma possessed ready to kill anything in its path it's all <laughs> uh, here's a boy and his dog the boy and the dog are just chilling there waiting the plasma shows up and the next thing you know Cujo comes out the dog is like Rrr. why not just because he's protecting his you know the kid or whatever but this is this brings out the worst in animals Alfred Hitchcock knew it and he did the movie birds when the, all the world's birds just suddenly became malevolent serial killing birds, right? Same thing. Now the brother meets up with his sister, the witch, and he's like, this is going to sound kind of crazy, but I kind of got lost out there. You know, it was like one second it was daytime and all of a sudden it was dark, like so dark. I couldn't even see the house. He is describing the events of the plasma apocalypse. At one moment, it will be daylight for many of you out there. Middle of the day, sunlight, everything. And then all of a sudden, bzzz, light goes out. Electricity all goes off. The sun turns off. It will be very difficult to see. And then the depressurization will make a, a thick darkness. Excuse me, thick darkness out of it. She picks up the phone. She listens to the static hotline. 1-800-PLASMA. Now, the dad and the mom come back from the hospital and the dad starts flipping out and losing it. Like I said, anything can set a person off when they're possessed, when they're plasma possessed and they have lost control. It's like it's like a darkness just comes all the way around their peripheral vision and they can only focus on that one thing that's upsetting them and they get hyped up super fast. They'll hype themselves up real quick. He says, what's wrong with you two? You know, oh, when the cat's away, the mice will play. And now the dad's acting way out of character from when they initially showed him as being a loving father, you know, good family and stuff. Everyone's going to start to freak out. And I mean, in a really bad way. And then the girl's like, no, there was this sound and then I got sick. Now, here's another thing. Electromagnetism can cause people to get nauseous. Did you know that? Vibrations, depending on the vibration and the person, it can actually make people throw up and get very sick to their stomach. 
uh, especially if they're in a strong electromagnetic field or something. She says, Dad, I tried. He says, what do you mean you tried? This is Nick Cage classic freaking out. I love all of his movies. We'll probably do more. <laughs> um, what do you mean freaking out? You tried? You tried? What the fuck are you talking about? And then he starts cursing, right? Boom. If this was Friday the 13th, the second he says the F word, you would hear... <laughs> I swear. Oh, and then he's like, what are, you, what are you talking about? And she says the plasma is they, them, or it. It. Anytime you hear those two letters of it, and it's got something to do with horror or sci-fi or fantasy or something like that, oftentimes it's referencing the plasma. People don't know how to describe it. So they just call it, it. And they're terrified of it. Which is actually why, now that I'm saying the word it so much, in Monty Python's uh, Search for the Holy Grail, which is Monty Python just going to the plasma volcano or the, the Cave of Saviors, um, they meet the knights who say ni, right? And whenever they, whenever they say it, that's the only word that scares these huge, weird, phanazoid knight creatures in the movie. They're scared of the word it. Why? Because that's what it is, is the plasma above. It's the holy power, or whatever you want to call it. it says, so, so do me a favor and get the fuck out of my side, okay? Classic Nick Cage. <laughs> because we need to get... Oh, then she's, then she's like, we need to get the hell out of here. Now, this is a recommendation, okay? This is advice from whoever wrote the movie. You need to get out of here. So Nick Cage goes into his shower, and he sees he's starting to develop some weird rash on his arm. Essentially, he's getting um, leprosy, right? Now, the fires of God and, and, uh, and the heavens and the gods themselves have been known to be able to give people who don't live up to their expectations leprosy. That's one of the very first diseases that gods hand out. Here, have some leprosy, right? So then he reaches down, he picks up this weird jelly thing, and it sprouts these tentacles that wrap around his fingers, and he, flee he freak freaks out, just like I would too. But he freaks out. He's like, oh my God, this represents the plasma. Jelly, um, anything that is jelly form is representative of plasma itself. It could be other things too, but that's where the word plasm comes from. It's plastic. It's malleable. It's impressionable. It's something that has no shape on its own. It just conforms to whatever shape it's around. This will make our plants sprout up and be huge and gigantic. And there'll be all kinds of food. You know, once the, once the plants do grow back, there'll be a garden world again. And this is what it's showing you. You can kind of see the leprosy on his arm. I have a better picture of that. And then his wife walks in and they're both get plasma possessed. This is crazy. And you may know people, you may have even been through this before. This scenario, notice the red and the blue there. But uh, she comes in, he's calm and cool. He's like, yeah, I got gigantic tomatoes, life's good. She comes in, her internet's down, she's pissed off. She starts yelling at him. You have got to do something about that dish. You can feel it. It's, uh, I can almost feel the temperature in this house getting hotter when I watch these scenes when people start getting themselves all pumped up, right? So then he's not even listening to her. He takes a big bite out of the tomato and spits it out. He's like, uh, bleh, what? Ah, you know, I did everything I'm supposed to do. I did everything I'm supposed to do and they still fucking taste like shit. So you know what? You know what? And then he like tosses it away and throws it. At, and he just makes it. He just goes Nick Cage crazy, right? He's not listening to his wife who's also upset and hyping herself up. He's upset because these beautiful ripe uh, fruits that he just picked all taste rotten to him. Guess what? Many people have reported that when they got back from the dentist and they had nitrous oxide in order to numb them from the pain and so that they couldn't feel and stuff, many people have reported that it altered their taste buds. It made them taste like fruits and meats and other things tasted rotten. Many people have lost weight because of this. They couldn't even eat anything. Sometimes there was no taste whatsoever. Oh, I'm going to read this article to you real quick. This is what I was talking about. Uh, the patient refers in his letter, uh, was evaluated and treated for distortions of taste and smell that stated followed, uh, she stated, followed the, uh, the operation that was performed under general anesthesia. She reported all fruits, dairy products, meats, and coffee tasted and smelled spoiled or rotten.
And that's uh, you could look that up on Google. There's many different articles. That just happens to be the one I pulled up. So she's all just fix the dish, okay? Like they're not the loving couple that we saw in the beginning. Then it zooms in on his arm. Look at that. That's leprosy. It doesn't say that in the movie, but I mean that spot on looks like leprosy to me, right? So he's getting he's getting leprosy from the gods and whatnot. He's showing his true colors. This guy has a lot of issues on the inside as well. They referred to like his, his innermost father problems where he didn't, he didn't feel like he lived up to his father. He's got all kinds of inner demons. You could say, well, those inner demons come out when you're plasma possessed. Then they show this weird sculpture. Check this thing out, right? To me, that's a phantasoid. Okay. Uh, if you don't, don't, if you don't know what a phantasoid is, it's otherworldly creatures, not humanoids per se, although the humanoids are also phantasoids, um, but mostly they're creatures like animals that fall in from the space above or the heavens, you could say, right? Heavenly creatures. Anyway, here's their house now completely engulfed in plasma with a little light pyramid there. I mean, not plasma, engulfed in fog. I'm sorry. So now the house is engulfed in fog. She doesn't know what she's dealing with. She's made a little circle of candles and stuff, a little protection circle. But then she starts to cut herself. Remember, these people can't feel pain. They can't feel anything because there's probably a nitrous oxide uh, cloud. That's just one possibility, by the way. I, I put that out there because it's my favorite one. There's many things that can disrupt taste buds or um, alter your senses and things of that nature. I like the idea of the nitrous oxide clouds because it's also the laughing plague, which I like too. So the mom and the brother, the mom and her boy run away from the plasma. It's shooting towards them in this scene, right? Coming at them just like a ghost. Wow or a banshee or something, screaming its way towards them, looking at them in their predator vision in this little, uh, I call, I should call this aura vision. I'm going to call this aura vision. I believe that plasma has aura vision. I just made that up, but I think it can see your aura. So it goes after these two, bzz, shocks the heck out of them. Boom. Um, the mom is holding onto her son at this point and they get hit by the plasma itself, a direct hit from one of the larger beams of plasma. I'll show you what happens here in a minute. So then the girl walks out. She's cut herself all kinds because she's doing this blood magic and thinks that she has power because she can't feel the cuts or whatever. Bad idea. Not working. It's not going to protect her. It's not going to save her. It's not going to help her. What is that? Oh, okay. So this is hard to see, but this right here is the little boy's face. And this right here is the mom's face. The plasma merged the two of them together at the molecular level. They're merged one body, two people, right? Now, this is also something that I've picked up on in my plasma research is that plasma may have the ability to rearrange DNA. It may be able to restructure and reconstitute DNA to try to make it better. That's what it's here to do. It's here. To, it's the goal is not to come down here and just be something to be scared of, to be you know the bad guy in every movie or whatever. The goal is to come down here and fix things, because you and I all know the world's messed up. The world's bad. It's overrun by evil right now. This plasma is doing us a favor, but it also reminds me of the fly. The Jeff Goldblum movie, The Fly, whenever he goes into his little pod, it gets zapped by plasma, but there was a fly in his pod too. So the plasma merged the DNA together. It tried to make sense out of it and make it better. All right. So this is Nick Cage. Okay. These are all Nick Cage flipping out. <laughs> He's just screaming in his car, road rage that his car won't even start, right? Many of you people have seen someone like this, or this might've been you. This has been me a couple times, I'll admit. Um, which causes me to think twice, but he's just flipping out in his car. He gets out of his car. His car won't start. Why? Because something sucked the electricity out of it all night long. That would be the plasma. Now check this out. He's parked right in front of the world tree. It's, this is, this tree right here is not any random regular old tree. Let me zoom in on this in the movie. This is a still frame, but in the movie, all of these branches are slowly undulating, just kind of moving about up and down, not like a regular branch would in the wind. It looks more like tentacles when it's moving that why is that in the movie? Why they don't explain any of this, but you know, there's truth behind it. The truth is this is shooting up from the plasma volcano. This is the world tree. And that's that 
that trunk of the tree is the plasma beam that shoots up. All of the branches that are undulating off to the side like that, those are little eddies and tide pools of plasma, little turbulences um, from the main stalk. So he's like, yeah, the car is not happening. Something sucked the charge out of the battery overnight. It's like an electromagnetic field, he says. Oh, psh, boom, hits it right on the head. Home run. <laughs> Crowd goes wild. Ah, ah, I love it when the movies are blunt, direct, and they go, hmm, it could be an electromagnetic field. <laughs> That's exactly what it is. That's what we're talking about. Plasma, electromagnetics. Now, the mom and the son are merged together. This is where it gets deeply symbolic, okay? Um, can plasma merge things? I believe it can. Will it always merge everything? I don't. I very much doubt it, right? But given the right circumstances and the right situation, it probably has the potential to do that. Now, it happens to also, in merging them, turn them into a sort of fantasoid, otherworldly creature-looking thing which I'll show you here in a bit. But one of the first things that you know that they have been turned into a fantasoid, um, or the, I like to say they caught the T virus. Okay. I'll have to explain that one another time, but essentially the sunlight is hitting their flesh and their flesh starts to burn. Fantasoids cannot deal with direct sunlight, which is why they hide, which is why they're hidden out in, uh, lakes and caves and stuff like that. Like they, they weren't just hiding from humans to begin with, they were hiding from the sun itself, which is why the monsters come out at night. They are allergic to the sunlight. It will burn them. They're not from this world. They're not used to that harsh light up above like we are a little bit. I'm still not really used to it. Um, but yeah, they'll hide. That's And that's when the monsters come out. Now, this is the wife. So this is kind of gruesome, but I want to show you this because of the color of her skin. When I talk about the phantasoids being white, this is more closer to the type of white that I'm talking about. Not Caucasian, although typically they're played by Caucasians. It's easier that way. Um, but their skin is more ivory, palish, grayish, whitish, shiny, kind of slippery looking. I don't know. That's what they look like. Here's the well. Now, the boy tries to go down into the well because he thinks he hears his dog down there. Remember, this is vibration we're dealing with right? And it can mimic other vibrations or sounds. So it's mimicking the sound of the dog that it remembers. I don't know if it's to trap the boy or not. I'm not going to say that it's, 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 it's for a bad purpose. Maybe it's just, it's, you know, that's what it does. Just like a bird would do it or whatever. So the boy goes down there, the well fills up with plasma. Imagine that, right? Uh, the girl's looking down. She's like, no, no, don't go down there. The plasma comes up, boom, reaches up with little plasma tentacles, grabs the boy and pulls him down. And he falls and falls and falls. You hear him like, ah, like he disappears into a bottomless pit. And he's like, no, 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 I'm not a monster. He's trying to snap out of it, but he can't. He's trying to pull himself out of his possession, but he can't. He opens up the attic door and throws her in there with the phantasoid mom as food so the mom can eat the daughter. This dude lost his mind. He says, now go feed your mother. Boom, throws her in there. Here's the guy, here's the blue guy again with blue light all over the place. These are actually just the lights from the police car. But look how many times they associate him with this baby blue color. Interesting, right? So they're walking about trying to figure out what's going on. You can't see this. This is this is too dark for you to see, but this is a big old phantasoid, which is the what the mom used to be. She's now like a six-legged phantasoid creature about to eat the other one, right? The dad's going nuts. He's psycho. He's crazy. They walk outside. The plasma comes up out of the well, okay? Um, it comes up out of the well. They show it in all of its glory, snaking about and streaming through the air. Uh, the cop gets on the phone. He's like, oh, one Charlie seven. We've got a code 33. Interesting code 33 right next to the area for the plasma volcano, which is said to be 33 miles in circumference. And then the blue light all the way around the cop during the code 33. I believe 33 is a strong possibility for a reference to the plasma volcano or the North pole. Now they get into that, um, that guy's house, Cheech, uh, Cheech Marin's house, remember from earlier, he got zapped by the plasma. He's basically petrified or dead or something, right? And you can see it glowing in his skin. 
And he says, it's just a color. There's a recording that he made. He's like, it's just a color, but it burns. It sucks and it burns. It sucks and it burns? It sucks because it sucks people up into the sky, which is Kronos, the fatherly god that eats his children, sucks them all up into his mouth and then swallows a rock because rocks are actually made up there in the sky. And when he swallows the rock, everything floats back down. Gravity is restored and Kronos pukes out his kids. And that applies to various stories across cultures and time. So it sucks and it burns. This guy's super plasma possessed, right? The tree literally grabs the cop in some vines and sucks them up and pulls them up here. This is this blue thing right here is the cop. He got pulled up by the tree and killed by the tree. Not only can humans become plasma possessed, not only can animals and possibly insects become plasma possessed, but plants also can become plasma possessed. Uh, Keep in mind that with an influx of life means rapid growth, right? I believe many of the plants in our world will not only grow to gigantic proportions, but they'll move about in a way that we notice that we never noticed before. And that means that they'll be able, if they're big enough, to wrap around us like vines do, grab us, interact with us, talk to us. Does it mean they all want to kill us? No, but for the most part, I'd be careful. And I did a whole video about the plants on a a plants versus zombies video that I did in my plasma apocalypse one. She's super plasma possessed. Look at the eyes. Light up the eyes, boys. Light up the eyes. So her eyes are all lit up. That means that she is, she is full of spirit, full of energy. She's possessed. This guy falls on the ground and the grass literally reaches up and tries to wrap around his fingers. That's how much life there is flowing through the earth at this point in time or energy, right? All right, so her third eye is open. Her other two eyes are closed. She's getting some divine insight, I guess you could say, which is, you know, achievable, but you got to be careful because upon doing so, you can also die, which she does. She gets ripped up into a million pieces. Plasma shoots up out of the plasma volcano. I mean, the well behind her, whatever you want to call it. A hole in the sky opens up and the plasma shoots up to the sky. I don't know what else. That's pretty self-evident now the dad is full-on a leper at this point lost his mind is seeing things has a terrible sense of smell everything tastes bad this dude has either been shocked right or like a multitude of things are happening wrong with him he's having a super bad day now the guy in blue makes it right right at the end when when it's the height of everything it's the worst he goes down into the basement where plasma can't get in because there's no open windows or anything. Plasma can't go through a physical object. So most basements are a good bet, right? Not saying they're super safe because there's earthquakes and other things that are dangerous too. But as far as keeping the plasma out, go in your room, lock the door, shut the windows, etc. Keep physical barriers up. This guy does that. He goes down to the basement and he covers his ears. Hear no evil. Just like we mentioned towards the beginning, right? Because he does this, he's unaffected. Everyone else is super affected. Uh, they're, they're, all of their senses are distorted and messed up. He survives. He covers his ears and he wakes up right next to this petrified hand or skeleton of uh, Nicolas Cage. That's Ni- He's dead. Nicolas Cage is fried. He's toast. Now he says, there are only a few of us that remember the strange days now. Let me time out real quick. He says there's only a few of us. He's talking, he's talking, he's including us. He's including us in this statement. There's only a few of us that remember the strange days. So let me ask you, do you remember the strange days? Are you one of those people that has flashes and rememories and reminiscence pictures in your mind or feelings or smells or whatever of something totally different? Not this life. Don't you just feel like you're just on the edge of your seat, like you're like it's on the tip of your tongue, like you're just about to figure out the meaning behind all this craziness? There's only a few of us that remember the strange days. So guess what? We need more people to remember the strange days. That's why we do this. That's why we talk about it, right? That's why we talk about the truth in the movies and in fiction and sci-fi and fantasy, because these come from the few. These memories come from the few of us that remember and hold on to the old ways and the old memories of the, of the way the world once was. And we share that. 
And it comes out to those who dismiss it. It comes out to those who ignore it and to those who laugh at us as being pure amusement, fanciful, lies, fictitious, and so on and so forth. But to those who have an ear to hear, for those of us who are paying attention and desire something more and are trying to get to know ourselves and the world around us a bit better, we remember. He says, what touched this place cannot be quantified or understood by human science. The movie's telling you right now, academia, hey, you're never going to figure this out. Okay? You went down the wrong path and it led you down another wrong path and down another wrong path. Or perhaps it's just perspective is slightly skewed and everyone has a piece of the puzzle, including academia. But that doesn't mean that they hold the spade, so to speak. Opens up the compass, sets, sets himself in a new direction, and he says it was just a color out of space. A messenger from realms whose existence stuns the brain. The color out of space. But look at this Disney castle. This represents Mount Maru. Okay, it's usually a sort of a jagged cliff type thing. It's seen as a castle where um, magical beings live or a princess or a goddess of wisdom, etc. And uh, sometimes they get sucked down under the earth and someone has to go into the underworld to find them. And all kinds of different stories come out of this. But what's really interesting is whenever they play this, it shows you from the top down. And you can see right here, there's a bridge that goes off to the right. There's a bridge that goes off to the left, which means water is also not just coming straight through, as you see, but from the side, creating an X right there in the middle of the Disney castle, right? Um, which means that there will be four lands that surround that Disney castle, which means and solidifies my belief that the Disney castle, castle represents Mount Maru, um, Mount Olympus, all of the very uh, holy mountains of times past. The middle of our world, just like the Disney castle that you just saw, is actually a volcano or a, volca a type of mountain that's like a volcano that shoots up the light that is inside of the earth, the energy that's inside of the earth that manifests in the form of plasma and fills the earth up after this next reversal happens. So the focus of this movie is going to be about what I call the blue beam. This candle holds the miracle that was given to our family. Their family inherited superpowers after being given this magical flame, this magical candle. So uh, they take a look at it and then they go back into the past as she starts to tell them, we could not escape the dangers and your abuelo was lost. Now the abuelo, the grandfather, if the mother represents earth or specifically the blue beam that comes up out of the earth, she's the guardian of it, um, then the grandfather would be the sky, the god of the sky. We're talking about the cosmic union of the earth and the sky together. This is an ill-fated love. This is the love that is always portrayed where they, the man and the woman cannot stay together. No matter how hard they try, they can only come together for brief moments. And then usually there's some sort of an apocalypse or something bad, some sort of cataclysm that happens. So they're pulled apart. They have to be apart always. And that is the cosmic marriage between the earth and the sky. The grandfather was lost. So the, you have the grandmother, earth. The grandfather was lost. Um, this is when they both come together and then the electromagnetic dome goes back up over our world, which cuts off that God from above, the plasma from above, right? And it's lost. It's gone. In our darkest moment, we were given a miracle, which is the candle, the everlasting flame. Now, I want to uh, also touch on that word everlasting. If you do an et etymological study on the word everlasting, you'll find it doesn't actually mean forever without end. It means up until the next age. It's an age-lasting, everlasting, eon-lasting light. It lasts for an age. And the age, how is an age determined? By however long the light lasts for. And it blessed us with a refuge in which to live. Now watch this. Watch what the candle does, which is plasma, like we talked about in some of our prior live streams, how plasma has the ability to attract mud, pulling on it, tugging things up from the ground, and then solidifying, petrifying it, and basically creating mountains that grow right up out of the ground. A place of wonder. 
Our world becomes a place of wonder. When this happens, when that blue beam shoots up into the sky, it gifts the world with magic, with an extra amount of, of energy, electromagnetics, whatever, whatever label people would like to give it. The world becomes a magical place once again, a place of wonder. And uh, young Mirabel, that's her name, Mirabel, says, En encanto. Encanto means enchantment. Just like how we broke that word enchantment down, I think when we were uh, breaking down the Loki movie, right? Enchantment means to sing within, which is interesting because there's a lot of singing in this movie. But it's also not just song, but vibration, a vibration within. The world vibrates. The world is filled with strong energy or magic. And our house, our casita itself, came alive to shelter us. Now, the house, symbolically speaking, as many of you know who've watched my channel, the house represents our entire world on a microcosmic scale. They're shrinking down the whole world and then giving you a little mini drama of what has happened inside of our world through the symbolism of the house. Specifically, you know this whenever it's a magic house. When it's a house that can move all by itself or has inanimate objects moving around all by themselves, um, the house can talk, the house likes to eat people or whatever it may be. Um, the house symbolism is the world symbolism. The house comes alive. Why? Because all of all that plasma, all of that energy that enters into our world and incorporates itself into inanimate objects, allowing them to seemingly move on their own or giving them spirit to come alive and free will to act as they would like to. She goes on, the miracle blessed each with a magic gift to help us. Now check this out. This is the good news, okay? I talk a lot about the apocalypse, and if you're new to my channel, I want to give you something good to rely upon, some hope, okay? Yes, the end of the world is a scary subject, but to anything dark, there is always light. There's always a sylvan lining. There's always some good news behind it. So if you ever get, get bad news, I recommend and encourage you to ask the question, so what's the good news? There's always good news. It has to be balanced, right? Now, the good news is that we inherit what we would call today superpowers, super abilities. We're going to get more into the superpowers of the family and their particular abilities, which reflect those of our own that we will get in just a bit. And when their children came of age, they got magic too. That's right. It's passed along from generation to generation. Now, it does dwindle over time, but that's another story. Uh, and they made their house a paradise. So they start off by saying that there's this magic light that, that shoots up, that appears, that gives them all these powers, reinstitutes magic into their world, makes their house come alive and enchants it. And then they also live in paradise. I also have mentioned that whenever we go through this polarity shift, um, I'm totally not looking at the chat. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm flowing. So I'm just going to go with it. Um, when we go through this polarity shift, the sky changes colors from blue to red, revealing the plasma shield around our world or the plasma sphere, as it's called in academics. Uh, when the sky turns red, our light turns red inside of our world. And because of because all of the plants live underneath a red light, they grow to huge sizes. Now, it's not just the light that encourages the plants to grow, but there's other factors that add to their gigantic growth as well. So this is the Garden of Eden symbolism that we see. So the little girl walks up to her door. There's a ceremony where she's supposed to you know, walk up to the door and get her magic power, and the door tells her what her magic power is, but they don't show us what happens. They fast forward to the future. Mirabel, the little girl, is all grown up now. That's her getting her bag. As you can see on her bag, there's a butterfly. Lots of butterfly symbolism all throughout this movie. The reason for that is because of the, the, the connotation that the butterfly has with change. It's associated with change. Turning from one thing into something different entirely, which is what the plasma has the ability and the potential to do to everything in our world. It changes it. Here's the meaning of the girl Mirabel. The word Mira, Mira means ocean or sea in Sanskrit. It also can mean peace. Uh, that's from Slavic. And then wonderful or wonder. It can also mean fate and goodness or kindness. Uh, kindness. Right here, you see it also carries in Albanian uh, the connotation for princess, 
right? It also can mean princess or duchess in, uh, I'm sorry, in Kurdish, right? So there's your Disney princess right there, Mira, which also means ocean, beautiful ocean, right? And then bell just means beautiful and, and other things like that. You could also use the bell symbolism, like the bell of the world, beautiful world, etc. And that's appropriate for her. She see, she has a good attitude. I like this. She, you'll, you'll see what her superpower is here in just a minute. Okay. And there's spoilers all throughout this. I'm going to, I'm revealing everything just so you know. All right. So, uh, Mita Bell starts talking to all the children and she's basically speaking to you because we need to get familiar with what's going on. And all these kids are like, tell us who, about your family because they all have superpowers, right? Because all the people in the city don't have superpowers, but this family that lives in the Encanto, which is the name for their magic house, they're super powered. So you can see the family tree here, which is also symbolic. It's the tree of life. That's the blue beam shooting up and branching out into the sky, um, which touches each one of them, essentially giving them or making them privy to superpowers, as we would call it today. Their last name is called the Madrigals. This is the Casita Madrigal. Madrigal means a short love poem, especially one suitable for music, which is great because people sing, right? Another thing about the song and uh, the encanto, the chanting, uh, the madrigals. She's the main character in the movie. Why would you not give her a special power, right? Doesn't that make her all that much cooler? She is the coolest because she's the one that we should be able to relate to the most. She represents going into the post-apocalyptic world from the red sky to the blue sky. She's able to help them when they lose their superpowers, which kind of end up defining them. When the doors open, that's when the energy comes in. That's when the magic floods our world and we inherit superpowers. But when those doors close and the pressure starts to build once more, the magic starts to dwindle, just like you see the magic of the door dwindling away. Now, the grandmother who loves living in the magical red world, right, as I would too, she sees the door starting to close and she's like, Oh my, oh my goodness. The candle even starts to flicker out, right? So she's getting super worried about it, but she tries to keep calm and cool on the surface and paddle like a duck. She looks down and she's like, oh, we have a new gift. We're going back to the modern days, right? That's a different little kid. The little kid gets the ability to talk with animals. Another ability that we inherit after the plasma apocalypse, because there's so much energy in the world, our energies run into one another. Even the energies from plant to person, person to animal, animal to plant, and vice versa, which forms what we would call telepathy, the ability to communicate with creatures that we're, we believe we're unable to communicate with in the modern day. And right in the middle, a giant tree. The tree symbolism, the tree of life, all of the animals are there. Basically, you just walked into the post-apocalyptic uh, red sky kind of a world or whatever where you can talk to the animals and stuff. And that's also why Disney has so many talking animals. They're showing you um, the esoteric. They're showing you what's hidden beneath the surface. The little girl goes, it's bigger on the inside? <gasps> just like the TARDIS. Just like Mary Poppins' bag. Just like Hermione's purse. Just like Felix the Cat's uh, luggage or whatever. So many different um, things that, that do this. Bigger on the inside. Could it be if you were to walk through one of these doors, either the door that opens up in the sky where we can traverse past the boundaries of our atmosphere and leave into quote unquote space and enter amongst the heavens, that it would appear much bigger than it seems from way down here where we just see little specks and stars and whatever. Yes. Could it also be that there is a door or an opening that takes us down into the world and the world itself is bigger on the inside because we just live on the surface of it? Yes. Yes to both of those. Oh, excuse me. <coughs> All right. So here's the candle. Now, Isabel, is that her name? Isabel? The main character, the girl, uh, she starts having these prophetic like uh, visions, basically, right? <clears throat> Luis Martinez just joined, uh, donated five dollars in the super chat. Hey, thank you. Let me highlight that. There it is. Boom. Uh, it says Mariposa Mano Manorcas symbolically means the spirit world door has opened, and all the past spirits are visiting the living. 
We're totally going to talk about that here in just a bit, about the, the dead coming back to life. And thanks for your donation. So now she has this prophet, this prophecy vision, okay? Others m can't really see it. She can see it because she is developing and inheriting an ability to dream dreams and to see visions, which is also a prophecy in the Bible of what will happen just before the last days, just before the apocalypse comes. Many of us are given a gift that we can just naturally um, unravel so many different mysteries that, that we can, we can prophecy. Essentially, we understand the past. It starts to become more and more clear as the end nears. And therefore, because we understand what has happened, we can also talk about what will happen, which becomes a form of prophecy. So here you can see that there's all these cracks going right up towards the candle. The cracks sort of make a shape I'm stretching it a bit, but it sort of makes a shape of like a volcano type shape. There's a lot of volcanoes in the background or volcano symbolism in this movie, even though there are no actual volcanoes. You'll see. Uh, so this is basically, uh, the, sometimes I teach this, okay? Uh, sometimes they hide symbolism by skewing perspective. What do I mean by that? I mean that they'll show you something and on the surface, it looks like you're looking straight on as you are standing straight up and down or sitting probably, you know, some of you might not be, but typically most of us are going to be sitting straight up and down perpendicular to the ground. So they show us this, which we assume is also perpendicular to the ground, but symbolically it's the sky cracking open and then a hole right there in the middle, right where the cracks lead to. And then of course the candle goes up to the hole or the plasma does there. You can see it again. All right, uh, so we go back to the main character and she's she starts telling everyone, she has these visions that the house is cracking, that the house, the world, is going to be destroyed, right? She she doesn't know, she, she didn't ask for that vision, but it was given to her, so she panics. First thing she wants to do is tell everybody about it. First thing you want to do when you, when you get all this wonderful good news and come to these revelations of truth is you want to go out and tell everyone. The rest of the world will respond much like they do. They're all partying. They're having a good time. They're celebrating. They're not worried. They're not talking about Bruno, right? And then she's like, oh my God, I, I, I saw, I had this vision where the sky was cracking and the house was starting to fall apart, etc. And the earth basically was falling apart. And they're like, okay, right. And there were cracks everywhere and the candle almost went out. Now, remember, this is, this is giving you their experience living during the time when the blue beam was already up, when the magic was already in the world, right? And she's telling them that the candle almost went out and they're like, Psh. like, that's one thing you don't say. You don't say that, that that everlasting light is not everlasting, right? So she, the grandma goes down, she looks, everyone looks, they don't see any cracks or anything, which is, which means that this is a vision that was given specifically to her. Why? Because she represents some of us that live during, um, the time of no magic that inherit the ability to prophecy, to dream dreams and to see visions and whatnot. So the grandmother completely lies to the rest of the people of the house, which is the rest of the people of our world. Um, and she says, the magic is strong. And so are the drinks. Ah, uh? now, wait a minute. That's funny, sort of, but not really, right? The truth is the world's going to come falling apart. Okay. And that is the truth. The world falls apart cyclically. It happens from time to time. Usually when those of us who can see it, start telling people about it, like this girl, the rest of the world reacts and they get all scared. And then the leaders, the people who are in charge lie to the people because they don't want the people to go into chaos. They have control. They don't want to lose that control. So they lie and they say, no, 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 no. Everything's fine. The magic is strong. And so are the drinks. So party on, have a good time, right? Go get drunk. Go, go, go distract yourself so that you don't listen and so that you forget about what you were just told by this girl who has a special power. So then the grandmother goes out to the candle and she starts praying to uh, her relatives. And she says, if our family only knew how vulnerable we truly are. So the grandmother knows that they're vulnerable. The grandmother understands something that the rest of the community doesn't. So fast forward. Um, the, the, the girl, Mirabel, 
She's on the search. She's a truth seeker. She can't let this go. She starts asking everybody and it starts to kind of get under some people's skin that she's asking so many questions, right? Which is us, the truth seekers of the world, right? We ask a lot of questions and it kind of gets under people's skin sometimes. They're like, uh, we don't talk about Bruno. Why are you trying to talk about Bruno? Right. Or they just totally ignore it and pretend like it's not happening. So her super strong sister, um, her eyes been twitching and stuff. Cause she's starting to worry about losing her power. Basically. She says, Luis is fine. I'm totally not nervous. And then she goes into the song that I shared, you know, a parody version of it with you guys. Uh, and she says, uh, does Hercules ever say, yo, I don't want to fight Cerberus. Now, Cerebrus, Cerebrus, let's talk about this dog. Let's talk about this little quick mention of Hercules fighting Cerberus. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Pardon me. So Cerberus is this three-headed dog that is said to guard the underworld. Uh, the dog that guards the gates of the underworld to prevent the dead from leaving. Now, let's rewind real quick. I want to show you the sister. The sister in the world represents Hercules. Who is Hercules? Hercules is akin to uh, Heracles, to Atlas, the one that holds up the worlds or holds, holds the weight of the sky on its shoulder. It's supposed to be the sky, not the world, just so you know. Uh, the blue beam, in short. That's who the sister represents. The blue beam brings strength and superpowers and stuff like that back to us, back to those who um, have survived the apocalypse, right? So she mentions Hercules because the story, Hercules goes down to fight this dog to make it its slave, this three-headed dog or whatever. And if that dog is not guarding the entrance to the underworld, then that means that the dead can rise. And they do. The dead will rise. The dead do rise from time to time. It's been quite some time since they've done it in mass. It happens all the time. We just don't really talk about it. And we don't call people who came back from the dead zombies. We just come up with technical terms for that. But it's real. There will come a time, according to my studies at least, when the dead all across the world will rise up and be reinvigorated once more. Because the, the, the thing that is guarding the underworld, the three-headed dog, remember how there was like three babies at the beginning? Well, those babies go back down into the earth. When they retract, the, the beams go back down under the earth when they retract and they guard the underworld. You get the three-headed symbolism, uh, the three-headed god or dog, etc. All right. So anyways, um, when you, when you defeat the dog and you go through the polarity shift, then it's possible for the dead to rise. Here she is again, doing the symbolic lady Liberty type thing, um, which is also symbolic of the goddess of wisdom, the blue beam, etc., that brings wisdom to the world. Then her song, which I shared a piece of with you earlier in parody form. Uh, hopefully there's no copyright issues with that, but whatever. Uh, she, she, I want to, I want to read some of these lyrics to the song for you guys. Okay. So the chorus goes pressure, like a pressure, like a grip. Well, hold on. Let me go back. Oh, here we go. Now, okay, hold on. I'm just going to sing. I'm just going to read some of this so that I can comment on it. Okay. Uh, I'm the strong. She goes, I'm the strong one. I'm not nervous. I'm as tough as the crust of the earth is. So she's relating herself to the earth itself because she represents the blue beam. She comes up out of the earth, right? She's born from the earth. I love mountains. I mean, I move mountains, right? Just like the plasma can move mountains, how we talked about. I move churches. All the different religions and stuff of the world are based off of this symbolism, in my opinion. And I glow because I know what my worth is. The blue beam. Oh my God, it's plasma. It glows, right? That's what it does. It's a light. This song is actually titled, uh, literally titled, Surface Pressure. That's what it's about. Um, it's about the pressure that is on the world. And, and many artists out there, I feel like they know this. And they make these songs that can be misinterpreted by the masses because we're all under so much pressure because the world sucks so bad. So that's how we interpret it. But we may be misinterpreting that. Okay. That, there's some truth there, but it's also about the bigger picture of the actual pressure in the atmosphere that we don't notice because we've been living in it. We've become accustomed to it. We're used to it, right? She says pressure that'll tip, tip, tip till you just go pop. 
That's the world. She's talking about the pressure building up in the world and it pops and then she loses her power or whatever because she goes back down into Hades. Uh, then she says, uh, pressure like a tick, tick, tick till it's ready to blow. Whoa. Same thing. The pressure in the world builds up until, poof, until it's ready to blow. It blows from the top. Uh, what else does she say here? Oh, under the surface. So now she's talking about under the surface, right? Uh, the, the beam goes retracts. It goes back down into the world uh, and becomes the inner sun or whatever you know people would like to refer to it as. And it's under the surface. It's literally under the surface of the world. So it's appropriate that she is singing about being under the surface, right? I hide my nerves and it worsens. I worry something is going to hurt us. She's worried about the red plasma that's, that's coming, right? That's going to hurt the world. That's going to destroy. The destroyer comes. Under the surface, uh, let's see, what else, what else, what else? Anything else here? Uh, I could break down this whole song. I don't know if I want to do that. One moment. Okay. Uh, I think you get the point. So I'm, I'm actually going to move on now. All right, so let's go forward. Uh, if I fall to pressure... Oh. If I follow the pressure, like a grip, grip, grip. So as you can see, that's the pressure. Okay, that's that's us right now. That's the world we live in. We are basically just like that. That's why everything shrinks. That's why we live in an incredible shrinking world. Okay, everything will one day expand and grow as everything must in flux, right? Uh, there's the law of rhythm, the law of cycles. Everything right now is shrinking. Our lifespans are shrinking. We're getting tiny. We're basically the who's in Whoville. Uh, we're super tiny compared to what we could be in our potential and what we once were. Pressure like a tick, tick, tick till it's ready to blow. Boom. And then they blow way up into the sky. There's there's the hole getting sucked up into the sky symbolism, etc. And then these rocks fall out of the sky. This was really interesting. They just put some random boulders up there in the sky. Now, could it be a part of like whatever was down here and it's falling? Yes, it could. But I have a theory that rocks and much of the world's desert sand and other things actually is created up there in the sky. It doesn't come from the ground. Boulders of strange shapes and megaliths and all this type of stuff are don't just grow. Boulders don't just... You ever see a boulder just... Oh, what's that? Oh, it's a boulder. It's just my boulder plant that's growing up out of the ground. Yeah, I don't know about that, right? Our world is kind of reversed, right? We, we're taught that the good guys come down from above and the bad guys live inside the world. It may be the opposite. It may be that instead of the, the um, strange, gigantic megaliths and boulders and stuff, uh, random boulders that you see in various places, and even the sands of the desert, instead of coming from the ground itself over millions of years that it's created instantaneously up there in the sky during a cosmic union between the earth and the sky. So there she is again. She's doing the squatting men, as you can see, representative of the plasma, Atlas, Atlas, uh, holding up the sky, the firmament. Watch as she buckles and bends but never breaks. So this is her holding up the, the thing. But then she also says, if the same pressure would have pulled you under, the same pressure when it's relieved also combined with liquefaction from worldwide earthquakes causes the world to become a soupy, muddy swamp full of quicksand and people easily sink or objects, people, cars, all kinds of stuff. It's just sink right down into the earth. The things that don't get sucked up in the tempest sink down into the earth. It's a crazy time. No cracks, no breaks. There's the red sky. Boom. There's her holding up the earth. There's the uh, donkeys underneath, which symbolize red or the plasma, etc. All right. So anyways, enough about the sister. She's super strong. I think we all get the point. And then she says, last night when you saw the cracks, I felt weak. So she's going to lose her superpowers. And this is also a theme that you'll see and probably have throughout many of the movies in our pop culture where the super strong inevitably lose their superpowers and become normal once again. That's just showing to you and reciprocating what happens here in this world. What do you think's hurting the magic? She asks her. Ah, that's the truth seeker in her asking the question. What is, what, what's hurting the magic? Why is the magic disappearing? So let's see how they symbolize that. Before Tio Bruno left, he had like some terrible vision about it. 
Start with Bruno's Tower. That place is off limits for a reason. Ah, now we've got the truth seeker who is instructed to make a little mini pilgrimage up to some sort of tall tower that's off limits for a reason. The tower is the Disney castle. The tower is Mount Maru. The tower is the plasma volcano. The, the tower is beyond the Arctic circle off limits for a reason. Okay. Well, she doesn't vibe with that. She's going to go right. Whenever they say, don't go there. She goes there. All right, so she goes up to Bruno's room. His his uh, light is out because he's hiding right now. So she walks in. It's a desert place, just like we talked about, the sands of the desert and everything being made up there in the sky, etc. But she's also basically, symbolically, inside of the plasma volcano now. And you can see because she looks up, it goes all the way around. Okay, she's... I mean, you could say she's just in a huge cave inside of the earth somehow, inside of a house, um, which is the earth, right? And it says, your future awaits with the finger pointing up. Many of you have done your esoteric studies in looking up uh, Illuminati symbolism and stuff. You've come across many paintings from hundreds and centuries ago where people, for whatever weird reason, are just pointing up and looking straight at you or sometimes looking up into the sky. I believe the reason they're doing that is because they're warning you about what comes from above, the sleeping God, Cthulhu, etc. This happens during the cosmic wedding, right? There was not a cloud in the sky. Everything was great. And then Bruno walks in with this prophecy that something bad would happen on the wedding, that there would be a storm. Thunder happens. The clouds appear in the sky. Bruno says it looks like rain. Married in a hurricane, right? This is the tempest. They will get married in a hurricane. They will get married in a tempest because uh, the world is depressurizing. The winds start to swirl around. The uh, atmosphere itself expands, turning everything into cloud. And, uh, and there will be a hurricane. This will, be, this will create the twister that takes Dorothy to Oz, etc. So then they say, uh, what a joyous day. But anyway, and then these people bust out their umbrellas. I did a whole video about the umbrella uh, what I forgot what I called it, but I did a whole um, symbolism video about the umbrella, which is, I highly recommend checking it out if you want to know more about umbrella symbolism. But these people open up their umbrellas and boom, they get sucked up into the sky. They're gone, okay? That doesn't happen. I know it's Disney. I know, oh, it's just a cartoon. Nothing is just anything to me. Everything is immensely valuable and important to me. I look at the details and they're very important to me, just as much as the mundane, whatever. Um, but they get sucked up into the sky during this tempest that's happening during this cosmic wedding day. He's like, why, did, why didn't you leave Encanto? Why did, why did you stay here? So he says the mountains around Encanto are pretty tall. The mountains around the North Pole are said to also be like huge cliffs that shoot up out of the ground. I had this vision the night that you didn't get your gift, he says. Abuela worried about the magic. So she begged me to look into the future. Now check this out. Abuela is one of the people who's like, we don't talk about Bruno. And yet Bruno is her little advisor. Does that sound familiar? Right? Governments of the world who, who you know, criticize all of our mumbo jumbo uh, for new age, looking into the new age stuff and all this other things. And yet, every single presidential advisor, every single king and queen that has ever existed anywhere has always had some sort of an esoteric um, witch doctor or uh, wizard or advisor of some kind um, that talks about those things and informs them about these things. And then they turn right around and condemn it, right? Now, as you can see in the middle of that circle, there's four piles of dirt representing four lands at the North Pole. In the middle is a huge pile of leaves that's set on fire, which represents the pyre amid or the, the pyramid, the fire inside um, of the world. And then uh, all this energy starts swirling around them and it creates a dome that goes around them directly above this little pyramid of fire and the four lands at the base of it, right? So there's your little dome. There's your Disney dome. There's the dome of the world. Wow. It's way more green. <laughs> Holy cow. Oh my God. Oh, that's the mountain. Okay, so see in the background, there's this earthquake. This is a part of the prophecy, right? There's this huge worldwide earthquake basically that happens. And this mountain 
opens, okay? You could say it splits or whatever, but it opens up, which is symbolic of the plasma volcano, right? Um, you're, you're just sort of seeing it as if somebody cut it and then showed you the insides of it, right? It's got a path that goes down. It's a cave. It's the cave of saviors, etc. It goes all the way down into the world. And they're showing you that that mountain splits open or opens back up and comes alive. Uh, so she, she creates a carnivorous plant, which is also symbolic because when we go into this next cataclysm and we survive and go into the next era or age, um, the plants become gigantic and become dangerous to littles like us. Uh, those of us who've already passed the point of puberty will likely remain a similar size that you are now. Uh, much unlike those who are born into that world who will grow and grow and grow and become giants and titans and stuff. But the plants themselves become and naturally inherit a dangerous quality to us tiny ones. They start building the house back up, which is what we will do. Everything will be destroyed. We'll, we'll go through the, the rubble and the wreckage and the and the trash and whatnot, and we will clean the world back up, and we'll make it our own. So she looks in the, her reflection in the doorknob, right, to start off things, to start the new world, and she sees herself, and she comes to terms with who she is. She stops feeling so insecure about not having superpowers, and she looks around and sees something she's done, which is miraculous. She's gathered together everyone in the world to change the world. If that's not a superpower, I'm not J-Dreamers. <laughs> so she puts the, uh, the knob back in to start things off. And guess what? Mother Earth responds in turn. Mother Earth says, let me give you a gift. And the house becomes magical once again. As they go through another cycle, the magic spreads all throughout the house. All the magic is restored to the city all around. And there's a brand new door. Instead of just one door with individuals, now it's all of us. It's all of them together, strengthening the house with their unity. And then they all take a picture as the Familia Madrigal. Hey, and that is the end. That would be my door. I just made that. <laughs> I've totally forgot I made that. Oh, my God. That's funny. All right. Well, yes, that's, that's the J-Dreamer's door. <laughs> Let's leave the world of the boring behind for a little while, yeah? Let's jump right into Donnie Darko. Uh, this movie's about time travel. It's about uh, anomalies. It's about the apocalypse, which is right up my alley. So let's jump right into it and see what we've got. Donnie Darko starts off. Uh, it's presented by a company called Pandora, which is really interesting because if you've researched uh, Pandora or Pandora's box then what you'll find out is that there was uh, some myths and some legends a long time ago that talked about how uh, the gods had actually presented uh, a gift to mankind in the form of a, a female that they have created out of mud or clay. And then uh, they gave her a box and they said, don't open it. And they actually gave her husband the keys to the box. Well, curiosity got the best of her. And when she opened up that container, which is just another word for box or box is another word for container, right? It doesn't have to be a cube or anything. Um, when she opened that up, that's when all of the world's problems, all of the trials and tribulations, all of the evils that you see in this world today, uh, all of that stuff was released into our world. The only thing that was kept um, alive in and stayed in the box was hope. So that's very much appropriate for this movie because we want to keep hope alive and we're going to get to uh, the sleepwalking stuff here in a bit. But he wakes up, looks out, and we have the intro, Donnie Darko. And then all of a sudden we have this flash in the sky at the very beginning, right right there in the, in the skyline. It's not the sun or anything. It just kind of flashes. That flash is really important to the movie too. We'll talk about that here in a minute. So as we start off, there's a moon. I mean, that's not a moon. There's a song that's playing, and I like to watch the movies with the uh, captioning on. It says, Under Blue Moon, I Saw You. And if you've watched my channel long enough, you've seen that the blue moon symbolism is the once in a blue moon. I'm not talking about the blue moon that the news comes out and says, oh, tonight's going to be a blue moon. It's really not blue. You know what I mean? There is a time that comes just before the apocalypse when the moon turns blue, as does the sun. Um, and I've got quite a few videos I've done about that, but it's basically an omen of the apocalypse is the blue moon. That's why, that's why it's once in a blue moon hardly ever happens. It's once every age, once every eon, and it happens just before the apocalypse, which is what we're about to see. He gets out of bed and he's sleepwalking. He starts walking around and the voice says, I've been watching you. 
come closer. Donnie's out in the middle of nowhere and he comes across a giant rabbit. Let me zoom in on this giant rabbit because he's going to play a huge part in this movie. So it's some guy in a huge bunny suit or a bunny outfit. And the rabbit starts talking to him and he says, 28 days, 6 hours, 42 minutes, 12 seconds. That is when the world will end. Now we go over to the next day and we see somebody, somebody's looking up and there's this guy and he says, son. Now look at that. The son is right next to him and he says, son, that's a question to you. That's a question asking you, is that the son? Right? Then he looks at Donnie Darko and he says, son. Ah, now we've got conflict. Here's a son. And here's a son. Donnie Darko is also a son. Symbolically, he's going to, um, in a way, represent the blue beam of the world. That middle pillar, uh, that Jesus type of, of figure that we talked about before. It also represents various Christ-like figures, heroes of old, and uh, savior figures and whatnot. So he says, son, Donnie Darko, and he's sleeping on grass or something, exactly like we saw him at first when he was sleeping on the road. Now let's break down what Donnie Darko means. At first, I just thought it was Donnie, you know, Don or whatever, and Darko, like it means dark. So he's dark, it's sort of a dark movie, you know, that's not what it means. Donnie is short for Donald. Let's take a closer look at the root of Donald. Uh, the root of Donald means uh, world mighty or ruler of the world, and it comes from valos, which means ruler. It's the Proto-Indo-European root word, wall. So if you see W-A-L, as I'm sure you have in your daily lives, it means something that is strong or something that causes to be strong or something that is strong. And by implication and extension, it means a ruler, like a mighty one, essentially, which is what they used to be called as well. Donnie Darko is one of the mighty ones. Continues on and it says, the name Darko is primarily a male name of Slavic origin that means a gift. So gift of the mighty one is what Donnie Darko means. Donnie Darko, we're going to see in this movie, is himself a gift to the world. We're going to we're going to come back to that one in a bit. Now, some other guy, you know, walks up to this guy and they're both looking down and you can see a flag in the background. Now we know they're on a golf course. He says, "Oh, it's Eddie, Eddie Darko's kid." So Donnie Darko is the son of Eddie Darko, right? I'm going to come back to these characters here in just a second. Now, Eddie Darko is Donnie Darko's father. What does Eddie mean? Why did they choose to give that character his name? And Eddie is a vortex or a whirlpool. So a, some sort of a whirlpool or a spinning water or a vortex of water gives birth to Donnie Darko, which is the mighty gift to the world or the mighty one who is a gift to the world, right? Um, that eddy or that spinning, spiraling vortex of water is said to be located at the original North Pole that used to be on uh, uh, maps everywhere. That waters that surrounded this mysterious island that has been since removed in the last couple of hundred years from all of our maps, it's no longer there. Everyone knew that that location existed. Everyone knew that there was an island divided by four rivers at the middle of the world and that that was the location of the Garden of Eden, that that was uh, Hyperborea, that that was some sort of a paradise in the middle of the world. And uh, those waters are said to be a current, a strong current that swirls around right up there at the North Pole. Now, I believe that that's true because today we have uh, this polar current up in the air that is responsible for much of our weather. And when that polar current stretches out and goes into flux, it brings down a lot of cold air. As above, so below. If the air is spinning around and we have a jet stream and a current up there, so will we down below in the waters below. Now, the other guy, I want to, I want to point this out real quick. I want you to keep an eye on this dude, okay? We're going to keep an eye on this guy and come back to him for sure. But did you notice what he did? He blocked out the light. He caused an eclipse. He made it dark. He's going to represent a dark energy. Keep that in mind. We'll come back to that guy. Uh, so we talked about uh, Donnie Darko's father. His name is Eddie, which means a vortex. And then they say, are you all right, son? Donnie looks down at his arm and here's what he sees. He has drawn some numbers, some random strange numbers on his arms. 2806 42 12, which is 
the numbers that he was given by the giant uh, bunny rabbit when the world would end. 28 days, 6 hours, 42 minutes, and 12 seconds, right? Now, there's a lot of speculation, and I'll give you mine, about what that represents or what it may represent, right? The side reel month is the time needed for the moon to return to the same place against the background of the stars, which is 27 days, 7 hours, 43 minutes, and 12 seconds. Basically, if you go up one number or down one number on most of those right there, you get the number that's on Donnie Darko's arm. And he looks up and sees a huge jet engine that they're pulling up out of his house. His sister goes, it fell in your room. A huge jet engine fell right into Donnie's Darko's room in the middle of the night. If he didn't go sleepwalking, he would have been crushed by this huge jet engine. And they, uh, the firefighters are up there. Now, keep in mind also, Donnie Darko's house is white. Okay, Anytime that you see a white house, specifically in the movies, oftentimes it represents our entire world on a microcosmic scale. Okay, It's a small version that symbolizes the rest of the entire world because it's easier to do that way. His sister, which is actually his sister in real life, Maggie Gyllenhaal, uh, says that they don't know where it came from. So check this out. This strange jet engine just fell out of the sky, crushed Johnny D Donnie Darko's room, and they have no idea, whoever they are, they have no idea where it came from. Or if we allow the movies to sort of play out, it zooms in to this jet engine. Strange. Why would it do that, right? Why would it keep zooming in all the way to the middle of this jet engine? Because of what you see here. What do you see here in the middle of this jet engine, right? It's a spiral directly in the middle of a jet engine. That's symbolic of the spiraling plasma that's going to come down during the apocalypse, right? Uh, it's also the number six or the number nine, depending on which cycle we are in, because one cycle, it will swirl one way. Another cycle, it'll reverse and it'll swirl back the other way. Now we go to Donnie Darko's school, and uh, it's basically a religious, like Catholic type of a school. Everyone wears uniforms and stuff. Everyone in the, many people in this school are bad, okay? This is not a school for like good kids, even though it's a religious school and everything. These kids are literally doing coke in the hallway. And then check out the uh, sticker on this dude's locker. It says, what would Satan do? That's what they're showing us. They're showing us that the school is full of bad energy, okay? And the school also represents our entire world on a microscopic level, right? Let's jump into one of Donnie Darko's classrooms. She's like, hey, where do I sit? And Drew Barrymore's like, sit next to the boy that you think is the cutest, which I love. I love that Drew Barrymore breaks all of these rules that the school has. She walks this gray area because she's trying to stretch their minds and get them to think independently instead of just running them through the motions. Uncommon. Hey, thank you, man. I appreciate you. All right. Now, check it out. Do you see in the background right next to her? There's these interesting posters. I'm going to show you this one right next to her because I thought this was really interesting. It's done by an artist named Max Ernst, right? Take a look at this. Do you see what we have here? We have what looks like the sun or something in the sky, except it's blue and there's two circles there and there's some sort of a person right there in the middle. That's an interesting piece of artwork. Let me show you some of the other pieces of artwork that the same uh, artist has done. Remember this circle, the double circle right there in the middle, right? Watch the artwork, right? There's the double circle. There's the double circle. All the same artist. There's the double circle. And this is actually like, uh, the title of that is like uh, a forest of some kind. There's the double circle. There's the double circle. This guy puts this in almost everything. He even put it into these characters in one of his, his other pieces. Here's another work. Here's another piece of work by Max Ernst. Check this out. Now we move on and they actually almost hit this lady who's checking her mail. This really old lady who has a nickname. Her name is, her nickname is Grandma Death, which is... I like it. I think it's a cool nickname. Um, and she's checking the mail. So Donnie Darko stops because they almost hit her with the car and he's trying to help her out, right? So he walks up to her. She's looking into the mail. She seems kind of senile and stuff. Nothing in there. It's totally empty. There's a lot of symbolism that's happening in this, in this particular scene. First, I want to show you her name. As you can see on the mailbox, it says R. Sparrow. Her name is Roberta, Roberta Sparrow right? Like Jack Sparrow from Pirates of the Caribbean, same thing. 
So let's break that down. Let's see what that means and then come back to this to see what's going on here with Roberta Sparrow, Donnie Darko, and this mailbox, right? I see a lot of mailbox symbolism in the movies lately. So Roberta comes from Robert. It's a female version of the male name Robert. Robert comes from Hrod, which means fame or glory, something that is famous or glorious. And Bert. Bert, like Bert and Ernie, right? Bert. Bert means bright. It's from the Proto-Indo-European root word bereg, which is very similar to berg, like a city or a place that has bright, shiny lights, right? And that means to shine brightly, especially with white color, like a white light, right? So, Rodberg means, or Robert, or Roberta, means famous light or glorious light bright light, essentially, right? So she represents something that has to do with that blue beam, just like Donnie Darko. They're very similar characters. They're related to one another. Uh, Sparrow, let's check that out real quick. Sparrow comes from the root word spar. You see that? Now over here, it says it's from the Proto-Indo-European root word sper, which means spear or a pole, which is so interesting because Donnie Darko literally uses the word spear a little bit later on in the movie. So what does Roberta Spero mean altogether? It's a sentence. It's a, it's a message being given to us. Her name, Roberta, means famous light or famous beam of light, basically. Um, and then a uh, sparrow means a pole or a beam, a spear, a spear a brilliant spear of bright light, a famous spear of light, a famous beam of light, exactly like we showed you in the middle, right? That's the like the cross beam of Jesus, etc., right? Now, let's go back and re-examine that image. Let's check it out again. So, symbolically, we have a woman who is related and has something to do with um, a bright, white, famous light. She goes to the mailbox to check it, but the mailbox is called the post. The box is on a pole. The box is on a post. The post is called such because it represents that same beam. Right now, we've got three beams symbolically. Roberto Sparrow, uh, Donnie Darko, and then the mailbox itself symbolically. Three beams, three lines. We're going to see that come up a lot, so keep that in mind. On top of the beam, which is the pole of the mailbox, is the box. The box is just a container. The box represents Pandora's box or Pandora's container, and it represents our world. She's checking in on the status of our world. The box has been opened, just like Pandora opened her box and let out all of the evil that we have to deal with in this world today. There's good news, though. That evil will one day be eradicated. We'll talk about that soon, too. So, she's checking in on the world itself, and it's there's nothing there. There's no, there's no news. There's nothing going on. It's just empty, right? It, the world has opened up and it is being, and it has been emptied out, which is the apocalypse. It's the depressurization event. All right. So Roberta Sparrow, AKA Grandma Death, she walks up to Donnie and gives him a little old lady hug. We go back into the therapist's office and Donnie says, I made a new friend, Frank. <laughs> like you think he's going to say Roberta Sparrow, but he doesn't. He says, uh, yeah, Frank. He said to follow him. Now, I don't think I, I don't think I, oh, I did look it up. All right, so let's see what Frank means. I think we've looked this one up a couple of times in the past. Frank means free, aka not a servant, a free man, a free woman, a free person, somebody who is free truly in the world to do whatever they like, somebody who has no laws against them, no rules, no uh, guidelines or anything, somebody who is truly free to do whatever they want to do. And that is representative of Frank, which is the giant bunny rabbit. Now, let's take a closer look, and it says here, Following the white rabbit. Okay, let's go back just a smidge. Let's just go back a second. So Frank said to follow him. Nigel, hey, good to see you. Frank says to follow him. He sees a giant rabbit. He, the rabbit says to follow him. We've seen that a few times before, right? Specifically Alice in Wonderland symbolism or the Matrix, you know, Neo with that tattoo of the, the rabbit on that chick's shoulder. Uh, Frank means free man. Let's look up the follow the white rabbit or the following the rabbit symbolism. Okay. Now, if we look it up in Google, it says following the white rabbit means following an unlikely clue and finding yourself 
in the middle of an extraordinary situation. This situation often challenges your beliefs and changes your life. That is nice, but that's all symbolic and wishy-washy. That's totally true. I agree with it. There's actually a physical, real, tangible extension to that. It means something physical in the world to follow the white rabbit. Now, if we take, if we go back to the root, which is uh, Alice in Wonderland, we've got the white rabbit. It is singing a song about being late because the apocalypse always comes late. Okay. It always, every time the apocalypse comes around, it's a little later than the last time, which throws off our timing in this world. People have to readjust their, their method of timekeeping because something happens to the world. I believe it grows. I believe it actually gets bigger each time the apocalypse happens. If that's true, it stands to reason that the, the, the length of time in the day, um, is going to change as well which is going to change our clocks and our timekeeping and our seasons and all kinds of stuff, right? Now, if we follow this white rabbit, where does he go? Boom, he jumps right into this little rabbit hole. But where is the rabbit hole? We're supposed to follow this rabbit into this rabbit hole. People always focus on the hole, but they don't look at what's right above the hole. If you take a look at the movie version, it shows you a better image of what's right above the hole. Over here, it kind of looks like maybe a bush, but it's actually a tree. In the movie version, Alice comes over and uh, she she sees that there is a hole right here at the base of this dead tree, basically in the movie. And that is where the hole, the rabbit hole is. It's always underneath a tree. Sometimes it's a bush or something, you know, some sort of a, a plant. Um, a hedge, I believe, was the first one. A hedge is really interesting because a hedge also implies a barrier, right? A marker saying like, hey, this is this is a barrier. This is a boundary. This is a fence. If you cross over it, you're in a different place. You're in a different property, different realm, different world, right? So, that is following the right, the white rabbit. We are to follow the white rabbit to a tree that has uh, some sort of a hole that leads to another world underneath it. If we take a look here, this is really interesting. It shows Alice going down the rabbit hole. Let's read what it says right here though. So she followed him into a rabbit hole beneath a big tree. That would be Yggdrasil. That would be the world tree. That would be that middle pillar, that middle beam of light that shoots up as a beam of plasma and then starts flooding out and branching out, creating all sorts of shapes in the sky. But what else does it say? Check this out. And down she fell, down to the center of the world, it seemed. <laughs> Did it seem like that or was it actually the center of the world, right? Uh, that's kind of what seems to be implied if you ask me. So the therapist is like, follow him. Where? Where are you going to follow the rabbit to? Well, we've just talked about it. It is it is the, the tree in the middle of the world. Donnie says into the future. So check this out. By extension, if we were to follow the white rabbit into, and we, we found out where the world tree was, and we if we find where the world tree is, which is at the North Pole, um, I think I think so far, right? I mean, everyone's free to their opinions and stuff, right? Um, but this is just all according to my research thus far. If we went to the world tree at the bottom where the trunk of the tree is, there should be an inner earth entrance or a huge cavernous system. And if we go there, then it acts as a type of time travel into the future, he says. And then she says, and what? And then what happens? What happens after you follow the white rabbit and you go into the world tree or whatever? He says, then he said that the world was coming to an end. <sighs> Isn't that interesting? Why do we need to follow the white rabbit? Why do we need to find the world tree? Why do we need to go to Mount Maru and then go down into the inner recesses of the world? Because the world's going to end. And that is a safe haven. That is a safe place. Once again, I'll refer back to Norse mythology. Uh, Leaf and Leaf Thrasir are basically um, the futuristic version of Adam and Eve who survive Ragnarok and Fimbleventer as well. So check this out. It says here, two humans who are foretold to survive the events of Ragnarok by hiding in a wood, a wood is another name for a tree, called Hodmimi's Holt. Hodmimi is the name of this god. Uh, Holt is like a safe haven. It's a place where they, um, they collect and store things, basically, to keep them safe. Hodmimi's Holt. And after the flames have abated, which means they've gone away, they repopulate the newly risen and fertile world. So, 
Leaf and Leaf Thrasir in Norse mythology, symbolically, they follow the white rabbit, they find the world tree, and they stay there as a place of refuge, and they wade out to the end of the world, while, while all the rest of the people are going through the apocalypse itself. All that craziness that I've talked about on my channel, they're safe from all of it. So people always ask me, where is the safest place to be or whatever? Um, my answer is going to be the only the only Number one on my list is going to be the North Pole at the world tree, at the base of the world tree, underneath it, inside of the world, because that's the eye of the storm that comes from the eye in the sky. We go on to read in, uh, if we go into the poetic Edda, uh, it says that Odin was talking to one of the giants and he asked him a question about who's going to survive Fimbulvetr which is the great winter that we've also talked about. I've done a video about Fimbulwinter as well in my Plasma Apocalypse playlist. It's a great winter, three years long without any interruptions in between. And there's wars and stuff that break out during that time. So Odin wants to know. He asks this giant who seems to know. And the giant says it will be Leaf and Leaf Thrasir. Leaf is literally means life. Just, just in case you were curious. Leaf means life. Leaf Thrasir means the lover of life. So life and life's lover go to the world tree, Yggdrasil, and they hide. It says Leaf and Leaf Thrasir, uh, the two will have hidden in the wood of Hodmimi's Holt. They will consume the morning dew as food. Now, referring back to my last video where we, where we talked about the blob, we talked about Slimer, we talked about the goo, we talked about uh, the ooze that is a byproduct of a strong electrical current, right? And these ghosts tend to leave it wherever they go. And they eat that. It's also directly related to Mountain Dew or the dew that comes from Rupus Negra, which is the trunk of the world tree, right? Uh, it erupts. It is the fountain of youth. It, it electrically charges the sky and causes uh, electrified, energized water droplets that's very viscous and slimy to form. And they drop down and splash down onto the ground. And if they're left there for a while, they actually harden and they become sort of wafer-like and crispy. All right, so we go to the school. We go back to the school, and they're all sitting there watching a, um, some sort of a presentation by this guy. He's the guy who eclipsed the sun with his head earlier. Remember that? He says, hello, my name is Jim Cunningham, and welcome to Controlling Fear. Now, check this out. Isn't that, inter isn't that ironic? He's doing a video presentation about how to control fear, but he actually represents dark energy. Let's see what his name uh, implies. Now, Jim is actually a letter. Jim is a letter. Jim. Jim is a letter in Arabic. It's equal to and the same as the letter Gimel or our letter C in modern modern day, right? But basically, it's a it's a G or a C. In the old alphabet, they didn't have a C, they had a G, okay? So it went A, B, G in the old alphabets. Aleph, Bet, Gimel, or in Arabic, Jim, right? So the G, the G at the middle of the world, the G symbolized the foot, and the foot meant a destination. The foot meant a place to go to. Why would his name harken back to something that sounds like it's good? This place, the safe haven and stuff, right? Because there is a war over that mountain. There is a war, there is a fight, uh, to control that particular piece of land. That is the most coveted piece of land in all of our world, in my opinion. Now, look at the symbol. Check out this symbol. There's a Y. <laughs> why? Why is there a Y? It's Cunningham. There's not even a Y in Cunningham because that is not a Y. Things are not what they seem in this world, are they? That's right in the middle. That's got to be the most important part of this entire crest. It's directly front and center, right? So let's check out this Y. Now, in the ancient languages, specifically in like ancient Aramaic and Phoenician and stuff, if you go really far back, there was a letter, the sixth letter typically of the alphabet or the alphabet. It was named Vav. It is the Vav. It used to be drawn as a Y. Here's the modern Hebrew version of the Vav right there. And it essentially equates to our letter V today. And it means the number six as well. Right? So when you see three sixes, it's three vavs. What is a vav? Well, in the old days, they drew it as a Y because this is what their tent pegs used to look like. When they would nail their, their pegs down into the ground to secure their tents, 
because they slept in tents, right? Uh, they would take rope and stuff and they would tie it around that Y portion so that it would be secure in the ground. And that's what that symbolizes, a tent peg. It also symbolizes a hook. So if you see any hook symbolism like Peter Pan's hook or Maui's hook, etc., all of that harkens back to this Y shape, which was a tent peg or a nail, you could say a nail, um, and it's ultimately something that is fastened into the earth, but comes up out of the earth, something that springs forth out of the earth, literally representing the spring of the fountain of youth. Also, that's the place where you can time travel. According to Donnie Darko, he says, if you follow the white rabbit, you're going to time travel and go into the future, right? Back to the Future has the Vav. It's an old archaic version of the Vav or the Y, right? It's not a Y. Keep that in mind. It is the it is the letter. Well, it represents a few letters. It represents V, U, double U or double V, and sometimes the letter F as well. It just depends on dialect. But basically, this is the nail of the earth, okay? And that and in, in Back to the Future, it's literally made out of light, right? Which is a sky beam that shoots up and then splits out towards the top because of the electromagnetics and how they work um, towards the top of the world. Now, Donnie Darko passes out on the couch. He goes to sleep. And then he starts having this dream. This is uh, a lot of water. looks like the ocean or something. There's the sky. These structures on the left and the right here, this is his school. So what he's being shown is that his school is flooded. He's having, this is how, this is how dreams work sometimes. Okay. Sometimes dreams will speak directly to us through the right brain. The right side of the brain works in images and creativity and art and drawings and, and pictures and stuff like that, which is why I like to use so much of that because I like, I'm more of a right brain kind of person. I also like to balance that out analytically with the left side so that we can be balanced and central, right? So what is he being shown? A prophecy that the world, which is his school symbolically, is going to be flooded, right? That's one type of an apocalypse. Once by water, once by fire. Well, we've seen the water one. We got oceans, don't we? Right? That's not right. Like, where did all that water come from? That's from the flood. Now, we go back, we see the giant bunny rabbit, and uh, he starts talking to Donnie in his sleep. Donnie wakes up and starts sleepwalking and grabs an axe. The axe also symbolically is the hook, okay? The axe symbolically is that same nail, that same vav, uh, et cetera. And he's going to use that to usher in a flood. Now, we go to the, the other school children. They're standing in line waiting for the bus to go to Donnie Darko's school. And his sister wrote this poem called The Last Unicorn, which I'm going to read as much as I can here real quick, by Samantha Darko. There once was a unicorn named Ariel. Ariel was the most beautiful unicorn in the world, right? Unic horn means unicorn. Corn means horn, right? Or protrusion, right? So one protrusion, one horn, and it's the most beautiful one in the entire world. Ariel was discovered by a prince named, a prince named Justin. Uh, the prince was led into, and I can't read the rest of it, but she says it. The prince was led into a world of strange and beautiful magic by this most beautiful unicorn protrusion in the world, right? Interesting. So it, there's so many levels of symbolism here. She's reading something that's symbolic to her friends, and then we're looking at it symbolically. There's a lot of meta happening. It's going to get even more meta when they go to the movie theater. All right, so they're all waiting for the bus or the box or the container to come pick them up, right? And uh, these girls come up and they say, hey, my mom told me that the school is closed today because it's been flooded. Donnie Darko's dream came true. He actually had a part in that, as we'll see in a bit. You can see the water's all rushing into uh, the school people's feet and stuff. And then they see this statue where that hook, that vav, was planted into this statue. That's their school mascot, which looks like some kind of a dog, um, which we'll talk about too in a minute. And... Uh, they even made a comment. I didn't, I didn't capture it right here, but they said, isn't that solid bronze, <laughs> right? This is your sword and the so stone symbolism, okay? That's the vav, that's the hook that comes out of uh, the magnetic mountain, right? That nobody can remove except for the chosen one, except for the, somebody who is pure of heart. When the king returns, it's King Arthur symbolism as well. Now, take a look at this school mascot, right? This is how you can tell that it's, it's a very strong symbol, 
uh, that it doesn't mean this is just not a regular school. This is extremely symbolic. It's this, it's this humanoid that has a dog's face, right? Really interesting. And then he's got this club with spikes all over it. This dog is some kind of a warrior. He's some sort of a killer, basically. This is the school's mascot, right? Really weird. We're going to come back to the school mascot in a bit. And then it says, they made me do it um, around the middle there. And they is us, basically. Okay, the world made me do it. That's what, that's what that means. They is us, okay? All of us. Now, he's walking home with the new girl. He's got a crush on her. She likes him too. They sat next to each other. And Donnie's like, oh, I was in jail once. I mean, I, I, I burned this house down. Whoa, check that out. Donnie Darko, not only did he just flood a school, but he burned down a house in his past and he had to go to jail for it. So symbolically, that is a past fire apocalypse, which means if it happened in the past, there's nothing new under the sun. It's destined to repeat itself, right? So we should see another fire apocalypse symbolism later on. And then she says, Donnie Darko, what kind of name is that? It's like some kind of superhero or something. And then just right on cue, so smooth. He just looks right at her. What makes you think I'm not? Right? What makes you think he's not? Because he literally is the superhero of the world, symbolically speaking. He represents the light of the world, that, uh, that savior type figure of the world, right? They go on with their conversation. It seems to be mean meaningless, but it's not. She says, for physics, uh, Montanoff is having me write this essay, the greatest invention ever to benefit mankind, right? And he goes, oh, uh, well, it's, Mon it's Monitoff, and uh, that's easy. It's, it's antiseptics antiseptic. So the greatest invention, she asks, he, she, he basically is saying, I think that the greatest invention ever is antiseptics. Well, isn't that just about right? If he represents the blue beam, right, that, that emerges from the world and cleanses the world and everything changes and, and becomes cleansed out, because that's what happens during the apocalypse. That's why we have the apocalypse. Okay. If we didn't have the apocalypse, everything would just get worse and worse and worse and worse until it destroyed itself due to entropy. Entropy needs to stop at some point. And then we have to have the opposite of entropy, which is regeneration um, and growth and life and stuff, right? All right, so let's look up septic for antiseptic. What's an antiseptic? Septic means to make rotten or putrid or cause something to rot, right? So antiseptic means to, uh, to be against putridness, to be against rottenness, to be, to be against things that are disgusting and bad, right? He's, they're talking about the, the condition of the world that we live in today, right? So he says antiseptics. Now check this out. If we do a, a quick deep dive into antiseptics, you'll come across this. An atmospheric pressure plasma jet is used for sterilization of antibiotic resistant bacteria. The plasma is non-thermal. That means it's, it's, it's hot and it's hot, but it's, it's not so hot that it will burn you. You can touch non-thermal plasma. Sometimes it's referred to as cold plasma. Jedi. Hey, thanks, man. I super appreciate it. All right. So basically what am I saying? It says it can be applied. This plasma can be applied to living tissue without thermal damage, without getting burned. That means that you can stand in the fire and not be burned. I'm sure some of you have heard that story a time or two in the past, right? Standing in the fire and not being burned. Now we go back to the therapist's office and Donnie's letting her know, hey, I met somebody. I met a girl this time, a real actual person. <laughs> I met a real person, right? And her name is Gretchen. That's an odd name. That's, a, that's I mean, that's an unusual, it's a different name. I like it. It's a cool name. Let's find out what Gretchen means. So this is, uh, we're going to learn more about some uh, Donnie Darko's mate or something that is associated with that blue beam, right? So if we look up Gretchen, it says a female proper name, German diminutive of Greta, like Hansel and Gretel, basically, right? Greta, a German and Swedish pet form of Margaret or Margareta, right? So Gretchen is the same as Margaret. What does Margaret mean, I wonder? Let's check that out. If we look up Margaret, as we saw when we broke down the movie Sea Beast, right? Uh, Margarites or Margarita means pearl. 
a pearl which is of unknown origin. They don't even know what, where the word pearl comes from, but I have a thinking suspicion. I have an idea and a theory. Let's talk about the theory. It goes on if we look up the root pearl, if we look up the word pearl and we look up its root, we started with Gretchen, we moved on to Marguerite or Margarita, and then we, we learned that Marguerite and Margarita means pearl. Let's look up pearl, right? Other theories, because they don't know what it means, basically, other theories connect it to the root of the word pear, like the fruit, right? Well, that's interesting. So Margarita is directly related, and Gretchen, by extension, is directly related to the word pear. The word pearl is related to Many people uh, believe this, that it's related to pear. Hey, Brent, good to see you. So let's look up pear. Let's go deeper. I'm, I'm ready. Let's, do, let's go deep. Now, the word pear likely shares an origin with the Greek apion, which means pear, or apios, which means pear tree. Can you, see, can you hear how apion and apios could also possibly be a potential root word for apple? as well, right? So there's these pears or these apples, right? Now, if we check this out, the pear, Homer, the great writer, described pears as a gift from the gods, right? Why would pears be a gift from the gods? There's all kinds of fruit and stuff. People would say, oh yeah, pears are super healthy and stuff. You should eat pears because they're, the gods used to eat them and stuff. No, 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 no. The gods ate pears. Okay. They didn't eat actual pears like this one right here. Okay. Just like they ate apples, just like they ate sacred honey from the sacred bees and stuff. It's cartoonified imagery, right? There's some sort of a fruit that grows off of this tree of life. And it, uh, the people called it different names. Sometimes it was golden apples. Sometimes it was pears. Sometimes it was uh, peaches and stuff, right? As we've talked about before. Now we go to Donnie Darko. We're following him out into this field. This is just a chill place where him and his friends hang out. And uh, his friends are having this talk about Smurfs. Just seems to be a casual conversation. I'm listening because I did a whole video about how Smurfs are based off of a real true story. Okay? Real life actual hidden history of our entire world. And it's hard to see here, but the, the guys are saying, we got to find ourselves a, a Smurfette, like this cute little blonde that'll get down with the guys. Let me time out, okay? They're being base, okay? I'm not saying that sex or anything that has grown up in nature is base. I'm just saying the movie is showing us that these, these uh, sacred types of rituals, like the ones that we're talking about, have been demeaned, they've been belittled, they've been made base by the world that we live in today, which is filled with negative energy because Pandora's box has been opened. So they're talking about how they need to get themselves a little Smurfette because they're assuming Smurfette hooks up with all the other Smurf dudes because the Smurfs are mostly guys, basically, right? However, there's an entire Smurf girl village, if you've if you've seen it. I've, I've, I've got a little kid, so I know all about the cartoons and stuff. Anyways, so they're like, yeah, we got to get us a, a Smurfette, basically. So Donnie's like, he's 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 disgusted by his own friend's talk. They're being vulgar, man, and he's that's not his deal. I mean, well, that's, that kind of is his deal sometimes, right? Especially when he's under hypnosis. But he says, first of all, Papa Smurf didn't create Smurfette because his friends are like, yeah, that's why they cre Papa Smurf created Smurfette so she can make little Smurf babies with everybody, basically. He's like, no, 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 you're wrong, man. Papa Smurf did not create Smurfette. Gargamel did, okay? And if you want more information about that, go check out my uh, my, my video in my Ancient Oblivion series about the Smurfs, uh, Smurfs based on a true story. He goes on to say, she was sent in as Gargamel's evil spy with the intention of destroying the Smurf village, but the overwhelming goodness of the Smurf way of life transformed her. Do you see what he's doing as the blue beam? This is magical, okay? Forget all his drama, forget all his problems that he has as an individual human or whatever, but symbolically, this is what, this is what, um, this is what uh, the alchemist does, okay? And he represents the alchemist. The alchemist changes something that is base into something that is pure, okay? Usually it's seen symbolically as base metals into gold. But what he's doing is he's taking something that is base, which is his friend's talk, and therefore their frequency, and therefore the vibration that surrounds him, and he's changing it. He's saying, no, 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 no. Guys, listen, Smurfette was there to like make everything all evil and bad, 
kind of how you guys are talking about, but she was so overcome with the goodness of all the Smurfs that she was changed by it, which is exactly what Donnie Darko is doing by calling them out and saying, hey, how about this? There might be another way to look at things. Instead of looking at things through those, uh, through those glasses and perspective of, of, vile baseness you could look at it from a positive perspective paolo thank you i appreciate you now they take a look down the road and they see grandma death aka roberta sparrow which we've talked about she's just standing in the road she almost gets hit by a car again she was almost hit by donnie darko and his and his dad right eddie and then she's almost hit by this lady right here and she helps her to go back to the mailbox. She she keeps on going back to that mailbox. She keeps going back to the post over and over and over. She's a watcher. She's checking for the post. She's That's what the watchers were, okay? Some people believe that the watchers were like there to watch over humanity. But some people, like myself, believe that there are watchers who are watching for the day to come when the light shines once more, where that eternal flame shoots back up into the world, right? And they had watch towers that were specifically for that reason, so that they could see very far and they could see when the, when the light of the world shot back up. So she checks it again, no mail. She keeps going back and forth, back and forth. She is stuck in a loop, which is also a time loop that the movie references over and over and over. We are stuck in our own little loops. There's there's loops upon loops. There's spirals upon spirals all over the place. Many of us can get stuck in that current, right? You can get stuck in that vortex. You can get stuck in that loop and that spiral over and over. Paolo, oh, thanks again. I super appreciate it. <laughs> All right, so Grandma Death. We're going to come back to Grandma Death as well. Now, we go to Donnie Darko's bathroom where he hangs out with Frank quite often. He's looking into the mirror and he hears the voice of Frank. And Frank says, don't worry, you got away with it. He turns around and looks Frank in the eye. And he goes to touch him, but he stopped. And as you can see right there, it says there's an eerie humming. Not Donnie Darko's like humming, like, hmm, 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 right? It's electrical humming. That's why they put that in there because his hand stops right there. He can't go any further and there's this electrical sound, which is this humming. So he takes his hand off and Frank is right there. The giant bunny rabbit's just on the other side, but he can't touch. There is a barrier between the two. So he tries it again. He tries to, he tries to stick his hand out. He says, how can you do that? How, how, how can you do that, right? How is this, how is this happening right now? And Frank puts his paws up there, boom, and you can see there's plasma right around his hand if you look closely, right? And uh, Donnie's like, whoa, what's going on right now? He's trying to figure this stuff out. He's, he's, he's being fed information in the form of imagery by this uh, symbolic element, which is Frank the bunny rabbit, right? So he tries it again. He keeps on trying to put his hand through there. Frank says, I can do anything I want. He's free, Remember? Frank means free, the free man. And Frank says, I can do anything I want to. I'm free. I'm Frank. You know what I mean? He says, and so can you. Ooh, interesting. So can you, Donnie, right? So if Donnie represents the blue beam, if he represents the gift to the world, which is goodness and purity and stuff like that, right? Which sounds like it might conflict with what you see Donnie doing in the world, but it's not. It's, it depends on your perspective. If you're on the side of good, then you would see Donnie as being good because he's destroying all the evil in the world, basically, right? Um, even though they try to make him look like he's out of his mind and schizophrenic and stuff, right? Frank says, I can do anything I want. And so can you. So can you. So can you. We can do anything we want to, but I don't think people believe that. I, th I believe that most people have forgotten that. Most people have forgotten that you can actually do whatever you want to do. They used to call that the law of the land. Um, I believe in the law of the land. I support the law of the land. I support you in doing whatever you choose to do. And I, su I support others doing whatever they choose to do. And I support people responding to however, whatever people are doing, however they want to respond to it. You know what I mean? True freedom in the world. He says, you can do whatever you want as well. Now, why is there a barrier between the two? There is an energetic field. Now, in fiction and sci-fi, this is called a force field. But as time moves on, we're starting to learn that force fields are not as fictitious as we once thought. Paolo, thank you. Gosh, man, I like the little sticker too. Thank you. Now, let's take a look at force fields. There is a force field that you carry around with you. 
okay? There is an energetic field or flux around your body and inside of your body. You are an electrical entity, okay? And therefore, you have an electrical field that goes around you. Most of us have forgotten about it. Most of us have been uh, pulled down so low and have become uh, pretty basic. I'm just going to be honest. These, m many people are basic these days, including myself. Like all of us are very basic compared to our potential, Okay. And that potential will be unlocked one day. But here is you. Here is us. This is what is around us. It, people ha have different names for it, an auric field or whatnot. Now, if you have two people like Donnie Darko and Frank right next to each other, their auric field, depending on how, how much flux it has been pushed out, like how much flux it's in or, or how large it is, right? How strong that field is, how strong your energy is, how strong your life force is, it will be further out. It'll be a bigger force field, basically. And some people can control it. Some people can manipulate it. Actually, I think every everybody probably could. Um, it's just that they, most people forgot how. They don't know how to do it, right? They don't. It's not like they teach this in class, right? In schools or anything, right? Um, that would be awesome, right? But they don't. Um, so when they get close to each other, those force fields interact with one another, right? So here's an example of the heart and the energy that comes out of the heart, creating sort of a, a toroidal field around the heart and thus around the body. It is an electromagnetic field. Let's take a closer look at this, just like in a magnet. It's magnetic, right? There's a north, there's a south, there's a positive, there's a negative, and it goes in, into a flow, into a design. And I'm going to read this to you. An electromagnetic field, also known as an EMF or an EM field, is a physical field. Physical. That's why Donnie Darko is stopped. His physical hand is stopped by this physical field produced by electrically charged objects. The field can be viewed as the combination of an electric field and a magnetic field. The electric field is produced by stationary charges and the magnetic field by moving charges or currents. The electromagnetic field extends indefinitely throughout space and describes the electromagnetic interaction. And here's another version of it, two fields interacting with one another. Our thoughts and emotions affect the heart's magnetic field, which energetically affects those in our environment, whether or not we are conscious of it. What does that mean, simply put? That means whatever vibes you have going on on the inside affects your physical reality and the physical reality of others, depending upon what they're doing with their electrical fields, right? So I'll give you a really simple example of that. If somebody has ever walked into a room and they have real bad vibes, something super off or something, right? You can tell somebody just came in with bad energy or something, or maybe you're in a crowd full of evil people and somebody with really good energy came in. Usually it's the other way around for me. But um, you can tell something's off. Something you, you notice it. You feel it. You sense it because it's real, because it's physical, because it's actually working on various realms, spiritual, energetically, um, electrically, magnetically, etc. right? So our fields interact with one another. Now, check this out. This is really interesting. It reminded me of the movie Old by M. Night uh, Shyamalan. Shyamalan, man. M. Night Shyamalan, he did this really cool... I love all his movies, every single one of them, right? There's one that he did recently called Old, right? Which is this island where uh, these tourists are tricked into going to this secluded beach on this, on this little area or whatever. I don't know. Anyways, these people go to this beach, right? They're not supposed to go there. The beach... Once they get there, they're trapped there. They cannot leave this beach. And what happens is they start becoming old really quickly, right? It's a really interesting movie. I don't want to get too much into it. But the point is, they tr when they try to leave the beach, right, they actually encounter a force field, which causes them to black out. They cannot physically pass beyond this invisible barrier that is an electrical field or an electromagnetic field. This is from the script. I want to read this to you real quick, just in case you haven't seen the movie Old. Now, somebody tried to get off the island, and the other characters say, you stumbled back out, because they went through this crevice or whatever to try to get out. You stumbled back out. You were holding your head, and it looked like you were in pain. You blacked out. And the guy says, I felt pressure in my head. Are you okay? I'm, I'm fine. I think it's the shock. Interesting choice of words, right? I think it's the shock. They try to get off this island and 
they get this pressure feeling in their head and they just black out and they they reappear right back on the island, which is really interesting. That's an example of what's happening with Donnie Darko and Frank right now. There's an electrical field or um, what is it called? <laughs> I told you, I spaced. I'm sorry. Um, a force field. Thank you. Or thank me because I just thought of it. Uh, this is also from the movie. It says magnetism of this exact spot on earth with the rocks on this beach submerged beneath the ocean for millions of years. Um, so they're talking about how this field might work and why this field is preventing them from leaving this beach. And they're talking about how it has something to do with magnetism because of the rocks of the earth that go down into the waters or the ocean waters, which equates to the anode and the cathode that are on either side of that uh, mysterious island. All right, we're getting pretty deep. Let's back off just a tad bit here and let's go to the Bible and let's see if there's a magnetic field reference or an electromagnetic field or a force field reference in the Bible. We find it in the book of Revelation where it talks about the apocalypse, right? And then it talks about how there will be this safe haven, this safe area um, for good people or people who have good vibrations or a positive energy to live and to stay there, right? And then everyone else can just basically try to, try to survive outside of the island. It doesn't mean that you're evil or anything. It just means that you're you're living with everybody else, right? Now it says here, in uh, verse 26, and into the city will be brought the glory and honor of the nations, but nothing unclean will ever enter into this sacred safe place, the city, nor anyone who practices an, um, an abomination or a lie, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. So what this is saying is this is describing this, this um, city that's known as New Jerusalem. Okay. It's a safe haven in the post-apocalyptic world. And basically they're saying, if you have bad vibes, you can't get into this place, okay? It's not like you need like, you know, uh, an ID card that says, oh, hey, I'm, I'm with you guys or whatever. No, 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 your ID card is your vibe. It's your frequency, it's your energy. They know if you belong, if you get in. If you get in, you're good to go. High five, hey, welcome. If you don't, you try to pass through that, your energy will be blocked, right? Positive and negative push against each other. Or I'm sorry, um, um, they're, they're, they're different energies. And I, I have a theory that if you match the energy of that frequency, you can pass through it. If you have a different energy, you're blocked from going through it and you'll probably black out or pass out or, you know, who knows, maybe die. I don't know. All right, let's move on back to the movie. Now we're in class and here's uh, one of Donnie Darko's teachers, super religious lady, church lady. And she's got this line and it says fear and love. And this is what is taught by this Jim Cunningham character played by Patrick Swayze. So Donnie Darko gets up there and there, the lesson is he's supposed to read this card and then he's supposed to put an X on the board wherever the situation goes. Is it love or is it fear based, right? So it says here, Ling Ling finds a wallet on the ground filled with money. She takes the wallet to the address on the driver's license, but she keeps the money that's inside the wallet. Ooh, so she's like, where are you going to put the X? Fear or love? And she totally wants him to put it into the fear side. But Donnie Darko's like, you can't lump things into just two categories like that. Remember, he represents the middle path, balance, the middle beam between the anode and the cathode, between the good and the bad or the good and the evil, right? Donnie's like, dude, you can't just lump two things into that bipolar category. It's, it's either good or it's bad. You know, there's a whole spectrum to consider. She says, well, the lifeline is divided that way. Basically, uh, I don't care about what you just said. We're not here for philosophy. You're not here to teach me. I'm here to teach you the things that were told to me that I'm going to teach you. This is exactly how our academics institutions work, okay? Questioning is not usually allowed. There's a falsity and they pretend like questions are allowed. But really, if you're like me and you've asked a bunch of questions, you tend to get like peer pressure from the other students who go, oh man, oh my God, blah, blah, blah. Or the teacher will just straight up get frustrated with you and become angry, right? So Donnie's kind of like me. I could totally relate to him. He's like, you can't just lump it all together like that. Not only that, but what if Ling Ling, what if that was, uh, what if that was her husband's wallet? You know what I mean? It's really interesting because he literally finds somebody's wallet later on. I just thought of that. Uh, but what if that was her husband's wallet? So she just took the money and gave her husband back the wallet which is fine, right? I mean, it could be. John Lombardo, thank you. Happy Halloween to you too. She says, if you don't complete the assignment, you'll get a zero for the day. That is a threat. 
That is saying, if you don't believe in what we believe in, or if you don't believe in what we are teaching you and indoctrinating you into believing, right? Because that's what that's what's happening here. They're indoctrinating people. They're conditioning people to live a particular way so that when they release you, you continue to live in that particular way, which is a slave class. She says, you'll get a zero for the day. You won't get any credit, right? You're not going to be successful and all your students will be upset and it's all this pressure and stuff. Now he's in the principal's office, basically, in the dean's office. And the dean is like, what exactly did you just say to Mrs. Farmer, your teacher? And the te his parents are there, his mom and dad. There's a school meeting and stuff because he did something bad, right? She's there. The teacher's there. She goes, he asked me to forcibly insert the lifeline exercise card into my anus. And the dad starts busting up laughing, but he starts, <clears throat> he starts pretending like he's coughing. And you can see the smirk on Donnie Darko's face, right? Um, and then they leave the office. The dad is cracking up. I love, look at the dad's face. I have to zoom in on this. Look at that. Look at him, man. He's cracking up, right? I love that. All right. So it shows us a quick glimpse of the outside of the school. We're about to take a tangent. I hope you're ready. Do you see this symbol? It's a cross or a plus sign, right? Which means positivity. And it says IHS. You may have seen this symbol somewhere before. This is, this, this is the symbol for their school, this representative of their religion of Catholicism, right? Or the school's religion. IHS, what does that mean? Most people, if you look this up, will say that it's, it's like a nickname or a shorthand version of writing Jesus. Well, Jesus is only like two extra letters longer than this. So that, that explanation does not make a lot of sense to me personally, that you're going to take something that's already short, right? And you're going to make it that much shorter. I'm not saying it's impossible. And I believe that, it, that this type of a thing is specifically called out in the Bible when it references the Nicolaitans or this group of uh, people called the Nicolaitans, which I believe is where we get nicknames from, like Saint Nick. That's not his name. It's Nicholas or Nicolaus or the victory of the people, if you want to say it the right way. Um, and then we give it a Nick. We give it a shorter form, right? So it could be, but I'm not super convinced because first of all, that's Greek letters. It's iota, eta, uh, sigma, I believe, right? Eta is not the letter H. I mean, it's, it's similar, but let's do a deep dive into this real quick, just so we can figure out what these three letters mean and how it's related to Donnie Darko. If you type in IHS, um, and you can also actually put in tombstones because it's often put onto Catholic people's tombstones. This is what you get. Let's take a closer look at this IHS. Right here, you can see that there are three beams, right? And there is an S. So what they're trying to say, all of these together, let me give you a quick backstory. The quick backstory of the whole IHS thing is that the ancient Christians used to put IHS on stuff as this esoteric symbol that meant that they were good people, basically, right? But I don't believe that they wrote IHS the way you saw it on Donnie Darko's school. I believe it looked like this because this is mysterious and this doesn't make a whole lot of sense to most people. IHS, you could start guessing as to what it might symbolize or represent, right? This is something else entirely because all three of those letters are stacked on top of one another. What we have here are three separate beams. The middle beam, as you can see, is much longer than the other two. And then we've got these, this S thing that wraps around it. Let's look at some other examples of this, right? Here's another one on a tombstone. This one is even more interesting because the S is starting to look more snake-like, right? That's because nobody draws an S like that that I know of. Uh, the H in the middle is non-existent. The H only comes from an optical illusion of this beam and this beam looking like they're connected by the middle portion, which is the S that comes through the middle part. So there really isn't an H there. It just looks like there is, right? Let's take another look at some more examples here. This one is really interesting because the middle beam has a cross section on the top of it. Boom, as you can see. And then off to either side are these two spheres or balls or circles, if you look two-dimensionally, right? This is very interesting. As you can see, there's no letter H. It's just three beams and there's an S in the middle with two balls on either side, 
I'm going to get somewhere with this in just a second. Here's another example uh, of the three beams and the S right there in the middle. Here is another example. Some people are probably already in the chat saying that this looks a lot like the dollar sign, right? You're right on, by the way. We'll talk about that. All right, here's another example. Here is yet another example of these three beams with an S in the middle. It reminded me of this, which was this uh, the staff of Moses, you could call this. This is uh, one of the medical symbols, and it means healing, right? It is a staff or a beam, usually with like a round thing at the top, which because this beam, the staff of the world, which is the world tree, is directly underneath that opening in the sky, which is a circle in the sky. That's why they usually have a little knob or a circle on the top of it. And then we have the snake that wraps around it, which is uh, plasma. It's how plasma moves about and, and undulates and swirls around those beams. So I took the liberty of making my own artistic rendition of this, and I'll share that with you. Actually, let me make that a little smaller. So here we would have three plasma volcanoes, okay? And this is not to scale or anything like that, but if you imagine that there, that the beams of light or the earth energy shoots up and out of these inner earth entrances, aka volcanoes and cave systems, shoots straight up into the sky. And then you have like, um, this plasma is not going left to right. It's wrapping around it. Okay. So it's actually coiling around it. This is a beam of plasma collectively. And this is what it could possibly look like with the S right there in the middle. This symbolizes a place of value, a valuable place, uh, something, some place that has uh, worth, like things that we consider worth, like gold. Here is an example of an ancient gold coin from Justinius II, I think, right? A long time ago. This is like super old coin, okay? So this emperor or whoever he was, this world ruler, um, on one side, he put like the image of Jesus or something. You can see IHS right there, sort of off to the side. And then it says Christos Rex, which means Christ King or illuminated ruler or King. Uh, and then on this side, I want to see this side. What is this? This guy is holding on to something over here. Let's take a closer look at that. Boom. Now this is supposed to be the ruler himself. If it's Justinian the second, I don't know, but he's got this staff and then the staff has these weird balls that are attached to it. Like it's got, a, it's got a secondary cross section. So it has like a double cross and then it's got two other uh, beams off to the sides, right? With these little ball points on it. At the base of this staff is an unfinished pyramid, AKA a plasma volcano or a volcano because it doesn't have the top, right? Because it's open at the top. So this is the world tree symbolically. This is why the leaders of the world were always shown holding these staffs. I believe so far, um, one of my theories is that oftentimes when you see these ancient depictions of gods, right? Um, and they're holding onto a wand or a staff of power or something, maybe it's the inverse. Maybe that staff represents the God or the mighty one. And then the person is just the cartoonification that gives attributes to that beam of light. You see what I mean? So these little balls basically would be the pears, the apples, the nectars of the gods, etc. right? The fruit that grows off of the tree of life. Here's another example of it. He's holding on to one of those little balls right there that has a little cross section on it, um, meaning this was the fruit of the gods that they wanted to eat, that this was the holy fruit, okay? Or the holy hand grenade of Antioch, right? Um, and then here's another one with the unfinished pyramid, Rupus Nigra, the plasma volcano, shooting up the world tree with these two witnesses on either side. Uh, let's check this out too. Here's another old uh, picture of this snake that's wrapped around these two bars here. And it says that some people have hypothesized that uh, the origin of the dollar sign, which I saw some people in the chat talk about, the dollar sign had its origin with the pillars of Hercules. Now I have also done a pillars of Hercules video in my plasma apocalypse playlist, where we break down what these pillars of Hercules were, which is these, the two witness beams, essentially. Okay. Those two other beams on either side of that central pillar. Here's an example of how the pillars of Hercules are portrayed. Can you see the symbolism, the dollar sign symbolism there? This is a place that has value, some place that has wealth and riches and stuff like that, right? In between these two pillars or these two columns, right? Which are on the ocean, as you can see there, because um, 
this is this is beyond the Arctic Circle, basically. So you have to go across the ocean to get here, basically. All right, back to Donnie Darko. So we're going to go to Donnie Darko's classroom, his science teacher, which is super cool. I like his science teacher, and I like um, his English lit literature teacher, uh, Drew Barrymore. They're actually dating in the movie. Both of them are totally laid back and cool. I like them. But let's take a closer look. What's in the background over here right behind him? Now, it seems to be just a random scene, but we've got these three pillars, these posts, these columns or whatever these are, cylinders, with these three balls on the top. I wonder what these could be. I wonder what these could represent. Um, God, I can't, uh, Van de Graaff? I can't remember the name of them, but basically these things produce electricity, right? So these are only two, an image of two of them, and they create an electrical arc between the two. Imagine if you had a third one right there in the middle, right? Uh, here's, here's an example of what happens when you touch one and, uh, and, and, and you're touching it in a safe way so that you don't get shocked, basically. <clears throat> and your hair goes all crazy, just like this girl, which also looks a lot like Grandma Death, right? Check this out. Here's the girl touching the electricity or the, the, the pillar or the column that has electricity that comes off of it. Look at her hair. Look at Grandma Death touching Donnie Darko. Now, her hair was already like that, granted, right? But Grandma Death is directly related to Donnie Darko, symbolically speaking. We're going to we're gonna touch on that more in just a bit. 500 people watching. Wow, it's an honor. Thank you. Happy Halloween to everybody. Uh, so Donnie Darko is talking to his teacher about time travel. He's super interested. And he's like, hey, do you know anything about like, you know, time travel? And uh, his teacher says, theoretically, it's a wormhole in space. And then they show you a slinky, which is really interesting, right? Now, I'm going to show you, I, I took the liberty of making another drawing for an example, a wormhole, okay? First of all, in from J. Dreamer's perspective, from a, from a plasma apocalypse perspective, black holes are when the sky opens up. It's the place where the sky depressurizes. The world goes dark, so it's black. And then on the other side, you can see that it's lit up on the other side because out there in the heavens is light. Out there in space is light, okay? If you were to actually remove the sky, you could see a whole bunch of light. But uh, what wraps around our world is plasma. In academics, they even agree with this and they teach that we have what is called the plasma sphere that basically incubates our world. That plasma cannot come down into our world or we have, we would live, we would have an apocalyptic scenario every single day if we didn't have the electromagnetic barrier keeping that plasma out. But when that electromagnetic barrier goes into neutral, when the polarity shift happens, that plasma comes in. Right now, if you were able to, if the sky opened up and you had a spaceship and you were able to fly up there into the opening or the Sipapu or the Nibiru or the place of the crossing where you can cross over into the other worlds and stuff, um, and then you flew through that, you would go into what I call a plasma conduit, right? Which is a tunnel, basically, or a hallway of plasma that is swirling around our world and it keeps on going. It's not just around our world, it connects to other worlds, to other hubs of information and experience. So imagine you jumped into one and you were going to land into uh, the, some other world. Or let's say you were in another world coming to Earth. This is an idea of what you would see basically, right? You would be in this plasma vortex, aka Einstein Rosen Bridge, aka um, uh, wormhole. The reason it's called a wormhole is because the plasma looks like a worm. And they, they even used to call them sky worms or verms, right? So I actually put like, I put these extra graphics in there because that's the old North Pole land. This opening would be directly above the North Pole. So if you were coming down as an extraterrestrial or if you were coming down as one of the watchers or um, as as one of the Anunnaki or whatever, or the Anakim, uh, the fallen ones, the ones that floated down into this world, this is what it would look like from your perspective. As you get closer and closer to Earth, you're getting closer and closer to Rupus Negra, and that's where your landing spot is going to be. You're going to land on that holy mountain or that mountain that is set apart from all of the other ones. You're going to land in that area on that island somewhere. All right, it's cool. Oh, here's another example, right? Uh, speaking of these Einstein Rosen bridges and stuff and these, um, these what do they call them? Uh, Wormholes, right? Speaking of these wormholes, every single time, many times when they're portrayed, I've noticed that they look like plasma, 
right? Even in Doctor Who, when he goes through, or she sometimes goes through these uh, plasma uh, hallways or whatever to these other worlds via the TARDIS, uh, there's electricity that's involved because we know subconsciously that there is electricity out there and that there are conduits and hallways of electricity or plasma that take us to other realms and connect our world to other worlds, right? So Donnie's in the classroom. He puts the slinky around his neck, which is really interesting because if he represents the central pillar, he now has two spiraling plasma vortices symbolically on either side of him, right? And uh, his teacher is answering his question about how to time travel. He says, well, you've got your vessel, your, your spacecraft or whatever. You've got your portal, your opening in the sky, and your vessel can be just about anything, most likely a spacecraft. But that's, that's his opinion, okay? But if you leave this world, it will become a, space, a spacecraft, whatever you're in. It automatically qualifies as a spacecraft because you'll be in space and you're in a craft, right? So... He says, your vessel can be just about anything. And Donnie says, like a DeLorean, a clear reference to Back to the Future, where you have to go 88 miles an hour in order to travel through time, right? The eight and the eight, the two boundaries, the anode and the cathode, the two pillars of Hercules, as we've talked about before, right? He says, like a DeLorean. He says, it's a metal craft of any kind. Well, that's interesting because earlier he says, uh, your vessel can be just about anything. He's like, oh, it, it could be anything? He's like, yeah, as long as it's made out of metal, then yeah, it could be anything. Why does it have to be made out of metal to be a time machine? Hmm, interesting. Because electricity is involved in this quote-unquote time travel, right? Um, which might not be what we thought it was. But regardless, you have to be inside of a metal craft. Why is that? Because you need protection from the electrical fields in those plasma conduits, right? Just like Doctor Who's TARDIS or, I mean, I don't know if that's made out of metal. I've never looked into it. But the DeLorean and uh, the time machine, right? All, all that stuff. Usually metal is involved because it creates a Faraday cage. It creates a protective barrier for you to safely sit inside of and traverse the fractal verse if you'd like to. So then his teacher gives him this book and it says, so check this out. I've got a book that's written by Roberta Sparrow and it's called, aka Grandma Death, The Philosophy of Time Travel. So Grandma Death that almost gets hit by a car like every day and she's stuck in this loop, wrote a book all about time travel. She started teaching science right here at Middlesex, which is the Middle Saxons, right? As we talked about. And he goes home. He's like, wow, Grandma Death wrote a book. And then his mom, check this out. Now we're going to get deeper into Grandma Death's backstory. This is super interesting because it's a real backstory about stuff that's happened in our world. His mom, referring to Grandma Death, says, yeah, she lives up there in that piece of crap house. Time out. Up there meaning at the North Pole in our world, okay, if we say up there, we're talking about the North Pole or North when you go up, right? Typically. And that piece of crap house. Why is it a piece of crap these days? We'll find out here in just a second. And she goes, you know, she's loaded. Well, that's interesting. See, the mom's kind of acting kind of base right now, right? She's like talking about the money and she's got a bunch of money or whatever. And she lives in that piece of crap house, etc. right? There's a lot of symbolic imagery that's happening that we're going to break down. Let's hear what the dad says. She used to be known for her gem collection, precious stones. Coriander, thank you. So, uh, Grandma Death used to be known for her precious stones or her gem collection. He even says kids used to go up there all the time and try to steal stuff from her. Why? Because she's loaded with all these precious gems and stuff, right? She's become a total recluse. Interesting. So we have Grandma Death, Roberto Sparrow, who represents this famous bright beam of light, essentially, um, or has something to do with that, right? She's directly related to Donnie Darko, who is that central pillar. So who could Grandma Death be? It looks like she's somebody who is in mourning. She looks like she's not doing too well. She's constantly checking on the post to see if it's uh, if she has any news or information. And uh, she's rich because she has these precious gems. And she's a total recluse. He even says, I didn't even know she was alive until we almost hit her with the car. So whoever she represents, symbolically, our world has forgotten about Grandma Death. Our world has forgotten about whoever she represents symbolically. And she has something to do with all those things. Let's make some connections now. Check this out. This is a passage from an apocryphal book. 
uh, that is not in the Bible or anything, but it's related to it. It's about Adam and Eve and, and uh, a little side story about their life. This is called The Book of the Cave of Treasures. Interesting. Check this out. I'm going to read it to you. It says here, uh, hold on. I'm just going to read it. And they shall place thee, so this is God talking to Adam, like Adam and Eve, right? They shall place thee, or you, inside of this cave, wherein I am making you dwell this day. So God made Adam live in a cave. Until the time when your expulsion shall take place from the regions of paradise. That means until the day that you are forced out of paradise or you leave this paradise island at the North Pole. Uh, let me start over. They shall place you in this cave where I am making you dwell unto this day until the time when your expulsion takes place from the regions of paradise to that earth, which is outside of it. So the rest, the surrounding areas, right? Where we live right now. And whosoever shall be left in those days shall take thy body with him and shall depo deposit it on the spot, which I shall show him in the center of the earth. So there, here's a reference to the center of the earth and something to do with the cave. Let's read on. It says, And Adam and Eve went down uh, the spirit over the mountains of paradise, and they found a cave in the top of the mountain. And they entered and they hid themselves therein. So what is a mountain that has a cave in the top of it called? A volcano, right? <laughs> Basically, uh, it's a plasma volcano, as you'll see. All right, it goes on and says, Adam carried Abel, who had died, to the cave of treasures and buried him inside of it. And he set, and he set right by him, uh, and he put next to his body a lamp, which burned day and night. So in this cave of treasures, Adam goes to bury his son, and he puts this lamp that never goes out, an eternal lamp, exactly like Aladdin, Okay. Aladdin goes into the cave of wonders or whatever, being the diamond in the rough or the um, uh, the King Arthur type of a figure, the pure of heart, right? He's able to go in there. And here's an example, right? Inside of the cave of wonders in Aladdin, there's this steep cliff that he has to climb. Rupus Nigra is said as being a steep cliff. At the top of this steep cliff, for some unknown reason, is this bright blue beam that is shining straight up from the very top of this area. And that is where the magic lamp is. Lamp is just a fancy word for light. Um, it's also related to the word lamb, right? Like the lamb of the world. Now, another reference, Pluto, the god of the underworld, death and riches. Let's check this one out. The god of the underworld, Pluto, or his Greek name, Hades, is considered the wealthiest god because the ground was so rich with minerals and precious metals. Pluto literally translates to the wealthy one. In ancient Roman culture, Pluto was the god of mortality and riches. He is the Roman version of Hades, god of death and the underworld. So Pluto is the god of mortality, which means death. And riches. Are we seeing a connection yet to Grandma Death, right? Who is rich and she has all this precious uh, gems and stones. Let's check out another story called The Seven Sleepers. Here is an example. Here, I'll just show you the. It says The Seven Sleepers, and here's a picture that somebody made of this story. You have these people who fell asleep inside of a mountain. Let's check this story out real quick. So, here, I'm, I'm going to I'm gonna paraphrase it because it's a kind of a long story, and I'll read you this section here in just a bit. So basically what happened is a long time ago, there was these guys, and this is just my own words, okay? There was these guys who were very holy, they were very good, and they were total Christians, and they believed in the Redeemer and all this stuff hundreds of years ago, a long time ago, right? And uh, the world was really evil. The world was bad. They didn't believe in the light. There was no goodness, just like in Donnie Darko's world. So these guys retreat to this mountain where they find a cave. They go inside of the mountain, inside of this cave, and fall into this deep slumber, into this deep sleep. When they awaken, over 300 years later, they come out of the cave to go get some food, and in their minds, they were just asleep for the night. And, and let me tell you the mind-blowing thing about this story. This story is in Islam. 
This story is in Christianity. This story is in so many avenues worldwide. I was surprised I had never heard of it. There are many references to this story under different names and different descriptors sometimes. But anyways, these guys go out into the world after their 300-year-long slumber, and they notice there's crosses everywhere, and there's all these signs of stuff that they believe in, and they're like, whoa, that's crazy. Like Everything looks all different. And uh, the people come. Oh, they were actually sealed inside of the cave too. That's a little side note. But uh, some people, some people come up to him and they say this. Um, oh, they, the people died soon after they had woken up from their three hundred year long nap. Basically, they were time travelers, right? This is uh, this is the story of um, man. What's that guy's name? Rip Van Winkle, right? Same type of deal. They fell asleep. They woke up super far into the future, and um, oh, I'm trying to I'm trying to keep it all together right here. So, oh, and then they died shortly after they had woke up or whatever, right? And then when they died, this is where this part picks up. It says the emperor wants to build golden tombs for them, but they appeared to the emperor in a dream and asked that they be buried in the earth in their cave, just like Adam and all of his firstborn. The cave is adorned with precious stones. See that? Which are called gems. A, a great church was built over this cave, cavernous mountain, and every year the Feast of the Seven Sleepers is kept. This is celebrated in many parts of the world today. It also gets into uh, symbolism that is commonly known as the king who is asleep in the mountain. The sleeping king inside of the mountain is a, a prominent folklore trope found in many folk tales, uh, folk tales and legends. Uh, it's also... It says some other designations are the king in the mountain, the king under the mountain, or uh, the sleeping hero. Some examples of this include, lo and behold, King Arthur, right? So King Arthur, Fionn Mac uh, Kumal, Charlemagne, Ogier the Dane, King David, Frederick Barbosa, uh, some other people, Constantine. There's a whole list of people who are, you know, incorporated and cartoonified as, as being these characters who had fallen into some sort of a deep slumber and then one day they will wake up when they are needed most in the world and they'll come out of this mountain, out of this cave of wonders or cave of treasures to help the world. It's the cultural hero who is asleep in the mountain. Sometimes it's seen as a sleeping army, as it says right here. Man, it's hard to see. You zoom out all the way. Uh, man, you can't really see it there, but it says the sleeping army. It's, that's too small to read. Anyways, very interesting stuff. The sleeping army one reminded me of the Lord of the Rings, right? Whenever they go into the mountain and there's that ghost army or whatever that was waiting for the right time to come out and help everybody. Same type of thing. Let's go to Laos. Remember earlier I mentioned Nico Laos, which is Nicholas, right? Laos means, um, People, the people, basically, right? Uh, which is interesting because I just thought of The Rock, Dwayne Johnson, right? So many interesting connections. Uh, the Rock is the people's champion. That's very interesting. Laos means the people. Nico Laos means victory of the people. So if we go to the, the country of Laos, there is a story called the Spirit Guarded Cave. I'm going to read this to you real quick. When the people of the far north were... Now, this is in Laos, okay? way away from the North Pole. When the people of the far north were molested by their foes, they were in continual fear and they consulted together saying, our lives are spent trying to escape from our enemies and no joy can be ours. Let's flee to the south countries where if people make slaves of us, at least we can know that our lives will be spared and our life, um, even in slavery, would be better than constant fear of our enemies destroying both ourselves and our dwelling places and taking our cattle for their own. Uh, let me make that smaller here. One man, wiser than all the others, says, why do we endanger our lives for our possessions? Right? Basically, they're like, hey, we shouldn't take all of this rich stuff that we have because they're, they're going to jump us and they're going to take all of our rich stuff too. So this is, this is not a good idea to bring all of our valuables, right? Why do we endanger our lives for our possessions? Can we not find some secret place in which to leave our money and our jewels? And when brighter days come to us, we can return and find them even as we had left them. All of the people said, your words are wise. Let's do this. And 
Uh, and as these people were loved of the spirits, they were led to a deep cave in the midst of a wood, which means a forest, which is usually where this place is located. Okay, Mount Marus said to be surrounded by a magical forest. Uh, they were led to a deep cave in the midst of a wood where a man, uh, where men seldom came. And there they had left their possessions in the care of the spirits who promised to guard them until the days when life being brighter and more secure, the owners would come and claim them. Goes on to say, the story became known and the inhabitants of all of the surrounding countries went to the cave and sought to take the treasure. Do not seek the treasure. I just thought of that. Uh, but such was the care of the spirits that no man with safety could enter the cave. A light was instantly extinguished if it let down into the deep pit, leading into the chamber where the treasure was, for the spirits blew their breath upon it and the light was no more. So there are some examples. Let me just make all of that really short form in case some of it went over you guys' head. Grandma Death represents Mount Maru. Okay, she represents the the goddess who is in constant mourning because she has lost her son. Her son is the light. She basically represents Mary. Okay, so Mother Mary, right, who gives birth to the light. Mount Maru is Mary. Mount Maru is the mother. Okay, Rupus Nigra, that that magnetic mountain, is the mother that shoots out that light or that sky beam. Okay, when the sky beam retracts, the mother is seen as going into mourning, and that is why we wear black when we're in mourning because of the black mountain, the dark mountain. Um, also, she's known as Black Demeter, right? One of these goddesses named Demeter. Now, let's see what Donnie Darko thinks about it because they're talking about Grandma Death at his therapist's office. And she says, well, what did, what did that make you think of whenever she said that everyone dies alone? And he says, out, there was a nymph named Callie, Right? Or at least the, the word Kali comes from this name. Uh, Kali comes from Kalista. And it says, this is really interesting. This is sort of a side note, right? Uh, Kalisto's story says, according to some writers, Zeus transformed himself. Zeus is a male figure. This is interesting. Zeus transformed himself into the figure of Artemis, who is a female goddess. Right? Check this out. To pursue Kalisto who is a female nymph. And she slept with him, believing Zeus to be Artemis. What does that mean about Callisto? Means she is a lesbian goddess. First time I've ever uh, in encountered that. I'm sure there's probably many references to, to stuff like that, but that was very interesting for me to read. However, I don't believe that his dog Callie is a direct reference to Callisto, the nymph. I actually think it's... Oh, here's a picture too. So check this out. It says Jupiter... Same thing as Zeus, in the guise of Diana seducing Callisto. So he sees these two chicks staring at each other. That's what that's that. <laughs> interesting, right? And it's interesting too because she got pregnant. That's super interesting. Zeus was with everybody, right? All right, now, Kali or Kali, or if you watch Indiana Jones, Kali Ma, right? Mother Kali. Uh, the etymology of Kali. Kali is the feminine form of time or the fullness of time, with the masculine noun Kala, which, uh, which is the name of Shiva. By extension, uh, time as changing aspect or nature that brings things to life or death. So Kali, his dog, is, is what he thought of when he had this conversation with Grandma Death, who represents time and loss and being in mourning because the blue beam came down and retracted, etc., right? Also, time travel. And she wrote a book about the philosophy of time travel. Philosophy, like how do you feel about time travel and stuff like that? The homonym, Kala, means an appointed time, is distinct from Kala, meaning black. So there's a word that means an appointed time, or uh, Kala, and then another word, Kala, which means black. Interesting, because she is the black mother. She is the black a uh, goddess who is in mourning because she's the Black Mountain or Plasma Volcano. And there's many of these in the world, okay? I'm talking. I'm just talking about the main one, okay? The main one, like Mount Shasta is said to be full of these inner earth entrances and conduits and stuff that go down in these lava tubes and stuff. It's, it's really interesting. All right, uh, but she became associated through popular etymology. She is called Kali Mata or the Dark Mother, 
Also, Kali, which can be read here, hold on, which can be read here as a proper name or a description, the dark or the black one, Kali. Interesting. That's what he thought of when he thought of Grandma Death. She died, his dog died, when I was eight. There's the number eight again, right? The boundary marker. Um, really interesting. It's called the Chet. Now, his dog crawled underneath the porch to be alone, right? His dog died. His dog crawled underneath the porch. That's symbolic. It goes underneath the world. It goes down and retracts down underneath the house, which is our world, right? All right, so we go back to Donnie Darko's house. Uh, they're all watching the Super Bowl. His buddy's over there with his dad. His Donnie Darko's dad, Eddie, is sitting right there. And you can see his dad's about to get up and get a beer, but there's this... There's this jelly stuff shooting out of his chest. Do you see that? These people cannot see it. They're just looking at him. But you're seeing what Donnie Darko sees, which is this, this worm, this plasma worm, basically, that shoots right out of his chest and it, it goes to go get the beer before he does, which is interesting. So he's just following it. He's following this energy that is shooting out and emanating from his solar plexus, from his chest. And then he sees his, his uh, sister and she's got one and she's following it around in circles. And then he's cracking up because he's just loving this. And he sees one coming out of himself and he's like, oh, wow, this is interesting. So check this out. What is the characteristic of a plasmoid? Because basically this is plasma, right? That comes up out of people. This is also something that I referenced in the Soundgarden video, Black Hole Sun, whenever the plasma or the lightning or whatever it is, hits that baby carriage and it turns the baby into this, basically. Plasmoid characteristics. Plasmoid appears, uh, plasmoids appear to be plasma cylinders that are elongated in the direction of the magnetic field. Plasmoids possess a measurable magnetic moment, a measurable speed, etc. This is real physical stuff that you can that you can interact with, right? And that's this reminded me of this phenomenon that happened over Nuremberg. In Nuremberg, in what is it, 1561? Um, I'm gonna read this real quick. A mass sighting of celestial phenomenon or unidentified flying objects occurred in 1561 above Nuremberg. Uh, this view is mostly dismissed by skeptics, some referencing Carl Jung's mid-20th century writings about the subject, while others find that the phenomenon is likely to be a sun dog. What are they talking about? They're talking about this woodcut picture. I think it's a woodcut. I don't know. It's an image that somebody had drawn of what they saw in the sky. This was in the newspapers, basically. <clears throat> I got to get a drink of it. I'm sorry. One second. So... There was a celestial event in the 1500s that happened and people drew a picture of what they saw in the sky. And here's what they saw. There was all of these spheres flying around all over the place, right around the sun. And in addition to these, spear these spheres were these columns or these pillars or these cylinders of what I would say is plasma and plasma phenomena up there in the sky. As you can see, sometimes you have a cross, just like we saw with that those coins where they have like the cross with the little balls on them, right? Uh, which represents the fruit of the gods. And that fruit is falling, it's flying around in the sky, acting all crazy. And then some of that fruit actually goes down to the ground and sets it on fire because it's electromagnetic in nature, right? It says cylindrical objects, which were several small, uh, cylindrical objects from which several small spheres emerged and darted around the sky at dawn. Interesting. And then immediately we have Donnie Darko looking up into the sky, right? I think they had heard an airplane p pass by, so he's kind of cautious about airplanes after, you know, the jet engine fell into his room. The jet broke through his house, okay? Remember, like a jet is like a, a fountain, something that jets out of something. All right, so we go back to Donnie Darko's bathroom and there's a flash of lightning. There's a storm coming which typically means that the, the world is coming to an end, symbolically speaking. All right, so boom, we got the lightning that flashes. And uh, meanwhile, his therapist is actually talking to his parents, and she's saying that he's having hallucinations, basically. Now, he's back at that barrier. Remember that force field? And he's got a knife, and he's trying to push it right through there, but it's not working because it's a physical barrier. And he keeps on hitting it, and he hits it, and he keeps hitting it, and every time he hits it, it causes a light. There's like a spark, right? 
and he's hitting it exactly where the eye is on Frank. He's putting out one of Frank's eyes symbolically before it actually happens. And then every time he does it, Frank's eye that he's hitting with that knife lights up, right? This is the eye of, this is the one eye symbolism of so many different sky gods out there. And Frank is no exception, right? And this is the exact same light that you saw at the beginning of the movie when it said Donnie Darko and there was that flash in the sky. This is the eye in the sky uh, that's symbolized by Frank. And then there's lightning all over the place just to further solidify that we're talking about electromagnetic phenomenon. So boom, Donnie's like, he's trying to get through to Frank. He's trying to, he's trying to get in touch with Frank, basically. Now, let's go to the dude with the bad energy. What was his name? Jim Cunningham, right? So Jim is a guest speaker at the school. He's an author on these crazy books, these stupid books, Attitudinal Beliefs is the name of one of his books. He comes in. Now, check this out. You could probably relate to a lot of this. He says, good morning, you mongrels. That is the name of the school mascot is the mongrel. So all of these children at this school are called mongrels, which is not really like a, a complimenting term. It's not something that's like, you know, if you call somebody a mongrel, it's not usually like taken as a compliment. But here he comes in and he's like, good morning, mongrels. I'm super positive. Hey, mongrels. What's up, mongrels? Right? This is symbolic of our world being flipped upside down where good is evil. And evil is good. And, he, and uh, the word mongrel just means to be mixed, just so you know. So remember how we talked about that there was those, uh, those tribes that once lived on that island at the North Pole, right? And then barriers go up and they stay there for a while and everybody else is kind of kept out <coughs> if you don't have that matching energy. And um, they stay there and they populate and they have their own little tribes and stuff like that. But whenever they leave, they go and they mix and they spread out amongst the nations and they become the lost tribes. So he says, good morning, you mongrels. Uh, mongrel, I already talked about, means to mix or to be a mixture. And then the whole crowd goes, good morning, good morning or whatever. And he goes, is that all? Is that all you can muster? I said, good morning. They're like, good morning. And he's like, Nah, that's a tiny, tiny bit better, but I still sense that some students out there who are actually afraid to say good morning, and then everyone's like, good morning, good morning, but look at Donnie Darko's face. Whoops. Uh, nah, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> that's me, okay? This has happened to me so many times. I'm sure it's happened to many of you. This is the type of thing that they train us to do. Okay, this is this is a school for spellcasting is what you're you're watching this in action. Okay, he is an evil dark magician. Okay, in real life, there are people just like this who practice casting dark negative spells at people in this upside down Harry Potter ass world that we live in right now. He comes in and th this happens in real life. And what they're doing is they're trying to get you to already open a door, to already participate, to already be on their side, to already start saying yes, and to basically be subservient and already just do what you're told. He said, good morning. That doesn't mean you have to say good morning back to him. You know what I mean? That's nonsense. What he's doing is it's a trick. It's a spell that is cast to your mind. He's like, good morning. And then he stops. And then, and then there's like this expectancy because of the, because of the collective energy that's already existing in the school or in our world today. And then there's a sort of peer pressure to sort of meet that. Well, his energy is evil. So if you meet it, you're going to meet it with evil basically, right? And he's trying to get everybody on the same page. He's trying to get them to turn against themselves just in case somebody doesn't go with the flow and say good morning right back to him. You don't have to say that. What if it's not a good morning? What if your morning sucks? What if you had a crappy morning? It's not a good morning. You know what I mean? That's the type of that's the type of fair, balanced mindset that Donnie Darko has. So he's hesitant to say good morning. He's not going to do it, basically, which I congratulate him for. Now, he says, uh, there was a young man searching for love in all the wrong places. And then he, he, he has this voice, okay? You can tell there's some people that are charged, man, good or bad. They're charged. And you know how you can tell they're charged with a lot of energy? Because they're usually really good speakers, okay? It doesn't mean that if you're not a good speaker, you don't have like a soul or anything. But typically, um, the ancient myths and legends said that uh, if you were to put the sacred honey of the sacred bees onto your lips, it would actually imbue you with the power of speech. Like you would be a great public presenter like this guy right here. Except 
it all depends on what energy is already existing. It amplifies it. So if he's got bad energy, it's going to be amplified. If he has good energy, it'll be amplified, right? So he says there was a young man searching for love in all the wrong places. His name was Frank. Oh, just like the bunny rabbit, right? Frank, the free man searching for love in all of the wrong places. Now, I will say this. Just because he's evil doesn't mean that everything he says is a lie. He does lie a lot. But I don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Oftentimes, they throw a little bit of truth in there so that the lie is believable. There is a group of people or free people, the Franks, you could call them symbolically, um, who have left their home, the paradise, and we are looking for love, our true love, in all of the wrong places, physically here on earth. Okay, There is a place that is the right place to look for love, to fall back in love, etc., which is the Garden of Eden. Now he says his name is Frank. Donnie Darko's like, ah, I'm listening now. Go on. <laughs> right? Okay, I totally know a rabbit named Frank. Can I talk? So anyways, this little kid gets up and he's like, what do I do to learn how to fight? Right? So this, this kid's asking advice and he goes, young man, son, violence is a product of fear. Well, that's bullcrap. Okay. Sometimes you need to be violent in order to protect yourself or your loved ones or whatever. Just like Donnie said, there's a whole spectrum and there's things to take into consideration. Just because there's violence doesn't mean it's automatically evil. There's two sides or three if you take the neutral route. Donnie listens to this crap and he decides, I'm going to volunteer. And he goes, hey, good morning. Good, good morning. Hey, everyone. Good morning. Now he wants to say good morning because now he has something to talk about. Now he has something to believe in, right? Now he has something that he supports, which is his message. He's like, I'm going to do that whole good morning thing right back to you. I'm going to throw that back your way, Jim Cunningham. He says, um, uh, how much are they paying you to be here? Whoa throws a wrench right into his system and Jim Cunningham's like, uh, excuse me, what? And all the teachers are all looking and everyone's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. And there's this vibe. Remember how I talked about the vibe that we put off from our heart energy when someone walks in the room with a different vibration, right? That's exactly what's happening right now. He feels the vibe. He probably sensed it before, but once it was manifested <laughs> and you could see like the, his, he, 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 Ooh, man, the energy grew in Donnie Darko gets up there. He's like, how much are they paying you to be here? And he's like, let's talk about things you don't want to talk about. He goes, well, what, excuse me? What? I'm sorry. He says, and then he starts talking to those people that, that were, that were asking questions. So he specifically talks to that kid who wants to learn how to fight. He says, if you're sick of some jerk shoving you, your head down the toilet, uh, maybe you should like take a karate class or kick him in the balls the next time he tries to do it, right? And uh, then he looks at Jim Cunningham. And he goes, I, I think you're the Antichrist, basically. So he's escorted off the, off the stage and he's the Antichrist, okay? It's the opposite. We're in the upside down world and that's good pretending to be bad and bad pretending to be good. It's crazy. Uh, then let's see. Oh, then we go to the, the science teacher, Monotov. And they're talking about time travel once more. And he says, each vessel travels along a vector. A vector is basically a straight line, okay? Through space-time along its center of gravity. And Donnie's like, like a spear. Now remember, Roberta Spiro, the spear, right? He says, like a spear. That's interesting. Like a spear that comes out of your chest because he's seen this plasma stuff come out of his chest and other people's chests. And he goes like, yeah, yeah, sure. It could be that. He's like, you know what? They start talking about God. They, they bring God into it and faith and stuff. The teacher starts getting kind of nervous because he's like, I, I can't have this conversation with you. I could lose my job. And Donnie's like, all right, I, I get it. you know. So he goes home and he tries to think about it. While he's thinking, he's playing with this little Rubik's cube. But I never noticed this until, until today. Check this out. He marked out all the colors on the Rubik's cube with a black marker. So he's trying to figure out the world that he lives in, which is the black cube or the dark city that we live under, the black box, Pandora's box, the container. And he's sitting there just twisting this black Rubik's cube uh, while he's pondering things. So he goes for a walk and he stops and he actually finds a wallet. Guess who it belongs to? It belongs to that Jim Cunningham dude. Check this out. Here's another interesting. Remember, because he, he, that was his exact scenario. Okay, these are signs and omens. Pay attention to what's going on in your life. Even the most insignificant things um, 
are they touch everything else. Everything is touching everything else. It's all related and interconnected. And therefore, you can learn to read the future. You can learn to predict things accurately just by paying attention to the world that you live in, right? So Donnie Darko was handed that card that said, Ling Ling is going to find a wallet. Donnie Darko finds a wallet. I'm pretty sure he took money. If there, it, it didn't say he took money, but anyways, let's, check, let's, let's zoom in on this real quick. I want to show you his birthday. Jim Cunningham's birthday is May 15th, the Ides of May, 1955. 1955 is also the date that keeps on coming up in Back to the Future. I thought that was an interesting coincidence, right? It also makes 555. 555, which is really interesting. I'm going to talk about 555 here in a bit. So in the book, they actually show, Roberto Sparrow's book talks about this uh, this this chakra energy, this, this plasma energy that comes out of the body. And here's some images of it in her book here. Now, they're doing a presentation in their science class, and they have this thing that they came up with. They have to come up with these inventions to help mankind. And theirs was called the infant memory generator, which is to, it's a device used to help infants or children to, to retain their memories, right? Which is directly related to the apocalyptic scenario. Because when we go through this worldwide depressurization, worldwide, collectively, the world experiences for the most part, amnesia. Many people wake up after the apocalypse who have survived. Some people will actually sleep through the apocalypse, believe it or not. Uh, but some people will wake up and they'll have amnesia. They'll have no idea who they are, how they got there, where they are. You know what I mean? It'll be all brand new to them. So that's just a, a call out to that. And then they show you the classroom. And I actually want to show you what's in the background. You see the whiteboard in the background? That caught my eye. Those shapes caught my eye. I wanted to zoom in on those. This one sort of looked like a tor toroidal field, right? But this one, I had to look this up. At first, I was like, these kind of look like the owl eyes or the plasma balls on either side of the squatter man stick figure. So I looked it up. Let's take a look at this. This is an interesting little side note. And this is the image that you saw drawn on the, uh, on the whiteboard, right? So see this little figure eight type deal? That's what was drawn back here. This is directly related to chaos theory, which is also super interesting stuff. Um, it says here, uh, the Lor Lorenz attractor, which is what this, this little figure is called, or this equation is called. The Lorenz attractor is a set of chaotic solutions of the L Lorenz system. Now, pay attention. Check this part out. In popular media, the butterfly effect stems from the real world implications of the Lorenz attractor, namely that in a chaotic physical system, which is called earth. Okay. Keep that in mind. Chaotic physical system. In the absence of perfect knowledge of the initial conditions, even the minuscule disturbance of the air due to a butterfly flapping its, its wings our ability to predict the future, uh, our ability to predict the future course will always fail. What does that mean? That means if we do not understand how something originated or how it began, and we don't have the perfect knowledge of the beginnings of things, we can never ever predict the future of those things accurately. We will always fail at predicting the future. Right. Let me read this a little bit more and then I'm going to, I'm going to expound upon it. This underscores that physical systems can be completely deterministic and yet still be inherently unpredictable. The shape of the Lorenz attractor itself when plotted in phase space may also be seen to resemble a butterfly or the number eight, right? Sideways, the infinity sign. This actually moves and creates all kinds of different shapes. But let's go back to that. If we don't understand, if we have no memory or recollection of how things began here on Earth, chaos theory says all of your predictions are meaningless. Okay. They're all destined to fail, basically. Okay. Because you don't have all of the information. If you had all of the information, if you had a, a collective memory, if we collectively had the memory of things we're talking about now of our esoteric hidden history or forgotten past, then that is going to amplify uh, our ability to more accurately predict what is to come because it's repetitive as well. 
Very interesting stuff. Chaos theory. It also reminded me of uh, Jurassic Park. They had the K. Remember Dr. Malcolm on Jurassic Park? He's like, I'm a chaos chaosetician or whatever. Like, what was he doing there? You know what I mean? Like, that was that didn't make a lot of sense until just now. Whenever I read about this. All right. So the math teacher says, didn't you stop and think that infants need darkness because they put on these glasses and it just makes them. It's like light images while they're sleeping. So the teacher's like, didn't you stop and think that maybe infants need darkness? That maybe darkness is a part of their natural development, right? We are the infants that they're symbolically talking about, right? We need the darkness as a part of our natural development. We need to go through the fires and the tribulations and stuff so we can be reborn, so that we can become better and grow, right? For our development. All right, so Donnie takes his girlfriend to the movie theater. It's totally Halloween, so there's like some Halloween flicks. They say The Evil Dead. I'm probably going to watch this movie tonight. I have not seen The Evil Dead. <laughs> it's come up so much in my research, but I still haven't watched it. I'm, I'm probably going to go watch it tonight. Apparently, it's about a bunch of people being plasma possessed and turning into killers. I don't know. I'm going to check it out. All right. So the evil dead. Also, look at the symbolism back here. You see this? I don't know if this was done purposefully. It probably was because it's a movie set. But see, you've got the X and then the circle there in the middle. And it almost looks like like this one right here, like a pyramid and then a circle on the top, right? Like, a, like the all seeing eyes and the unfinished pyramid type deal. All right. So lo and behold, Frank is in the movie theaters with Donnie. His girlfriend passes out. That's appropriate because when Donnie and Frank meet, it symbolizes the apocalypse or an apocalyptic situation. And she passes out, which is what happens during the apocalypse, mostly because of the depressurization of the atmosphere. People can't breathe and they pass out. Anyways, she's passed out while they're watching a movie. And he goes, why do you wear that stupid bunny suit? And Frank looks over at him and he goes, why are you wearing that stupid man suit? Donnie's like, okay, why don't you take off your mask? He takes off his mask and boom, he's missing an eye exactly in the same spot where he was hacking away at it with the knife earlier. And he goes, there's something I want to show you. And this is the movie theater screen. It's hard to see right there. Um, but this portal starts opening up in the movie theater screen. See when it opens, it's on the clock, right on that clock, the timepiece, a portal opens. Kamau Nia. Hey, welcome to my channel. Good to see you. All right, so this portal starts opening up in the movie theater screen, and he says, have you ever seen a portal? And this portal starts to open up. Interesting that they put these specific images, and they put that portal opening up right between the eyes right there too, right? And then the clock, right? Time travel, etc. And then the whole screen dissolves, and it shows you Jim Cunningham's house, where he picked up that wallet. He goes, burn it to the ground. He didn't say it like I did. He's like, burn it to the ground. He's very calm. All right. And then, uh, so Don Darko was like, okay, sure. Why not? I'll go burn that crap down. So he goes and he, he's basically going to go burn that dude's house down. And then I wanted to show you the movie theater because one, the theater is called arrow, which is interesting, like, like a beam or a stock or an arrow, right? It says the evil dead it's Halloween, but they're showing the last temptation of Christ as well. That's because Christmas and Halloween are interrelated. They're about the same things, which is apocalyptic events. All right, we go back to the school. They're actually having a talent show right now. It says 88. There's more 88 symbolism because the, the year takes place in 1988. And uh, there's this bunch of girls that get up on stage and they're going to do their little sparkle motion dance. And they're just doing this, this performance where it's a bunch of like really young girls that are, for me, it made me feel awkward. I didn't like, I don't like it because of the characters of stuff that's happening in here. But basically like they, they, dr they dress up these little girls and they put makeup on them and stuff and they have them acting all sort of sexual and stuff. Super inappropriate in my, in my personal opinion. Okay. That's just me. Uh, but sparkle motion, they get up there, they start dancing and stuff and, uh, performing. Now this is a talent show. So actually right before they went on, there was this other girl that she went on and she was doing this whole ballerina thing with like angels and stuff. It's, it's going to come back in just a minute. I'll show you what I mean. So while they're doing that, Donnie goes to Patrick Swayze's house. As you can see in the background, there's like this painting and he's got a can of gas and he's like, he starts putting the gas all over everything. He's going to burn it down. Now, symbolically, this Donnie Darko represents 
the apocalypse, okay? When that beam makes its appearance and when it disappears and stuff, that's when the apocalypse happens. We already saw the water one. They already told you there was a fire one before that. So the next thing to happen is this. It's got to be another fire because we already had the water. The school flooded, right? The world flooded. So now we're going to have the house burning down, which is symbolically our world burning down. The evil world, I should say, burning down, okay? The evil world gets cleansed through fire. We live in the evil world right now, so guess what's coming next? All right, so he pours gasoline on everything. It burns down everything, including that picture of Patrick Swayze in the background, which reveals that there was a secret room in the background right behind this portrait. It opens up. Meanwhile, Sparkle Motion's doing their little thing for everybody. And then this girl, this girl who had just done her performance is sitting in front of the mongrel statue outside. She's really sad because nobody likes her. They always pick on her. And it's crazy because the parents allow it. The teachers allow it. People are always picking on this girl. I forgot her name. Um, but she says, shut up. Right? That's the girl that says, shut up. Um, and here's the thing. The people would rather in this world that we live in, which is symbolically represented by Donnie Darko's whole, whole world. Okay. In this world that we live in, sadly, people would rather see this than this. This girl was dressed up as an angel and she's not showing any skin or anything. She doesn't have makeup or anything. Lori. Hey, good to see you, Lori. Um, and so anyway, she's out there by herself with the statue or whatever. And it's really sad, actually. Makes me sad. Um, now, the next day on the news, it says here, uh, the blaze, the fire was extinguished sometime after eight o'clock last night. Eight o'clock. There you have it again. The number eight symbolism, right? Time travel, the number eight, the chaos theory thing. It's all coming into play. Uh, and then they say that they found, I don't think I can say this word without getting demonetized or my, <laughs> my video removed, uh, but you can read it yourself. But they found super inappropriate stuff uh, having to do with children and stuff in that secret room that of, um, of Jim Cunningham when the house burned down. So when, when Donnie Darko burned the house down, they found this little secret room that has this stuff in it. Right. And his sister's like, Oh my God. And he says that Jim Cunningham was arrested early this morning. And then meanwhile, Oh shoot. Drew Barrymore is about to lose her job. Dang, check this out. So meanwhile, Drew Barrymore, she's she's got all these different methods. Remember I saw I was saying she's trying to get the kids to think outside of the box, right? Uh, she's in the principal's office about to get fired. She's going to get the boot. So she says, what exactly about my methods do you find inappropriate? She's such a cutie pie. I love her. Uh, he says... Oh, and then she goes on to say, we're losing these kids to apathy. Apathy is when you don't have feelings about stuff, right? Which is which is happening in our world today, okay? Generation Z, as they're known, uh, are basically known for being the most apathetic generation of all of them, right? They don't have, they're very desensitized. They don't have a lot of emotion and feelings about things because the world is changing so fast that nothing's, nothing's surprising. There's not like morals start to basically fall apart. And that's, this is the world that we live in today. She says, we're losing them, them to apathy and this prescribed nonsense. She's talking about the school system and academics prescribed nonsense right they're not we're not teaching kids how to survive we're not teaching kids how to grow plants and food fudge grow food out of the earth you know what i mean you don't learn that until like high school and then even then you have to take a special class to do it right we're not teaching kids important things we're not teaching them about death we're not teaching them about life we're not teaching them about the spirit or the soul we're not teaching them about energy and vibration and plasma shoot plasma Kids don't even know about plasma. To, to them, that's like a magical, mysterious video game thing, you know, like plasma guns and stuff, right? They don't even know about it. And then they have the the gall and the audacity to call plasma like the, what was it? The fourth state of matter or something? Like basically, they made it the last one because it's the last one that they found out about when really it's the initial state of matter. She says they're slipping away. And that's what's happening in our world today. So this is a huge sign for all of us in the world. He says, I'm sorry that you have failed. Hmm, this is what happens in the world today. When you're good living and surrounded by evil, evil will look you in the eye and say, you did something wrong. Okay. When in reality, you did something right. But to evil, right is wrong. See what I'm saying? He's like, I'm sorry that you have failed. So usually this is what I see is that evil people will point the finger super quick 
uh, to find fault with other people and say, oh, you messed up, you failed. When in reality, she's doing something good. She's doing something positive, right? So she gets fired. She goes outside and just lets it out. God, she just screams. And I have had moments like this many times. I've had to leave work. I've done exactly that. Uh, I've probably done that in school at some point. I've done this many times in life, right? Just, you just want to say that. You just want to just yell at the sky like, God dang it, man. When's it going to get better, right? This movie is actually all about things getting better. Believe it or not, that's the crescendo. They show you all the bad stuff. They show you how terrible the world is in order to have us appreciate the change that is coming. Okay. Now they hold up the newspaper. They show that their, their idol just got arrested for some nasty stuff. Uh, Donnie Darko decides to write Roberto Sparrow a letter, which I love. I just personally love that. I love that he decided to put, to put something in the mail, which means the world's about to change. Okay. Because she's going to check the mailbox and there's going to be news. There's going to be information. It's going to be full. Okay. The world will be full instead of being empty. Right now, our mailbox is empty, meaning that the world is empty of energy. The world is empty of magic. One day it will refill. It will be filled back up and we'll go back into a golden age. So the teacher had written cellar door and Donnie Darko was like, what does cellar door mean? And she says, cellar door is, is uh, the most beautiful of all the combinations of words that you can make. I think that's very interesting. That's actually true. Uh, the guy, Tolkien said that, I believe, who wrote Lord of the Rings. He was talking about the most beautiful words, cellar door, right? Even more beautiful than the word beautiful. I love it. I also think it's symbolic of Mount Maru, which is our cellar door of our world, right? And so Donnie Darko sitting there, cellar door, and they make a point of that. And I believe that that's what they're talking about. And I, and I think they actually confirm that later on when we see Grandma Death's uh, basement. So we are back into Dr. Thurman's office and she says, what did you want for Christmas that year? She's talking about some past Christmas. Remember, Christmas and Halloween directly interconnected, very much related to one another, apocalyptically speaking, right? What did you want for Christmas that year, Donnie? He goes, hungry, hungry hippos. And at first you might just think it's, you know, nothing, whatever. Like they just came up, they just put some random toy in there for the sake of the movie. Not true. They specifically chose hungry, hungry hippos because of that sound that it makes three times in a row. The H sound, that he, he, Ha sound. Just like when we broke down the movie Nope and we talked about Haywood's Hollywood horses, the het or the hay. Sometimes it's one, sometimes it's the other. Which actually, in this one, you can actually see that it's the ancient Phoenician letter het. Fat Albert is known for saying, hey, hey, hey. Santa is known for saying, ho, ho, ho. What's going on with all these H? H sounds three times in a row. Ghostbusters, five, five, five. What does that have to do with hey, 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 ho, 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 all that stuff? Well, this is the ancient symbol for the letter that makes the sound ha. Okay? It is a, a figure of a guy putting his hands up into the air. And what it, what it conveyed, it conveyed many things, but one of those things was spirit. Okay? Because this is the stick figure image. This is the beam that shoots up. Right? It curves around that middle, that middle beam, creates an arc, an electrical arc, shoots up as a central beam, and then it spreads back out with the eye in the sky in the central portion, creating the stick figure man, the squatter man, etc. And if you do that three times in a row, you've got the three beams in the middle of the world. Hey, here's what it looks like. Here's, a, here's just an example here. So in early Hebrew, right, it's the psi symbol. It looks like a psi right? With the three beams shooting up out of it, coming out of the earth there. Uh, and then it, it was just changed into various shapes over time. But originally it was a picture. All of these letters were glyphs or pictures of things. And it was a picture of a guy putting his hands up in the air, which symbolizes peace, which symbolizes I come in peace, right? You know what I mean? Uh, life, peace, etc. And then here's the other ones. Today, it's more like a, a, a crack in a house or a window that allows spirit to come in or wind to come in, etc. 
All right, so Donnie's back into in the therapist's office and he goes, I can see him right now. And he looks and he sees that it's Frank. Frank's looking right at him. And then Frank goes, looks straight up at the sky. You know how many times people looked up in the sky in this movie? So many times. So he looks up and then it actually flashes a sky in Donnie Darko's vision or whatever, right? And Donnie tells his therapist, the sky's going to open up. And she says, she's trying to comfort him. <laughs> he should be comforting her, really, because she has no idea. She says, if the sky were to suddenly open up, there would be no law. There would be no rule. There would only be you and your memories. She's actually trying to say this to comfort him, implying the sky is not going to open up. That can't happen, right? But she's actually right. If the sky opens up, or I should say when the sky opens up, there will be no law. It will be apocalypse. It will be the law of the land. It will be do as you like to do. There will be no rule. That's also true. You will rule yourself, however you see fit, however long that lasts for. There will only be you and your memories. This is the movie speaking to us, letting you know what to expect after the apocalypse. All right, so Donnie's having a party at his house because his parents are gone and stuff. Um, then he sees those little plasma worms sticking out of everybody's chests and he's just tripping. He's just looking. I mean, he's not on drugs or anything. He's just, he can see it. Okay. He's gifted and he can see where everyone is going to go because he can see into the spirit world or the electromagnetic spectrum. If you had the vision of plasma, this is probably what it's something like what you would see. Okay. You would, you would see all kinds of interesting and brand new things. So he's staring at everything. And then right around the corner, there's actually some this plasma worm that comes right at him. And it goes through him, right through his face, actually. And uh, his, his face pops into it. His eyes get all super huge. <laughs> um, and he, he looks into the plasma conduit itself. And then it shows you like the sky and how like the plasma conduits kind of moving through the sky and stuff like that. And then it ends up this huge sunlight or something. And then all of a sudden you see his girlfriend, Gretchen, and she's looking straight down at Donnie Darko, who is down by her belly. And they just hooked up in the bedroom upstairs. So it doesn't really say this, but I'm pretty sure she's pregnant. Okay. Uh, I don't really have a lot to say about that, but I'm pretty sure that's what's going on and why he's down there. So all of a sudden he stands up and he's like, we got to go. Look, we got to go. Now, time out real quick. Backstory on her. Her father stabbed his mom, her mom in the chest, exactly where that plasma stuff comes out of four times. They mentioned that earlier in the movie, right? Donnie Darko sees the plasma stuff. And all of a sudden when he snaps out of it, he's looking right in her like, you know, belly, chest area, her her uh, solar plexus area. And he snaps out of it and all of a sudden he's like, we got to go, right? So possibly, I'm just, I'm super speculating, right? But possibly he could have seen a future where he lost his mind and he stabs her in order to get rid of that plasma stuff. Or I don't know, it's possible. I'm just throwing that out there. All right, let's move on. Anyways, he's like, we got to go. He says, time is running out. We got to go. He's talking to us. He's talking to all of us. We got to go. Well, where do we got to go, right? Time's running out because the apocalypse is quickly coming. That clock is counting down to midnight right now as I make this live stream on Halloween 2022. The clock is running out. We got to go. And they go, where do they go? Well, they go to Grandma Death's house. That's the place of safety, right? That is Mount Maru, symbolically speaking, as we've already broken it down. That's the cave of wonders, the cave of treasures. That's the safe haven. That is Hold Mimi's Holt. That is the rabbit hole. So they get to Grandma Death's house and he goes, huh, cellar door. And then that, this is actually up here is the top. This is like her floor. So this is her cellar. This is her basement. And there's a door right there. Um, they go inside, but they actually are met by some bullies. And the bullies are there. Seth Rogen, is that Seth Rogen? And uh, anyway, so the bullies take off their masks. They jump on on top of them and uh, they're fighting each other. Basically, it's kind of hard to see. But then a car pulls up and the car's coming towards them. And then Donnie is, has a knife to his neck. And he, all of a sudden he starts speaking in tongues or in a different language. And he says, Deus, uh, Deus ex machina. Excuse me one moment. Deus ex machina, which means God out of 
the machine, I believe, something like that. God out of the machine, which is really interesting because you literally have Frank who's driving this car, which is a machine, and Frank is seen as a type of God figure in the movie. And he says, Do sex machina, our savior. So it comes. And the car is about to actually run into grandma death. She likes to be hit by cars, apparently, right? Which is really interesting because Marty McFly was hit by a car in Back to the Future in another time traveling deal, right? Anyways, Grandma Death is standing in the middle of the road. The car swerves to avoid her and instead runs over Gretchen, snapping her neck, and she dies. This car also, it's, it's of note, is a Thunderbird which is the same as a phoenix, basically, which is the same as the, the light that comes up and stuff, right? So the car runs her over, she dies, uh, and then you can see that the driver of the car was this dude in a bunny suit named Frank. That's where Frank comes from. Frank kills Donnie Darko's girlfriend, and he's like, wake up, wake up. And Frank's standing there, he's like, what are you guys doing in the middle of the road? What's wrong with you? And Donnie's like, he is not happy. And he has a gun. I forgot to mention that, but earlier he found a gun in his parents' closet. So Frank's like all trying to like throw the blame back at Donnie, which is a total evil thing to do. And that's very common in this world that we live in is people like to throw the blame back at... Remember like when uh, whenever we were talking about Lord of the Rings and they were climbing up that super steep cliff to try to go back to the, the volcano or whatever. And Schmeagel was trying to blame... Uh, the hobbit, the other, the little pudgy hobbit, right? Trying to blame him for eating all of the Lembus bread, right? And then uh, he sprinkled the crumbs all over him and stuff. And Smeagol starts like blaming him, even though he's the one that did it. That's exactly what happened. God, that happens so much in our world today. <laughs> Blows my mind. So Donnie takes out the gun and blasts Frank uh, right in the eyeball. So that's where that image comes from, right? Now check this out. The actual Frank, that's not the actual Frank that Donnie's been seeing this entire time. The actual Frank is the exact same guy in the exact same bunny suit or whatever that is allegedly like out of time, basically. So sort of a, a type of time traveler as well. All right, so the next day Donnie picks up his dead girlfriend Gretchen um, and this is him sort of acting as the superhero, okay? I know she's dead, but he's going to bring her back to life. As well he should, because of what he represents, as we've discussed. Now, over the White House, a storm starts to form. This plasma vortex. This looks a lot like Black Hole Sun by Soundgarden, right? This huge storm forms right above the house. And he looks up into the storm. There's sort of this like plasma tentacle cloud thing that goes. And he drives. He takes off. He doesn't want to be home because he just totally killed somebody. And he goes exactly to the place or, or near the place where the, the beginning of the movie started. And you can see in the background, there's like this tornado, right? Um, this, is, this would be like the symbolic of the world tornado or the tornado of Dorothy. Dorothy's tornado from the Wizard of Oz that sucks, sucks everything up and takes you to another world. It's the tempest, basically. It's the worldwide storm that happens. So he sees the tornado and the parents are about to fly right through that because they're on an airplane right now. Donnie starts to laugh. Now we see the mom and the sister in the airplane and all of a sudden you hear Donnie's science teacher and he says, your vessel can be just about anything, metal craft of any type. They're inside of a plane. The cabin of a plane is a metal craft. It is a Faraday cage purposefully designed that way so that when it's flying through the air and it's hit by lightning, the lightning goes right through it or around it, leaving everyone inside unharmed by the electricity and it goes right down to the ground and it grounds itself, right? So everyone inside is protected from the electricity while they're time traveling, right? Or while they're going through some sort of vortex or hole in the sky. So the, the plane starts shaking and stuff. People are screaming and this dot right here you can see is the jet engine. And also, you can actually make out a blue beam that is shooting up into the air. I didn't really see it the first time, but now the more I look at it, I can kind of see there's this bluish white light that's shooting up into the air right there. Donnie looks at his dead girlfriend and he smiles because first and foremost, he does, he knows she's not dead. Okay, he knows that he's, she's about to come back to life. And he hears her voice and she says, what if you could go back in time and take all of those hours of pain and darkness and replace them with something better. 
This is the whole, this is the crux of the movie. So I really want to drive this point home. Okay. All the other stuff was int interesting and entertaining to watch and stuff, but the crux of the movie, the important part of the movie is that hope. Remember how we started things off with Pand Pandora's box and all of the evils were let out of the box, which sim symbolizes our world as well. The one thing that was kept inside of that box was hope. Okay. So this is the hope portion. You need the hope. We need this hope in the world that we live in today with the energy going the way that it's going. The world's going to hell. It's terrible. I mean, in a handbasket, like it's, it's quickly falling apart at the seams. We need that hope. So they also see, here's the thing. At first, there's a lot of phantasoids, so many that it's overwhelming. So there's not a lot of like monster hunters and stuff. People are just basically surviving. But as things settle down and our world settles down and the human population starts to go back up and stuff, um, the, the monsters find places to hide and stuff. And then the humans are able to start learning the monster's weaknesses and they start taking them out and decimating their numbers and stuff. So at some point, there was... There was not that many left, but enough so that they weren't really afraid of them. And so what they would do is they would take those monsters or those beasts and they would uh, put them in arenas and kill them for entertainment, basically. They're, they're all real bestiaries worldwide, okay? They're, they're all over the place. I'm sure the Vatican is full of them. Um, but you can find ancient manuscripts, usually dating back to the Middle Ages, of bestiaries where people cataloged monsters. They put it down in all sincerity, not as a, a farce, not as a joke, not as a, a book of fiction or made up lies. This, these were some of the most coveted books that, um, that the royalty um, sent people out on expeditions and ordered people to surrender their books and stuff because they needed these bestiaries because these are real monsters. Um, and they threatened their kingdom basically. Descriptions of creatures such as dragons, unicorns, the basilisk, griffin, and uh, caladrius were common in such works and found intermingled amongst the accounts of bears, boars, deers, lions, and elephants. So all of these strange mythic and legendary animals were a long time ago included commonly with other animals like bears and, you know, uh, cats and whatever, like common animals that we have today, because those mythic animals were common at one point in time. So let's take a look at some of these images from real bestiaries worldwide. Now, this one right here, um, you'll often see dragons wrapped around elephants or fighting elephants. Sometimes there, there are, uh, winged Winged types of phantasoids that are carrying elephants off. I'll show you. Now check this out. I'm going to share some of these pictures with you real quick. I want you to keep your eye on this tree right here. Okay. Yeah, the monster is interesting. You know, the person, whatever. But look at the tree that it's attached to. This is supposed to be earth. I've never seen trees like that. They're, they probably exist, right? But I will also tell you that uh, an element that is not touched on in this movie, but it is touched on in other movies, is when we go through this polarity shift and the sky turns red, it triggers something in all of our plant life to not only grow gigantic, but to grow in a different way. It blooms differently. Many plants bloom differently. Actually, many of the plants that we have in our world today are premature. They haven't, they're, they're not able to get to full maturity to bloom in the way that they should or as often as they should. So here's some more examples. This one would be the classic phoenix, right? The bird that survives the fire, right? Which to me, this is a plasma phenomenon, uh, but there might be fireproof birds or stuff. Check this one out. Let's zoom in on this one. Look at the trees. Look at these weird plants. These look at the, it looks like giant shrubs or giant plants, right? They look like giant plants. And then this dude right here is blue. Now look what's happening in this picture, right? These are kind of hard to make out sometimes. This guy's got the blue Smurf conical hat. This guy literally is blue, which is interesting to me because it may be that some people look like they're blue under a red sky. Um, it depends on the conditions. And then this person right here is holding onto a unicorn or a type of unicorn or an animal with only one horn while they just spear it to death and chop, chop it up. This is creepy looking to me, right? If you're me, I mean, on the other hand, I think it's creepy that everyone's just out eating cheeseburgers and this is what they do to cows, but way much worse and way more traumatizing. At least this person's holding on to whatever this unicorn is and looks like maybe they're comforting it. Now check out, check it out. Here's another one from a bestiary. Same image, same type of image. Somebody is holding and comforting this unicorn type of a creature, right? Sort of keeping it gentle and calm while this guy eagerly smashes it to bits underneath these weird Dr. Seuss looking strange flora and fauna. 
the, the this is not um medieval um saturday morning cartoons okay this is medieval history right all right so let's check out another one now here we go we've got the person comforting the unicorn while the knight this dude who's wearing chain mail comes up to it to stab it we've got the same asparagus looking trees in the background right isn't that interesting the guy who's wearing full metal he's a knight and he comes up to this 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 unicorn and it totally kills it. The knights are portrayed as fighting these monsters and these great beasts of old, not usually fighting one another. When they're fighting one another, it's because they ran out of monsters to slay, basically. And they didn't want to lose their job. So they had to fight something. They had to provide some sort of entertainment or you know some sort of story to tell the people so they can keep their jobs as um, fighters, basically. Here's another one. Check this out. How common was this, right? That somebody's holding the unicorn and people are like, well, I wonder if unicorns ever existed. I wonder what happened to the unicorns. Uh, humans killed them all. <laughs> like, I say that with a little bit of eh in my voice because it's, it's, I don't like it, right? Uh, here's another creature, same type of unicorn type creature, but it's unmolested and it's just walking up through the forest of um, asparagus or whatever that is. Right. And here's another one. Now, this one's interesting. This guy is walking through his little asparagus forest, but they show that it's gigantic in comparison to what looks like a camel over here and maybe like some sort of ostrich dodo type of a creature down here. It's kind of hard to see. Let me make it bigger. See that little dodo and little camel dude? And this one's huge, but it's got the face of a human. Now, this is interesting because quite often they would, these fantasoid creatures are chimera or chimera chimera right they're a mix they're 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 an amalgam right they're they're a squishing together of whatever the perception of the person who drew it was whoever has an experience and an encounter with these creature these are alien creatures these are otherworldly creatures he's not going to be able, if it looks like a dog right but it's got like this interesting like human eyes and you know it's this weird face he will draw a human face on it typically right um, so they combine different elements of things that they're used to. Here's another one with the same weird Dr. Seuss asparagus trees. Does anyone know what these trees even are? Or maybe it's just a small plant that grew into gigantic proportions, right? Like uh, dandelions or something. Now on this one, this is really interesting. This is what I call a devil dog or a hellhound. I believe that those are real, right? I believe there's different classes, different species when it comes to phantazoids or those otherworldly animals slash insects slash creatures slash whatever. Worms, there's all kinds, right? Um, but this one is what is commonly called the devil dog. There are phantazoids that are portrayed in our uh, through our subconscious in our fiction and our stories and stuff. And they, they act and look kind of like dogs, right? Typically, they're very white, right? And um, they have that phantazoid white color. However, if this creature is anywhere near like that blue beam, if he's white, he would actually appear to be blue right? Or possibly purple. Anyway, so here you have another knight and the knight is actually, looks like he's trying to give him something. He's feeding him whatever he's already eating. So it's like he's trying to lure him away and it's one of the knights, right? This was the knight's job was to, oh, look at that. He's got a little baby one. I didn't even see that. How cool. I don't know what's happening in this picture, but this is awesome. And look at that. He's not wearing shoes. That's interesting too. But uh, the knight is holding on to some sort of little baby fantasoid, like he's collecting them. Wow. That's interesting too. All right. Let's move on. Here's another weird one. This one shows up a lot when you look for uh, monsters and bestiaries. This one, the legend says, would um, basically blow fire out of its butt <laughs> when it farts or something or have some sort of fiery excrement and it would shoot out for like three acres, right? So whatever this was, was huge. And it was popular too because they drew it quite often. Here's the uh, griffin that people have seen from time and time again. Here's one of the people fighting the griffin in the asparagus forest again for some reason which brings us to the knights fighting snails there are many depictions right not on just like i mean in in the modern world and on ancient uh literature that shows people fighting gigantic snails sometimes the people live inside of the gigantic snail shells as a little makeshift home or place of safety right as you can see they're chasing after this huge snail over here taking the dogs to it this is actually going to be in our movie as well. Um, or we, we alluded to those when we broke down um, the never ending story and they showed the racing snail, same type of concept. Here's another one of those fart 
fart fanazoids. I don't know what to call that. Uh, here's the knights fighting the griffin. As you can see, we took out the great beasts of old. We hunted them down. And when I say we, I just mean humans. <clears throat> I've got no part in it. I don't want any part in it. I will fight that. I will fight fanazoids um, if I need to, if they're dangerous, right? If they are posing, just like I will spray bugs. Like if a wasp comes in my house, I'm probably, I might spray it. You know, if a spider comes in, it's, there's a death penalty in my house. But outside of my house, I take care of them or whatever. So I try to be more understanding. The knights back then, no, they were paid warriors. They were paid to go out and to handle this menace that has spread throughout our entire world. Back to the movie. He says, one day you will be captain of the inevitable. So Captain Crow looks over to Jacob, whose name means someone who replaces somebody else. And he says, you will be replacing me. That is how important names are. They're descriptors of what we do, how we act. Here's his bestiary, and this side is blank. This is for Jacob to fill out. And this is what they're supposed to do, right? They're not just pirates. They're not just people that just enjoy living on the water, right? They're out on the water for various reasons. One of those reasons was to capture giant animals. The page is blank. Whenever it shows you a blank page like this in an open book, Usually that means it's it's trying to talk to you symbolically, to us symbolically. And it's saying the future is unwritten. It doesn't have to be this way. Okay? You when these things happen to you, your choices will write this book. Your life will be will fill these pages. So what do you want that book to look like? He said, if you would grant me this ship, I would accept it. So they they come into port, right? They're stopping to fight their monster hunting. They come into the port where their little city is, where they're from. And uh, as you can see, the ship is in the middle of like two towers. So there's the two tower symbolism. The two towers are the witnesses on either side of the plasma volcano or the other two plasma volcanoes, the other two electromagnetic islands that shoot energy up into the sky. And how do we know? Well, let's get some more context. This guy jumps out and addresses everyone. He says, so if this be our last to the three bridges. Oh, wait a minute. This place right here, this is called the three bridges. That's interesting. I wonder if the word bridge has any correlation to beam of light that shoots out. Let's look it up. So the word bridge, when we look up the Proto-Indo-European root word, fapau, is baru, which means log or beam. Three bridges, three beams. There you have it. Interesting, right? Okay, so as you can see here, they're actually, they cut off pieces of the phantazoids, right? This girl has like some little claw or something right there. This guy's got the big horn from its face. And this is what they did. They, one, people paid handsomely for all of these pieces. One, as a trophy, right? Two, as a decoration. It could be decor. Three, as armor, because this stuff was usually pretty t uh, tough. And then they would, uh, other people would um, use it for... Um, I'm sure people ate them. I'm sure they were used as food. I'm sure they were used in potions and stuff like that uh, to get chemicals that are not terrestrial. Basically, this, these things were very valuable and the, the royalty paid a very good price to have their hunters go out and get them, right? Um, which also, they wanted to expand their land. The royals want to go claim everything. How can you how can you own everything and be in charge of everyone if you don't own all the land? If you don't have your flag stuck in the ground and all these monsters are roaming about. So they get they try to get rid of the monsters. Now here is a statue of one of their townspeople of old killing this dragon or this beast with a long spear. The spear killing the dragon is St. George versus the dragon, right? Remember how we talked about St. George when we broke down uh, Monty Python and the search for the Holy Grail? right? That whole legend of St. George, how he was chopped into pieces and cut up and, and swallowed and dipped in ass, all, all the worst ways you could try to kill somebody, it was symbolic. Because this image right here, while it can be taken as literal as a human that kills a phantasoid, which does happen, it's also symbolic if, if it's a dragon, right? Dragons typically, okay, I'm not saying that there are no physical dragons. It's very possible, okay? There are, I'm sure there's flying phantasoids and all kinds of things, right? But there's also fire dragons or plasma worms, fire worms, plasma dragons, whatever you want to call them, that is not an actual physical animal, but it is an energetic entity. And what's killing it is not the person holding the staff. It's the staff itself. You could erase that person because what it is, is it's it's a, um, it's a lightsaber battle, basically. It's the red beams that come down in the form of the dragon or the hydra or whatever. And the one blue beam 
or the three blue beams, however you want to see it, the, the staffs that shoot up straight up into the air and destroy them because that's the midpoint right whenever our polarity of our world shifts. And then instead of the energy coming down from above, it shoots up from inside of the earth and touches the sky, filling our world with magic life, vitality, and energy. So this little girl pops into the window when all of the pirates are drinking and celebrating before they go out again. She says, hello, my name's Maisie Brumble. And uh, she loves all of the pirates and all their stories. I'm calling them pirates, but they're never referred to as such in the movie. But that's basically what they are. Maisie Brumble is one of the protagonists in this story. What does her name mean? Why is she in this movie? Uh, the etymology of Maisie comes from Scottish origin, and it means pearl. Okay, so I'm sure many connections are already being made between pirates and pearl and the little girl that just poked her head through the door, right? But let's let's look at the pearl symbolism. I and mean, why do we see pearl symbolism so much in these pirate stories, right? Well, let's check out where the origin of pearls comes from in myths um, and legends. There are pearl myths that relate to all time periods. Some go all the way back to the days of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Paradise. According to legends, the couple cried deeply after God cast them out of the Garden of Eden, and their tears created a lake of pearls. Okay, Adam and Eve crying, their tears create pearls. Interesting story, all right. Can we find more? It says here, it was believed that Eve's tears created the white pearls, while Adam's tears created the black pearls. Well, that's very interesting. Remember our last video when we broke down uh, the anode and the cathode of those two plasma volcanoes or those two witnesses on either side of the Garden of Eden or uh, the land at the center of our world at the North Pole, right? The anode and the cathode. And we talked about how um, you know, one of them basically tends to be black. One of them tends to be white. One represents male energy. One represents female energy, Adam and Eve on either side of God or Jesus or however you want to see it, right? It was believed that Eve's tears created the white pearls. Adam's tears created the black pearls. Furthermore, it is also said that Adam shed less tears than Eve did because men control their emotions better than women. Okay. I mean... I think it has to do with the, electri the, the electrical charges between positive and negative myself. Uh, supposedly, this explains why black pearls are so rare. Interesting. Here are some other references to religion and pearl meanings. According to the Quran, the pearl can be found in paradise. Wow. Well, we just read that about the Garden of Eden, right? There's a connection between the Garden of Eden or paradise and pearls being made. This is where the brides wearing pearls on their wedding days tradition is said to have started, which continues to this day. Because they symbolize religious purity, pearls became sacred objects to Christians by the Middle Ages. And during early times, Christians believed that the pearls covered the Holy Grail um, that there was pearls on the Holy Grail and it purified the water. Well, that's also super interesting because the Adam and Eve symbolism or the beam to the left and the right, the two witnesses to that central beam, right? That central beam shoots up. And when that, sh when that beam shoots up and it starts to undulate and to move and to swirl about, it takes a torus shape or a toroidal field. And that toroidal field looks like the chalice or the grail, you could say. And then there are these pearls that are attached to it. This is very interesting. And those pearls helped to purify the water, making it holy water, right? Water that is clean, water that is pure, not water that is dirty and full of muck and salt and all this stuff, which means that there is a place in this world that generates pure, clean ocean water that's drinkable. All right, uh, let's see what this one right here is. Sorry about it being so small. It says, in ancient Japanese legend, during ancient times, the Japanese believed that the tears of mythical creatures created pearls. Well, isn't that something else too? What's, what's going on with pearls being, I thought I was going to read a bunch of oyster stuff, right? Or, or, you know, pearls coming from clams or oysters or some, something that sounds more realistic. Every single one of these is saying that they have some origin in tears or tears of legendary people or gods or whatnot, right? Uh, or legendary creatures. Some of these creatures include, but are not limited to, nymphs, mermaids, and angels, which all can be seen as plasmic entities, right? 
Uh, in ancient Persia, it says, according to one Persian pearl myth, the gems were created after a storm. Well, interesting because we have the storm symbolism of the plasma storm that, that rushes through our world. What else do we have here for the for these ones? Oh, uh, let's see. Persia, it says gems were created after a storm. And that's when a rainbow came down from the sky and met with the earth. Lightning and thunder were said to be the reasons for the pearls imperfections. Interesting. So the pearls basically created by some sort of storm or tempest. Ancient Egyptian legends say that during ancient times, Egyptians were buried with their pearls after they died because they valued them so much. The myth from this era that's most famous involves Cleopatra, the famous ruler. I'm sorry, was, this is hard to read when I scroll it like this. I got to do a better job. Uh, supposedly, this was done to show Roman polit blah, blah, blah. I don't really want to read this one. So hold on. Ancient Chinese. Oh, black pearls. Again, here's another black pearl reference, right? Black pearls were very symbolic during early Chinese civilization. They were symbolic of wisdom. People believed that the gems were formed inside of the head of a dragon. Once they were fully grown, the dragon carried them between its teeth. According to a myth, a person could only gather the pearls by slaying the dragon to death. Wow. So we've got a lot of electro electromagnetic symbolism in the guise of Adam and Eve, of uh, the Garden of Eden, of these dragons, of lightning, of storms happening, and the creation of these highly sought after pearls. We might not be talking about little tiny rocks that are made inside of an oyster. This might be symbolic for something else. Let's check out the word pearl, see what it means real quick. It says here, uh, other theories connect it with the root of the word pear, which somehow, uh, also somehow based on the shape or the Latin pilula, which means a globule. See that right there? So the word pear and by extension, the word pearl means a glob, basically, right? Which is where we get the word globe from. Uh, the Latin word for pearl was margarita. So if your name is Margaret, that's what this is what your name uh, harkens back to, basically, or Mar margarita, marguerite, all of those words, all those names. But it's interesting because a pearl is direct. We have, we have a relationship with fruit. Pearls that are highly sought after by people, these little globules that come off of the tree of life, or, you know, between Adam and Eve, or from a storm, or from electromagnetic activity and energy, these little globules come off of them, right? Some white, some black, and they're highly sought after. And they're also, there's an association with fruit, just like the apple, just like the golden apples of the Hesperides and stuff like that. All right. Here's also the black pearl from Pirates of the Caribbean. I'm sure a billion people were thinking of that one, right? Of course. So we go black. We go back. We go black. <laughs> we go back. And uh, the girl is talking to the guy. And the reason I took a picture of this is because of the three vavs that are above their heads. As you can see, one V, two Vs, three 